Uh, let's see here. Okay. Good morning. Welcome to our 9 a.m. session of the May 26, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are all excuse me, all council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on the 2022 fiscal year proposed budget presentations today, call in, please mute your television or streaming device once we have opened up for public comment and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Council Member Watkin uh, is currently absent. Calentari Johnson? <clears throat> Present. Brown? Here. Cumming? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Meyer? Present. Okay, today is, today's presentation is part two of the city's budget presentation. We will receive presentations from the remaining departments that we did not hear from yesterday. At the end of today's presentations, I will call for public comment on the departments who have presented today. I will now call on Bonnie Lipscomb, Director of Economic Development, to give a presentation on the Economic Development Department. Thank you, Mayor, and good morning, uh, Mayor and Council members. Um, the presentation I'm about to give today is our Economic Development Department budget. And I want to acknowledge a couple folks um, also on the call. You don't see them right now, but they're available to answer questions later. And that's Kathy Mintz and Rebecca Unit, also from the ED department. And both of them have been instrumental in helping prepare the budget today and are available to answer questions. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, get started. Okay. Um, First, we'll go into a brief department overview, um, talk about our achievements over the last year, and then um, a, a little more detail about our budget and some of the, the challenges of the year ahead. Um, this is just an overview of our team. Um, we have four main divisions. Um, I will, and this is our team. Um, important to note here um, that People not um, shown here because they are temp, uh, temporary positions, but they have been with us working part-time temporary for a couple of years. And that's Marty Ackerman, who largely works in our property management, asset management division, um, and Joe Hall. Um, and both of them are you know, long-term uh, city employees who have since retired and are really helping with the city part-time. But this is our, our team. We're a small team, um, but you know, every person on our team contributes so much um, to economic development in our community. And uh, we're all in this together and um, we're really proud of the, the work that we do. So here are our core services. It's primarily in four areas and that's business development, infrastructure development and asset management, housing development and preservation and arts and culture. And just a little bit more on business development. Uh, we do support business creation, permitting and technical assistance, um, promotion of small businesses through a variety of programs, you know, facade improvement, signage improvement, some of the programs you'll see briefly today. Um, convene business leaders, here's a photo of Amanda Rotella um, at our new tech meetup, um, and one of our you know, really engaged uh, partnerships that we have in the community. And then promoting business growth, you know, uh, groundbreaking uh, new businesses opening in our community, um, helping them sort of with financing incentives, uh, beautification and permitting. 
uh, infrastructure development and asset management. We manage over you know, 80 leases, license agreements um, within the city, including our kiosk downtown, which you see here, uh, property development and coordination of community development projects. The center one, of course, is the tannery. Um, many folks in the community don't realize that we actually own the ground and some of the buildings at the tannery. It's an over an eight acre campus. Um, and uh, developed in partnership with um, Art Space um, on the affordable housing. But the city actually led the renovation of the uh, working studios, the 28 working studios, partnered with Tannery Arts Center, uh, which was a nonprofit, in the renovation of the theater, which the city now owns, and the renovation of the Crone House, which houses the Arts Council of Santa Cruz County. And then additional infrastructure development, large complex projects and redevelopment. Um, the most recent example of that is just as far as like the wharf mass being approved, um, which you know over time is sort of a plan for infrastructure development and support. Um, for this infrastructure, obviously it's a wharf and there's a lot of complications with that um, that you have over the years as far as the substructure. And you really need to look at the long-term asset um, and the life of the asset and make sure you're maintaining it and then visioning for the future. And that's really what the wharf master plan is all about. Um, other, one of our other main areas, key areas in our department is housing. Um, and this is housing development and preservation, particularly affordable housing creation and monitoring of affordable units um, within the city. And then a support of community development programs with some of our area partners. So housing authority, community action board, you know, or just, to, just to name a few. Um, we'll talk a little bit more, particularly in this afternoon's CIP budget about some of our funding and for affordable housing creation because that's really moving forward uh, pretty, pretty, there's quite a lot of activity in that, pretty strong focus on that right now. And of course, this photo um, you saw yesterday is uh, the photo rendering of the, or the, the conceptual rendering of Pack Station South right at the corner of Maple Street, Paseo, and Pacific Avenue. And then uh, finally, the fourth sort of pillar of our department is the arts and culture development. And um, this is one area where we talk about challenges um, just through some of just the pandemic and uh, you know overall deficit at the city. We did eliminate our permanent arts uh, program manager position, but in trying you know, creative, flexible, and adaptable, we have absorbed this responsibility and are really leveraging um, you know, with new key programs like the CARD program, which I'll talk about in a little bit, and our partnerships in the community with Arts Council, working really collaboratively with the Arts Commission um, at the city to see if we can do and support more creative arts programs and cultural programs in the city. So recent examples just this year, of course, you have the Chinatown Bridge, um, which is an amazing collaboration um, with George Ow, uh, Arts Council, um, and Kathleen Crochetti as, as the artist. It's really just a beautiful example um, in our community. And then of course the Black Lives Humor mural um, that happened, Black Lives Matter mural that happened this year. And you can see just a lot of sort of responsiveness to the city. This was an unsolicited proposal that came forward and uh, we were really um, excited and interested to, um, to really respond to this proactively and um, help facilitate this. Obviously our parks department and public works department were also involved in this mural. And then finally on the arts is sort of supporting working artists in our community. This is an example, you know, at the, at the Tannery, uh, Arts Council is really taking the lead and we're really proud of our partnership with Arts Council and the funding we give to Arts Council each year that they re-grant um, to artists in the community. Um, another thing they're doing that really is near and dear to our hearts is the arts and business programming and so series of sort of online programs um, to really help artists become entrepreneurs and how to really get their businesses going. That obviously is something that resonates strongly with us. So just looking at last year, um, you know, it's, it's you know, a theme I think across all the departments, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride. Um, and uh, we you know, had a lot of programs, some of them were short term, they were really sort of in the moment reaction programs to help business needs right then and there. So example, um, our Jumpstart the Restart Kit, um, it, just, it feels like years ago, but it was long ago um, where we mobilized to get you know, things that couldn't be sourced at the time to all of our businesses in need. So sanitation, uh, social distancing, signage, uh, face masks, 
uh, floor signage. You know, that was a program. And I think the key um, many people will be feeling this year and seeing this year is just sort of that responsiveness and that uh, ability to be adaptive and, and, um, and flexible. Um, obviously, our microloan resilience program where we um, actually used our EE trust fund, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, to give over 50 loans out to the community with our partner, Santa Cruz Community Credit Union, who really helped us underwrite the program. And we're looking um, at sort of a round two of that, hopefully um, coming up later this summer, early in the fall, for our permanent outdoor expansion program. So there'll be more on that forthcoming. Um, obviously, this, this last summer and continuing um, right now in South October is our temporary outdoor expansion program. We are in the process of developing the permanent outdoor expansion program, and that will come before you this summer as well. And um, we haven't mentioned it in a while, but it's really important to talk about Get Virtual. You know, Get Virtual had over 75 businesses um, since they started, and we partnered with them. The majority of those within the city of Santa Cruz really brick and mortar businesses get online and something in the pandemic when businesses were closed particularly early on that that was just key and then um, another thing that we you saw in a little more detail yesterday are our weekly uh, blueprint uh, Santa Cruz County wide blueprint reports to really help businesses understand how they open what are the restrictions what can they do what capacity is something that we put out each week through the economic recovery council both in English and Spanish Um, so of note, uh, new uses this last year for the ED Trust Fund, obviously, as presented yesterday by our finance director, Kim Krause, um, we did need to dip into the ED Trust Fund and draw down that fund for the general fund deficit. But we were also able to use the ED, fund, ED Trust Fund um, for two uh, programs, one of which I just mentioned, Get Virtual. The other um, is the Santa Cruz Resilience Microloan Program. That, funding, um, this ED trust fund, which really is for economic development opportunities and initiatives, was critical in us being able to provide the funding for this loan program out in the community. Um, so I do want to mention that. That's why it's there. And it, it really helped us be responsive to the business community this last year. Um, you know, one other thing I want to mention about Get Virtual is this is a collaboration with the university, and they were successful in actually developing a five-credit entrepreneurship Get Virtual program. Over 100 UCS students were involved and were matched um, with businesses, as I mentioned, the majority of those are in Santa Cruz, helping them develop an online e-commerce platform. That's huge. It's those kind of partnerships, that connection with the university, um, and that town-gown relationship, and really developing that over time. So those entrepreneurs invested in Santa Cruz and hopefully stay here um, once they graduate and start new businesses. Um, other uh, just sort of recovery and rebuilding things that we're working on, I've mentioned a few of those. Uh, the Grow Santa Cruz Revolving Loan Program is a partnership um, with the National Development Council. This is an expansion of our Grow Santa Cruz, existing Grow Santa Cruz loan program, but it's with an expansion the American Rescue Act and through the Economic Development Administration of a countywide expanded revolving loan program. So we're really excited to continue that partnership and be able to offer more funding, very flexible leverage funding into our community for businesses. Um, we also are kicking off there being made right now. Um, we had the holiday with Downtown Association uh, for shop, shop Santa Cruz, Shop Local, Dine Local. You're about to see uh, some new banners that we're putting um, downtown, midtown, um, and we have, we're, we're trying to do it in the commercial areas citywide where we can. We have to put up some new infrastructure for that, but it is a Shop Local, Dine Local, Support Local Jobs campaign, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, we'll also have our City Arts Recovery Design Program. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, downtown Pop. Um, you approved that um, earlier this month. This is our vacant storefront activation program. We do have that request for proposals for prospective tenants out on the street now. And we're um, currently meeting with uh, business, uh, sorry, property owners um, on a prospective program. So that's, that's moving along. And then I mentioned our development permanent parklet program. One aspect of that worth mentioning is that we're actually designing a couple of templates for permanent outdoor expansion areas that, and I mentioned this yesterday, but it's worth repeating again, that will actually be vetted. Um, we 
crews or the permitting, we'll have them ready so that we can really reduce that timeline for those businesses to know that what the costs are for developing the permanent outdoor expansion program, how long it will take to get their permit and be able to move forward with some financing tools to make it financially feasible for them to invest in these spaces. And then finally, um, you also approved earlier this year our five-year ED strategy and uh, recovery is for the next you know, year to 18 months is still sort of the, that first part of that five-year plan is our, is our big focus. So we're moving forward on that along with the alignment with the interim recovery plan that you also approved, approved for the city. Um, on the um, funding that we've received this year, this is um, actual funding that we have um, in, included in the budget. There's more that's not here and not budgeted yet that's going to come for, uh, before you fairly soon. We can't report on it right now, but we're pretty excited about it. But we have the $5 million state local housing trust fund that went into our affordable housing trust fund and is funding and divided between three of our projects, the PAC Station South Station North and the Library Mixed Use Affordable Housing Project. We also were awarded, and this one's over five years, 1.2 million in the state permanent local housing allocation and uh, 350,000 in state HCD relocation funds that we were able to put into two existing partner programs, um, and that's with the Farmers Market and the Housing Authority. So we're pretty excited about, about those programs. And then housing milestones this year, we amended the inclusionary housing ordinance um, to bring workforce um, housing options to the community. You know, a big part of this also was uh, the partnership and collaboration, uh, quite a bit of outreach with Santa Cruz community, with Santa Cruz schools um, for uh, their proposed project and making sure that our ordinance really allows for that type of workforce housing that helps us retain teachers and other employees that work here, live in our communities. So that's a really important element. And I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the housing subcommittee um, that worked on that with us um, and the planning commission and the city council, all of, all, all, all of the, uh, these groups and uh, were, were key in being able to move this forward. And then of course we completed, our housing team completed the five-year consolidated plan um, through 2025, um, and which helped enable us to receive the 0.2 million in CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant, and the CARES Act funding, and additionally over 400,000 in home funding to the community. Um, you know, another milestone we recently, and I couldn't help but share uh, this photo, uh, which is of a visit uh, with Congressman Panetta and uh, Council Member. Andrew Rotella, who's the project manager for our library mixed use affordable housing project, and just really showing um, how much we have going on in the downtown right now. And so that was a really fun um, highlight of what's to come and the different projects and just the amount of housing that's being developed in, in the work in various stages of permitting and construction and plan for the downtown. It really will change and help support the long-term sustainability of our downtown. Um, this is um, our library, existing library site uh, visioning um, and sort of engagement process. And this is actually at our recent um, Midtown event, Fridays, uh, Midtown Fridays event. And this is um, getting community feedback on what are the elements that they would like to see on the current library site going forward. You know, if the city were to um, do a new project, new projects or revision that site, what is the community's vision? And so that's been um, a great uh, process and that will come forward to you. Right now we, we think the second meeting of June um, with sort of pulling together all the feedback that we've received from the community and the community outreach. And so you'll be able to look at what ideas are out there and how the community feels about this public space and um, looking at it in the future. And then uh, this last year, our WARF master plan was approved and our EIR certified for the WARF. And this is a major milestone. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is, uh, you know, incredible and unique resource we have in our community. 
and it's important that we take care of it. And it's important that we really think about what does the wharf look like for the next 30 years? Are we uh, planning for the maintenance of the infrastructure? Are we planning for uh, things to change? How do we bring our community and our visitors to our wharf? What does that vision look like? This is all in the wharf master plan. And it also enables us um, to get state and federal funding to move forward with a public plan, which is a requirement, and um, to be successful on future grant fronts. Um, it was instrumental um, in a year sort of in the making. We just found out, this isn't in our budget yet, but it will be soon, um, that we were awarded a 620000 grant, um, EDA, Economic Development Administration grant, for structural repairs. This is uh, specifically under the Miramar, the building that we needed to demo because it was um, in disrepair of being able to address those pilot structures. So this is an example of what having an approved master plan enables us to do for the future and looking forward. And then um, another milestone, a couple of others, um, over this last year, um, we did, uh, and this is David uh, McCormick, who's our asset manager for the city, um, helped relocate the watershed compliance team. And I think one really important thing to note in this year of just, you know, app change is that we were able as a city to retain over 95% of our tenants. You know, when I mentioned those 80 plus tenants, you know, businesses going through COVID, we were able to maintain those in their tenant spaces during that period. So that is something that I definitely wanted to remark upon um, and, and feel like that's an important achievement over the last year. Um, this is um, the soft launch of last Friday of our Midtown Fridays. And this is a partnership with Event Santa Cruz and um, with many of the Midtown businesses. So if you haven't experienced the soft launch with soft intentionally, um, we wanted to make sure we worked through some of the kinks, but it's something that really resonated with the businesses um, Midtown on the east side. And um, we anecdotally heard back from a number of the businesses that business was hopping for them, you know, all day Friday. And they're really excited that we're doing this. So uh, the site that it is, is a, is a parking lot that we own at the city. Um, and during the pandemic, parking has really been underutilized. Um, and so this was a great site to really activate some interest and uh, bring folks in the community back out and re-experiencing, you know, our stores. So we're excited um, for that partnership. Um, it will be continuing. Um, we'll see if it goes through the whole summer, but definitely through uh, May and June. And um, we're pretty excited, excited for this event. And then City Arts, I mentioned the card program, um, and this is the City Arts and Recovery and Design. Um, we had 60 applications, over 60 applications received. Um, we had almost 30 community reviewers um, reviewing each of these applications and recommending the top 20 to receive $1,500 stipends to be included in sort of our master book of projects, which um, these stipends really flush out each of these projects. They're amazing. Um, the creativity of our artistic community, um, those that are invested, we had a, a number of different pillars. We had arts and recovery, we had restorative justice, justice, and we had one sort of similar to our health and all policy sort of categories. And so we received a proposals in each of those three areas, and then they were uh, ranked on a variety of through our panel on a variety of sort of pillars that resonated with the IRP plan and the city's, um, the city's policies um, and, and goals for the community. So we'll be pretty excited to bring some of these forward to you. The Arts Commission and Arts Council is our partner. Um, Arts Council is actually helping us implement um, this program and our Arts uh, Commission has been instrumental in helping move this project along. I was referencing earlier when we talk about leveraging, even though we don't have our, our formal arts program manager position right now, um, those responsibilities have been absorbed um, within, within our development manager position, and Kathy Mintz has been leading that effort now. But it's been because of our community partnerships and those strong collaborations that have enabled us to move forward critical projects like this in the community. 
Um, this is an example of a project that our Arts Commission just approved funding through our city arts budget for, and this is um, part of the Seawall Santa Cruz Festival that will be in September, September 10th through 20th. And um, we provided a, a approved 25,000 in funding to help fund over 10 murals in the community. So that's a serious leveraging. Um, and Pangea Seed is a foundation, but it's internationally engaged nonprofit organization and they really act at the intersection of culture and environmentalism to further the conservation of our ocean and ocean stewardship. So we're excited that they're interested in Santa Cruz. This gets a national and even international recognition to have this in our community. So this is definitely something to look forward to over the summer. And here's an example of just all of the things that they do and the funding, but national and international recognition that they bring with it. And now turning specifically to our budget, you know, sort of what's new or what have we had to adjust to? And I would just say adjusting to this sort of post-pandemic recovery, um, making sure that we're being responsive to community needs, that we're being adaptive and collaborative in program delivery, and that we're also focused on revenue generation, even more so than we were before new sources. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, okay, this, this looks interesting. I will say, um, if you're looking at our total revenues, you can see this is very skewed. It's very skewed to our affordable housing trust fund. That's because as far as revenues, we received that $5 million uh, state local housing trust fund match, um, which overall, when you look at our total revenues coming in, it definitely um, tells, tells a story. It tells a story of the funding and our focus on affordable housing creation in the community. What is not here, which would skew this in even more, is the additional uh, five million in funding that we do have coming in. So that's also for housing. So you'll see that if we added that further, what that would make our total revenue pie um, look like um, on in this chart. Expenditures, and I'm just going to toggle back so you can look at this. So here's our total revenues, um, total expenditures, 4.4 million. Again, almost half of that is in our personnel. It's our, our people that enable us, you know, in the department to implement all of these programs and, uh, and initiatives that we have. Our project support and admin is about 10%. Our overall housing and community development, um, and obviously the, the specific revenues for projects, um, but it's 27%. Asset development and property management for arts and culture three and community and business support 18 percent. Our budget reductions um, this year, uh, we are uh, moving forward with um, some cuts, uh, and we're able to absorb these. Um, it's important to uh, to look at because in the budget we have approved new position. Uh, of development managers to move forward some of these major projects that I was mentioning. We're able to reduce some of our temporary staffing and, and professional services. Um, we also have some savings from moving our housing division, which is in the building across the street, to some available space in the annex. Um, we've reduced our training budget, and in light of sort of that COVID recovery, we're doing a lot of training online, so we believe we can, we can absorb that this year. Have a reduced trolley year. Um, we're we're waiting um, for the governor, sort of mid June, to sort of assess, you know, what is the community's sort of support for riding a trolley and being in that sort of group transportation setting that later this summer. So we have reduced that overall budget. Um, we have a grant that's coming to a close, which had some city match to it that we budget for next year. And then we reduced some property management expenses that we could that we could absorb. Um, we may need to come back during the year if there were some unforeseen um, areas in property management for any of our projects, but as a general sort of line item, um, we believe we can absorb uh, these reductions for the year ahead. Um, I mentioned earlier revenue generation focus. Um, we have seven grant applications in process right now in various stages already submitted, um, being submitted in the next few weeks, um, that totals over between 90, 94 million and 117 million. And we're focusing on this, and it's important, and the first line is key, the Economic Development Administration's American Rescue Plan. There are so 
many opportunities right now, and we are poising ourselves to take advantage of those. It's a strain, uh, and that's sort of one of the challenges for us with, with a staff, you know, that, that's as small as we are. However, we have done the groundwork to have projects that are shovel-ready that meet a lot of the goals for recovery, and we are, we're, we're full steam ahead. So um, I think that's something in being able to be a flexible and um, adaptable is being able to take advantage when these opportunities arise. And so that's why you see so many grant applications and opportunities for us to move forward on these. So we do have seven, um, seven grant applications. Uh, we have the first one is the one uh, that you approved recently for the Tannery, uh, Tannery Dance Center. Um, we have three with state parks, and these are also in collaboration with Parks and Rec. Um, and that's you know, one of our partners, the Wharf East Promenade and Fishing, uh, the Monterey Bay Access Education and Fishing, um, river, and then we have one also for Riverwalk Revitalization. Um, we have several um, grants in process for our housing program, uh, Pack Station North, uh, Pack Station South, two of which you approved yesterday, and our infrastructure and infill development grant, um, which will be due uh, next month, early July. So we're looking at those those grants and making sure that we're well um, positioned to be able to be extremely competitive to receive that, that grant funding. Um, so our challenges, uh, just staff that capacity, you know, as we want to and don't want to miss these opportunities. Um, as we get these awards coming in, it's, uh, oh, this is great, uh-oh. And then what? We need to make sure we have adequate staffing to be able to implement these grants. Some of them, uh, the grant funding will allow us to either bring on some temporary help or contract out for it, but it is something that we're gonna have to be aware and make sure we're balancing. We really have a staff right now, particularly due to the pandemic, um, that was responsive, but it is, it, it, it is at a level long term. So it's just something that we have to track and be aware of. And I know we're not unique across the city. I, every department is, has been giving their all. But it is something that we have to manage, particularly as we're getting some of these grant awards coming back. Um, we have uh, received three additional grant uh, awards that weren't included in the budget numbers I mentioned earlier, um, that, and that totals over seven million. So that's something that we'll have to come back and adjust, adopt when the budget is adopted to make sure we're including that grant fund. And then I just mentioned the um, grant uh, pending application. And so with that, that concludes uh, our department presentation and Kathy, and Rebecca and I are happy to answer um, questions that you may have. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, wow. <laughs> That's all I can say as well. <laughs> uh, amazing work that you guys are doing and um, really want to thank you for all your work during the pandemic, especially um, many and many of our businesses um, are here today because of all your work and all your department's work and helping them succeed. Um, I see that Council Member Cummings has his hand up and also Council Member Collintari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the presentation, Bonnie. It's great, you know, all the hard work that everybody's been doing and economic development, especially during the pandemic. And it's just really great to see how many businesses were able to survive during, you know, what really was a difficult time for everyone in the community, especially businesses. Um, I had a, a question about the um, Midtown Friday. Just curious, um, so is that every other, I didn't catch like how frequently that's occurring. And so is that once a month or is it every other Friday? It's, it's the plan is every Friday. Um, and it's a partnership with Event Santa Cruz. So we have Matthew Swinnerton who is taking lead in booking all the individual vendors and coordinating with the Midtown businesses as well. And then David McCormick, our asset prop and property manager, is sort of coordinating the behind the scene details, making sure it's really smooth on the city side as far as permitting and, uh, and all, of, all of those logistics. Oh, that's great. And then uh, follow up with that is, was, does the Economic Development Department play any role in First Fridays? And I was just curious if that's coming back anytime. So we've been involved in the past through that, um, through some of our granting and regranting through our support, uh, you know, of the Arts Council. Um, so that that's really typically for a lot of those type of programs. Um, sometimes we do get unsolicited proposals, or we'll supplement if there's a gap. Um, but the majority of our arts program funding um, does go through into the Arts Council um, for that. Although it looks like Rebecca just popped in, so I don't know if she wants to 
to add to that. No, sorry, I <laughs> turned my video on by accident. Excuse me. Oh, okay, okay. And then just one final follow up too. I was just curious, because um, I know that we've moved forward with the kind of downtown, the program around filling small businesses, or like, sorry, vacant, vacant, vacant mm -hmm. storefronts. And I was just curious how that's coming along and, and um, if there's any update on, on that program. Yeah, now, now is Q, uh, Rebecca, because we, as I mentioned earlier, we have put out the uh, RFP for businesses. Um, we had, I think it was over 35, close to 40 prospective interested businesses, and now we have a number of applications in process. So Rebecca can give you actually the stats of where that is. With the property owners, we have right now active um, engagement with at least five that are interested in us using their spaces. We're hoping through the end of this month to get that up to at least eight to 10. We'd really like to hit the ground running with leases. We have the lease ready and the sub-license agreement ready ready to go with the uh, sub-tenants. So it really hit the ground running on July 1st. So that's when we're hoping to, to kick that off. And I'll turn it over to Rebecca for uh, the number of businesses uh, application. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, Council. Um, we have about five applications in progress right now um, from prospective businesses. As Bonnie mentioned, uh, we did receive over 40 uh, inquiries into the program, um, so definitely a lot of interest around this. Uh, the RFP process, um, we try to make it as streamlined as possible, but it it does take some time, so I imagine that businesses are still working through that. Um, and we're we initially set the deadline. First, um, but given sort of the extent of that application, we're going to extend it to June 4th and we're going to have um, a question and answer series and sort of an information session with the Downtown Association on June 1st as part of their uh, Downtown Recovery Subcommittee meeting. Um, so we'll be advertising that and uh, getting the word out. Um, but some interesting responses so far um, and excited to see what all the proposals that come in next week. Great. Yeah, I ran into someone who was mentioning that it would be cool to have some of those empty spaces as potential art galleries for local artists, and I thought that was a good suggestion, but it's great to hear that that's moving along well. And those are all my comments, thanks. And next, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you so much for that presentation. You're getting me so excited with all the grants talk. Um, um, so great to hear that we've secured so many grants and that there's some more coming. Uh, would you be able to share with all of the grants that are coming and that we have that aren't in the budget, how does that, how does that look in terms of the expenditures and revenues? I mean, just, just a glimpse of that. Um, where do we land? And then I'll just ask my um, second question. And um, could you expand a little bit on the reductions for property management? What specifically are those and what do they look like? Thank you. Yeah, um, I'll start with the property management one first. Um, so we had a budgeted quite a bit of funding over the last year. So part of that reduction was related to some one-time funding we had for the Del Mar renovation. So um, majority of that, over 20,000 of that was specifically to that project. So we've made, made, made it through that. That was, a, since it's an aging infrastructure, that historic theater, uh, it needed quite a bit of work from electrical to plumbing um, that needed to be addressed to bring that up to code. And so that was a series of sort of one-time expenditures. So we were able to sort of look at the over, overall property management budget and say, okay, those were unique to this project. In the past, we've had sort of catastrophic roof failure issues with the Del Mar. So we've had past, uh, past uh, one-time expenditures or, as well, or one-time in you know, 20 years uh, expenditures. But we've made it through a series of those over the last five years, and we're not anticipating major expenses related to the Del Mar um, for, the, for the next few years. So that's how we were able to absorb that. I think from the grant side, um, you know, obviously we're, we're pursuing these grants, but we're pursuing them for projects specific projects. So a lot of them, I would say, on the housing grants, they're sort of that, you know, last or second to last funding that we need to close the gap on the project. So for example, if we get that ASIC, if we get 30 million for, a, that's the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Grant for PAC Station North, I mean, we're, 
you know, we have funding additionally in the affordable housing uh, trust fund for that project. You know, we're, we're using some of that funding, you know, on some of the initial conceptual design, some of that going forward, which, which enables us to be project ready to apply for these ASIC grants. So what part of that is looking at sort of the lead to sustainability um, elements that are key for some of this funding down the road. And so we're making some of those initial investments now for elements we know we want in the project anyway to secure and be more competitive for those grants. Um, a couple of the other ones, again, uh, the, the wharf one coming in for that infrastructure, um, those were things we were gonna have to do regardless. So getting a 620,000 for the wharf to deal with pilings, that's money that we, you know, that's on the unfunded CIP list. So getting that money in is critical for go I haven't done an exact sort of comparison of, of funding to, you know, re revenue to expenditures, so that is something we can look at a little more closely. It does cross over different fiscal years, um, so uh, it's definitely on the CIP side something that we can look at a little more closely. Thank you. Well, thank you, Bonnie. Are there any other questions from council members at this time? And just to remind the uh, public take public questions at the end of um, the presentation today. I'm not seeing any other um, hands up. So Bonnie, again, thank you. Great to see you and all your folks. Um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. Your your work um, is yeah impactful to, to all parts of our community. So we really, really appreciate your department and thank you for giving us the update. Um, even in the uh, crazy year we had, you guys are still moving, so it's great. Thank you, and again, I just want to acknowledge our team and our partners across departments in the city. It's like we all really are working together, and this year is, has demonstrated that more than any other, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, I will call on Lee Butler, Depart De Deputy City Manager, Director of Planning, Community Development, and Homelessness Response to give a presentation on the Planning Department budget. Welcome, Lee. Good morning, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I am going to share my screen here. Back home. All right. Um, today, I am going to go through our fiscal year 22 budget for the Planning and Community Development Department. And um, then I'll jump into a department overview and I'll talk to you briefly about our past year achievements and some of the things that we have coming up. All right, so you can see here that we have about 80% of our budget goes to personnel and about 20% goes to services and supplies. The largest expense in services and supplies is in building and safety, where we have a range of plan check and inspection services that we outsource, um, but we do have um, additional services and supplies in the other divisions. And um, I, I wanted to note here um, that there was a question yesterday from Council Member Cum about the UCSC city county um, uh, long range development plan uh, advocate. And um, we have been funding that through our advanced planning um, consultant budget, which falls in this um, services and supplies category. And um, that has worked over the past few years because we have uh, received over $900,000 in grants that we've gotten for um, uh, consultant work um, just in the last two or three years. So um, I won't belabor that point, but if you have questions about that um, at the end, I'm happy to answer those questions for you and to raise that because the question um, came up yesterday. Um, we um, have mostly a status quo budget this year. Um, I'll quickly run through um, some of the uh, deltas between uh, 21 and 22 fiscal years. Um, supplies and materials are 
basically static. Personnel costs did increase, um, but not as a result of any um, additional positions. That was um, cost of living increases and uh, benefits uh, that have increased, and so that's a, a standard increase there. Um, we did um, have an increase in our um, plan review and inspection support, and I want to talk to you about that a little bit because in previous years, we rolled over balances for consultant services. So as you all know, you know a construction project, a, a big construction project, but even small construction projects often span multiple um, fiscal years. And a big one may span three or four fiscal years even. Um, and so we would have those funds um, in a, in a purchase order and it, it would carry over to the next year. And in coordination with finance and best accounting practices, we're proposing to no longer roll over the funds of those purchase orders. And this will help us better track our spending, but it also means that this year we are showing significant increase in the um, uh, consultant costs there. So our plan check and inspection costs go up by about 345,000 and that's based on actual historic expenses um, that we've had in that, um, uh, in that expense category. And then finally, um, we are anticipating revenue uh, this year, um, you know, there are, there are a lot of unknowns when it comes to anticipating revenue. What we do is we talk to the um, development community and we say, hey, um, particularly for the big projects, when do you expect that you're going to be moving forward on this? When are you going to be breaking ground? And um, we do have um, some large projects that are in the pipeline and um, you know we're optimistic they will move forward but in in coordination with um, that exercise and with finance we're anticipating that we will um, have additional revenue but there are unknowns there you know the price of lumber is really high right now and so not affect um, projects and where that um, that pricing goes is still TBD Um, moving on to our department and what we do, um, the mission statement for our department is to enhance the quality, safety, and civic pride for our community by providing land use and development guidance through responsive, respectful, and efficient public service. And we do a lot in our department, but we call that a few of the things that we do right here on the slide. And up top on the right, we partner with the community to create long-range planning documents, and then we review private development proposals to um, ensure that those are implementing the plans that we develop. So our general plan and our specific plans that, um, that serve as a blueprint for how and where we grow. Um, those are documents that we work on and then that we adhere to when we're reviewing um, projects and presenting them to decision makers like yourselves. Um, and when they come through, um, we review them to make sure that they will be safe, that they will be green, and that they will be healthy. Um, we've got a green building program that exceeds the state's green building standards. And not only do we do this evaluation um, during the plan review and the building construction processes where we're out there, but we also help to ensure that buildings are maintained in a healthy and safe manner throughout their life cycle. And that's through our activities like in code compliance and in rental inspection um, where they are um, going out and making sure that our housing stock and our building stock uh, in good condition. And then of course we want to deliver service in an efficient and effective manner and that you know promotes our goals of um, fiscal sustainability and it, it supports affordable housing by getting those projects moving through the process quickly and we are always striving to have a high quality built environment and these essential 
services really relate back to the re-envision Santa Cruz recovery plan by facilitating investments in the community, both in terms of private development supporting new and existing businesses and in terms of infrastructure improvements that are often associated with that new development. And these and of course, help promote our fiscal sustainability. So many of the pillars, the, the three main pillars of our um, uh, Re-Envision Santa Cruz plan are all supported in our department. In fact, I was just talking with our department and highlighting to them how much we do in our department that directly relates to that recovery plan. So the, let's see, here we go. Um, the, 80% of our budget, these are the folks that it supports. Um, we have um, 34 full-time employees, including all the folks that you see on the screen here. Um, plus we have some additional temporary and part-time staff that are, um, that are included in the personnel cost, the 80% of our budget. Um, you can see myself and Eric, our assistant director, off on the left there. Samantha Hasher runs our current planning division. Laura Landry oversees code compliance. Matt Benoit oversees advanced planning. John Gervasoni oversees building and safety. And Sarah De Leon is our administrative division. So, um, a few highlights of what we've done over the last year. Um, we've issued over 1,500 building permits. Our main city line has been, has had over 15,000 calls come in. So that's just the main department line. Um, and we've completed over 13,000 inspections. And we have issued building permits, those 1,500 building permits issued are valued at over $43 million. And I will note that that $43 million does not include the Pacific Front Laurel Project, which um, the next time we run these figures, it will include that. Um, that project in and of itself is $60 million. So uh, in terms of the, the valuation. Um, and this $3 million represents mostly small projects. Um, just a quick aside, um, the council will recall when we brought our um, housing element numbers, our annual RENA numbers to you this year, they were, they were relatively lower than, than prior years um, in terms of total number of units. And um, that's because we, we hadn't had a large project, um, you know, and, and that's, that covers the calendar year of 2020, um, and this is the fiscal year, but there's, there's overlap there, and we hadn't had a large project come through. Um, we will, in this coming year, have that large 206 or so units at Pacific Front Laurel, and that will both substantially increase this building permit valuation, but it will also be reflected in the, um, the numbers that we have for our um, uh, RENA totals next year. Um, some of the COVID challenges that we experienced, um, like everyone else, um, collaboration was challenging at times with people not in the office. And um, we were making a lot of systems changes with um, older technology that has limited capabilities. And so, for example, um, we um, have used, some of our digital processes have relied on sending PDFs back and forth. You know, not the most ideal or efficient way um, to work through things. Um, our IT director, Ken, yesterday, speak to how um, one of their top priorities is um, implementing a new permit tracking system. That is absolutely one of our top priorities as well, and that will help with um, smoothing some of these challenges. I'll talk to you a little bit about that, a little more about that in a couple of minutes here. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, inspections, virtual inspections, uh, you know, we have made that transition, and um, 
there are still challenges associated with it. There's a there's a water heater strap, but how tight is that strap? You know, is there a smell of gas? Things that are hard to tell over a phone. Um, and then, of course, um, you know, face to face versus email and um, working through those challenges is something we've all been dealing with. Um, and, you know, we've been, we've transitioned to virtual meetings, both, you know, internally and also with the community, um, with community meetings and with hearings, both at Planning Commission and at our zoning administrator. And we've worked to enhance our online services um, and, and COVID has actually helped push us and accelerate that um, as we, enhance those. And of course, we're all dealing with the remote work. Um, moving to um, some of the achievements that we've had over the last year, um, we approved over 200 units in 100% affordable projects and another 94 units um, in a 100% a affordable project are under consideration in June of 21. Um, this is just 100% affordable project. So we also have, in the next bullet down, approved 398 multifamily housing units, including a 175 unit mixed use project between Front and Riverwalk, that Front Riverfront project. That'll really serve as a catalyst for redevelopment adjacent to the river there in our downtown and you know, directly aligns with our re-envisioned Santa Cruz plan. But projects like this, uh, the 175 units on um, front, the Front Riverfront project had another 20 deed restricted affordable units and other uh, deed restricted units were included in the, the 398. So that's on top of the two to 300 units that we have in 100% affordable housing. So we're, we're making a lot of progress in um, getting affordable units as well as mixed income projects. Um, and hope to see many of those come to fruition as, as you see in our, um, our uh, expected revenues. Um, we did receive over $600,000 in grants last year and um, that included funding for the downtown plan expansion and uh, the housing element. And then um, we also, I will note here, there was another 300,000 that we received um, two years ago and we've been working through the implementation of that with our, uh, or, or the development of the objective standards um, and made a lot of progress on that over the last uh, fiscal year and look forward to completing that in this coming fiscal year in in uh, collaboration with the community. And then of course we uh, just recently had the council um, adopt um, some additional fees, some new fees and some revised and updated fees, uh, both in code compliance and also in um, child care and public safety impact fees. So that's contributing to our ongoing fiscal sustainability right in line with our recovery plan. Finally, I want to leave you with a, um, a thing that I'm really excited and proud of our team for, which is a business process optimization that we've been working on in coordination with uh, a whole range of folks. And so we're really looking at how we can um, evaluate what we're doing and how we do it better, particularly as we begin to leverage this with new technology. Um, so we um, have customers and we've said what's going well, what's not going well. We have mapped out our processes between um, our building division, our um, current planning, our um, rental inspection. You know, what is the process map for those? Where are the, the pinch points? Where are the parts that are challenging? Um, where are the parts that are difficult for our customer or that are hard to communicate um, between departments and divisions? And we've worked with different departments and divisions um, to get this um, roadmap and um, we are looking at revising a number of our processes and we're doing this in advance of our permit tracking system upgrade so that when we transition to our new permit tracking system, we're not just doing the old thing. We are looking at how can we do this better and how can we leverage this new technology to the greatest extent that we can so that we can um, have 
an efficient and effective system that um, is better for our customers and that allows us to focus on um, the places where we can make a difference. Um, the implementation of these improvements is, is really a, a key goal for fiscal year 22. So, um, you know, as we're fully integrating our Bluebeam, our Bluebeam uh, digital plan review software, we've been using that for some time now, but, um, you know, COVID accelerated us in doing that. So as we fully implement that and as we implement our new permit tracking system, this is real, this effort that we've gone through in the last four months or so is really going to pay dividends. And so I'm excited about um, the, uh, implementation of those process improvements. And with that, I am available for any questions that you may have. Thank you, Lee. Um, again, always amazed at everything our little city does with our department. So thank you so much for all your work. Um, I will look to see if there are questions from council members this time. I'm not seeing, oh, I do see Justin. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, sorry. Thank you, Mayor. I, I have a question, and I'm not sure when the best time to bring it up is, but I know that um, the city manager's section, there's discussion around restructuring um, the city manager's department and having the role of planning director go to the city manager's department as a, as a deputy city manager and then the elimination of the planning director. And so that's why there's a, I don't know where to bring this up, but you know, with the consideration of the elimination of the planning director, I'm just curious, you know, like how is that gonna impact the planning department if we don't have a planning director? Right, that's, that's gonna come up in the presentation. Okay. So we'll, there's, a, there's a review of that. So you'll, you'll get a presentation okay. on that shortly. Okay. I, was, I just wasn't sure when to bring it up because it, it impacts planning and yeah. that's the discussion we're having right now. So. In a few minutes. Okay. They are they are next, so I think we'll get some clarification on that. Um, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Director Butler. I um, am wondering. So you spoke about the UCSC advocate, um, the uh, LRDP advocate, uh, that it's been funded out of the advanced planning budget. I wasn't clear if it's actually in the budget again or if we at some point we're going to need to um if we want to actually continue that position we would need to add it is that i'm, I'm just trying to understand what when you know <laughs> where we're at i appreciate you requesting that clarity because uh, i didn't provide a lot of detail um in the presentation expecting that we would have um some questions um i particularly after it was raised yesterday um so i will try to provide some clarity here for you um so first i would say yes if you want to position or, or that uh, consultant i should say um then um you i i would request direction uh to do so um you know that is that's uh, the um AP consultant budget comes out of the general funds. And um, we have, um, and as I noted in the presentation, you know, we received a lot of uh, grant funds and our team um, has, it, they're basically, their capacity is, is tied up in implementing those grants. Um, and what that means is we haven't had to have additional expenditures um, that we typically would with consultants. You know, typically we'd be doing that work and we would be paying consultants for it out of our general fund um, consultant budget grants. And so now we're, we're using um, that grant funding. So if the council wants to, um, uh, to, fund that for another year and there is a uh, there is a proposal for that um, I can pull that up and I can share it if you want to get into the details of that or okay, <laughs> um, uh, okay. Um, Thank you. I, I'll just say give us that direction if you if you want that and and if you'd like more information about that I'm happy to, to get into more details with you um, now or at a later time thanks um, I think we can do that offline so we can keep moving. But thank you so much. Uh, appreciate it. I have a question, Lee, about um, 
the affordable housing um, uh, units that you mentioned in the report. So you mentioned there was 200 that have been had been approved. Um, and I'm assuming some of the ones, those are some of the ones that we had done through that, that new process that were sort of ministerial. Um, so that the Jesse Street Marsh, uh, excuse me, the Jesse Street Project, um, the Housing Matters Project, is that, is that those, those projects or are there, are those separate from that? Trying Thanks, to for asking, understand. Thanks for asking that question. Um, so, that um, includes the, the over 200 includes um, the um, Coral Street, um, mm -hmm. the permanent supportive housing mm -hmm. at the back of the Housing Matters Coral Street um, property. Um, and um, then, so that's 120 units. And then it, um, I believe it's 85 units for Pacific Station South. And um, that was a coastal permit that we approved for that. And so the council actually authorized um, more than that <laughs> through yeah. the Cedar Street project and through the, um, the Jesse Street. Um, and um, those are earlier in the process. We, you know, those are, we didn't count those as technical approvals, <laughs> um, but this, so, so really those are on top of. And then I, I mentioned the 94 units or 96, um, you know, roundabouts um, that were coming up in June. That is the coastal permit that we are considering at a zoning administrator hearing for the Metro, so the Pacific Station North project. Um, and so, you know, there are lots of other affordable housing projects in the works at various stages, including some that council has more or less approved and we just have to have go through a ministerial process. But I um, didn't necessarily want to count chickens yet because some of those projects still have to uh, get funding. You know, the, the Cedar Street project, for example, applied for some grants and, and if they don't get those grants, um, they're competitive grants, if they don't get those, then you know, we might not see that project. And so um, I was a little bit conservative in how we were, we were presenting that, but um, thanks right. because that does highlight that there are a lot more um, things going on besides just what we've, we've done there. And, and I think that that approach that the council took to um, uh, really maximize the opportunities under AB 2162 for affordable housing and supportive affordable housing um, can help push projects forward by um, expediting them and um, some of the uncertainty upfront for applicants. And so thanks for, for calling that out. Yeah, I was just curious because I knew with the Cedar Street, yeah, it's a, it's, it is hard to name the number. I, I had to do a speak at the affordable housing event last week and I was sort of going between your site and, and economic development and it is a little bit, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's so the Pacific Station South and the Housing Matters slash Coral Street. So that's two, 205 units. And those two, I know that uh, the, uh, I believe the, the Housing Matters Coral Street, I believe they just received a, a $6 million grant or something. I mean, they just received significant funding for that. And then of course, Pacific Station South has received funding as well. So. I just think it's important for our community to understand that even though sometimes it feels like affordable housing is not actually happening, it really is happening and we are, these projects are getting funding and we're, we are moving forward. Um, and I know, um, so it's, and I guess um, my last question is um, on the RENA, on the RENA goals, we, we are going to get new numbers. So is that, is there a process that, around, I know. I also know we have to update our housing element and is that program to start this fiscal year or would that be starting next fiscal year? That's a um, good question because it's right on the borderline. Um, yeah. But we have a grant. We are expecting to uh, get, so, so AMBAG is telling us right now, sorry, the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments um, is telling us right now that um, June of um, next year, so so essentially in a year and a month, mm -hmm. we're going to be getting our um, new RENA targets, mm -hmm. and so that will really kickstart our um, our timeline. And we'll have 18 months from that point 
to have a new certified housing home. And um, so, you know, because it's right there at June, you know, we probably won't start it this coming fiscal year, but um, we we may, you know, we, we might get the the uh, the ball rolling in terms of getting our um, our RFQ or our, excuse me RFP together uh, for that, mm -hmm. um, so that we're ready and poised to hit the ground running. Um, but probably won't kick that off because those those arena targets are going to in part dictate the um, the uh, what we're doing as part of the overall housing element update. You know, do, you, we, do we have enough capacity? And right. Okay. Got it. And do you see that the housing element, which your plan required by state law, we can't get grants unless we have one. Um, do you see that sort of, what is the relationship that you see between that and the housing blueprint? You know, the housing blueprint was such a, a great process, so much community input, a whole year. I'm just curious maybe if you could just comment on, you know, now you've got this required state housing element. Um, we've got a lot of, you know, hundreds of housing queued. Of course, some are still in their financing development, but it just seems like we're sort of hitting sort of a little bit of a the kind of a perfect storm. Right? So, um, <laughs> all right. Um, what I would say a few things. Um, one, um, we that that um, you know I really appreciate all the work that um, the council members and the community put into the housing blueprint pro blueprint pro blueprint process, um, and um, that not only did that you know win um, statewide awards um, for the work that we did, but um, that is still being used. We're still using that um, because there was so much good information in there and so many great ideas. I mean, we took the, we prioritized the first set, but even some of those, you know, and we've got a lot of the top priorities uh, checked off now, but like even some of the, the lower top priorities um, we're still working on. And um, many of those ideas can feed directly into action items that we have as part of our housing element. And you know, even some of the state mandates um, are um, consistent with some of the things that the council has talked about recently. So um, when we update our housing element, we will need to um, talk about ways in which we can promote affordability for ADUs, for example. And um, that's been an interest of this council as well. And so um, we'll be looking at the past documents that we have and mining um, uh, uh, suggestions and ideas from that. We'll also be looking at the Bay Area because um, they're one year ahead of us. <laughs> we'll be mining ideas from there. And you know, we'll have a consultant who will likely you know, have experience in working in some of these other areas. Uh, you know, Southern California was even a year before that. So, you know, we'll have lots of work to build on. Um, and uh, so I think that's it there, but I want to build on, I want to uh, add on to one thing uh, based on your prior comment about things in the works um, uh, and acknowledge the, the great work that our team has done in um, getting the inspections and the project at 350 Ocean moving along. Mm -hmm. um, that is 60 plus units of affordable housing and that is expected. I, I haven't mentioned it because you know we haven't completed it. Work has happened this past year to get that to where it is right now and um, really over, over many years leading back to the planning entitlements. And, um, uh, we are expecting occupancy of that um, and opening that up to, to 60 plus new uh, affordable households um, in the August timeframe. So right around the corner. So another, you know, if these projects take years in the making um, and we've got a lot in the pipeline, but that one's coming up really soon in terms of um, people being able to move in, which is always a great thing. Right. Yeah, it just seems like um, for, you know, for the public today to understand um, all the foundational work and then also currently all the efforts um, with real, I, 
feel like very real progress. Maybe I'm, you know, um, but I, I feel really a lot of progress, a lot of commitment from the city from, as a government, but also with um, local affordable housing developers. Obviously, the state is doing a ton with regards to affordable housing and, and also the mandate coming out of the state. Love them or hate them, they're, they're reality right now. Um, but it's just for the community to really understand and forecast that housing will become a major front and center discussion for you know council uh, next year and, and moving into uh, future years, which is exciting and timely because um, we have to figure out how to do it together um, because we, we we have that housing, but obviously we also have you know a lot of design concerns and other things. So I just look at. The objective standards. I look at the housing element. You know, you look at all these pieces. A lot of a lot of cities don't have all of those things lining up at once. You know, over a couple of years. And so I think that there will be a lot of clarity and hopefully a lot of engagement by our community in queuing some of these things up. So it's good to hear. I just kind of want to hear the timing on that. So thank you, Lee. You're welcome. Uh, uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have a question? Yes, briefly. Um, with regards to the affordable housing and units that are coming online, I'm just curious, um, just so the, how do people sign up to be on the list to potentially qualify for that housing? I mean, is it through Section 8 or do they just apply, you know, once the housing becomes available, they'll advertise and you have to meet a certain threshold? It's just, I think a lot of people are unclear that, you know, we're asking for affordable housing, but then once the affordable housing is built, how do people act, actually access it who need it? So, so it does vary. Sometimes um, it can be through um, the housing authority with um, uh, specific um, project-based vouchers. Um, and other times it, it can be separate from the housing authority. Um, I'm wondering, I don't wanna put uh, Bonnie on the spot here, but I see she's on the line and I don't know about 350 Ocean um, and how they are, um, they are uh, broken down in terms of, um, I believe they do have some project-based vouchers, um, but it looks like she, oh, Maybe she knows. <laughs> I'm here, but I wasn't listening that close. Oh, sorry. There, so I apologize. Uh, so uh, Councilmember Cummings asked um, how folks know about upcoming, uh, about how to sign up for a project. And I mentioned the uh, project-based vouchers, which I believe 350 Ocean does have some project-based vouchers um, that um, people could uh, get on the list through them. Is that correct? Yes. So there's a number of ways. I mean, we generally, when there are, and actually, uh, Council Member Bruner and Vice Mayor Bruner's uh, nodding as well, so she can she can weigh in from the house. Yeah. But there are multiple ways of making sure the general community and the, sort of the general public's aware of some of these. We definitely put it on our housing page and our website whenever these opportunities come up because generally they do have wait lists and they fill up quickly. Um, but the Housing Authority site is another great site and resource um, for those as well. And then if you know the project name, which many folks don't, if you know the project name, you know they often will have a sign up on their site. They'll also have a website for how to um, sign up and submit an application and, and in some instances get on a wait list. But I'm gonna defer to uh, Vice Mayor Bruner who may wanna talk specifically about the Housing Authority. Go ahead. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I, I did want to add on, it depends on each uh, site. Sometimes it is an individual site application, and which Bonnie mentioned there will be oftentimes a big banner on the outside of the building with the web URL to inquire or a phone number to call and inquire. Um, if it is through the Housing Authority, the Housing Authority website URL has a link, and I believe it's called Find Rental Housing. And so if there are project-based vouchers, usually will be listed through that link on the Housing Authority website. And anybody who's already on the Housing Authority list will be, um, have access to that information. So a lot of different ways, um, 
you know, the city website has also listed in the past um, the links and information. So, um, yeah, that's what I know. And I would just add with that, our housing manager just texted me and reminded me that we always reach out um, to some of our partners as well to make sure that they're posting on their website and doing outreach. So, for example, the ocean, um, our team reached out to Edgar at Nueva Vista to make sure to get the word out um, for when projects come online. So that's just something that we do with every new project that comes on board. And then as Vice Mayor Bruner mentioned, you know, it, it also, for projects that the city has funding in, we're really proactive about those as well um, because we do get a lot of inquiries that come into the city, so. I have a note in my calendar. Is the project opening tomorrow? Yes. Yeah. There is a grand opening event tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. That's what I thought. I was like, I think I have that. Yeah. So for council members who would like to see a brand new affordable housing development, uh, it's opening tomorrow at 11 a.m. 11 to 12 o'clock. There's a ribbon cutting. It, it is a soft opening, but it is tomorrow. Yes. Thank you. And for Colin Terry Johnson. Thanks, I just wanted to add, um, for individuals who are un unhoused, um, there are case managers and outreach workers that work with the county and nonprofits and they do um, coordinated entry smart path assessment. And that smart path assessment is the mechanism to get folks um, linked into affordable housing. And, and those nonprofits are also connected obviously to housing authority and um, know of all of the lists of the housing units that are coming into place. So that's um, specifically for those who are unhoused is the smart path assessment. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lee, we appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have more questions as on, on social line items next, next month and finalizing the budget. Appreciate your presentation. So thank you. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank your whole thank department you. for their work. Will do, thank you all. Next up is Laura Schmidt. Uh, she will pre be presenting the city manager's office budget and she is our assistant city manager. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Vice Mayor and Council members. Going to share my screen. Are you all able to see that? We are, yep. Thank you. Alrighty, so I'll be covering um, the city council and city manager's office budget and then um, after our Q&A, next up into the queue will be Tony Condotti to do the city attorney's office. So the sections that I'll be covering with you today are our services and who delivers them, the achievements for this upcoming fiscal year that's ending in fiscal year 21 and then our budget for fiscal year 22. So when you think of the city manager's office, what are the various service categories that we function in? And um, the first one is our city clerk's office. And then the second one is um, administration and council support. And administration covers all the various and sundry human resources and um, departmental uh, guidance and oversight that you would imagine. And then all of the support that we do for the council members. We have also a major service area of strategy and communications, and that is the all city strategy that we work um, to support the council with any given uh, fiscal and calendar year, and then as well as implementing that and taking the strategy and actually implementing it with our departments. And then the other major section that we do is program and project management. There are a lot of ongoing programs that we support, such as the climate action and sustainability policies, and then any ad hoc projects that come out up in any given fiscal year. When you look at the, the breakdown of what our uh, how those services uh, go into our different areas and our work groups within the clerk's division. They 
help and facilitate the gathering and disbursement of community information. They are our main help desk um, as far as the community when they call into the main number. They either help answer the questions or route them to the appropriate department. They do all the records management for the city as well as the election coordination and then agenda and meeting administration. Uh, the main one that they help administer and uh, facilitate is the council, but they also support any of our advisory bodies and any other of our commissions and committees that need assistance. Uh, they are the main uh, support mechanism for that. On the city administration side, that's our other major branch and for city and council administrative services, we do administration and council support. We, and then we also support citywide communications. On the program and project management side, uh, I have categorized a general bucket. So those are ones that any ad hoc requests that come in and any sort of things that are not climate action and sustainability and health and all policies or homelessness would fall into our general category of programs and projects. So on the programs and projects side or any of the work that arrives in the city manager's office, one of the things that um, sometimes people wonder are when does the city manager's office get involved? Generally, if, there, if the initiative or the request is citywide, so it cannot be seated in any one specific department, it's multi-department or it just involves all departments, it'll be um, within the city manager's office scope. Sometimes it's not necessarily citywide, but let's say it involves a third of the city departments and not one of them has um, the, the primary driving of it, then sometimes that will also come to us. Additionally, and when something is interagency, when we need to collaborate actively with the county or some of our other regional partners, uh, that will often also dictate that it comes to the city manager's office. And then sometimes it's also just council um, direction and assignment or other factors that come into play of when something arrives in the city manager's office scope of services. To give you an idea about that programs and projects, uh, this is not necessarily a list of accomplishments, but more uh, examples of what happens in the general bucket and then some of the subject matter specific ones. So we administer um, contracts, including the core and other social services grants that the city handles and disperses funds for to our regional partners. Uh, we coordinate the independent police auditor and the legislative program. We also have uh, standing committee committees that we staff uh, on behalf of others, the Climate Action Task Force, the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, our Community Programs Committee, and our Public Safety Committee. When ad hoc committees arise uh, and their um, cities uh, citywide or multi-departmental, oftentimes the city manager's office will staff those we are helping with the Revenue Council Ad Hoc Committee as well as the Council Ad Hoc Green Economy Committee. And then on an ongoing basis, we staff uh, multiple joint powers authority and that includes our animal services, our public libraries and our Santa Cruz County Regional 911. Examples of general projects that are come into play recently that you might recall um, on the strategy front is our re envisioned Santa Cruz, our interim recovery plan, the California Voters' Rights Act, housing, manager, ha housing Matters Hygiene Bay, and then grants management integration and improvements. On the climate action and sustainability, you um, just recently received a report from Tip, Dr. Tiffany Wise West. Um, we're finished in 2020 and then um, we have just launched an RFP selected a partner to help develop climate action 2030. Health and all policies, um, we were brought into that process and the year one report and then we're also working to facilitate the two five year work plan and then another example would be the West Cliff Drive adaptation and management plan. Uh, this is a subject specific one on the homelessness response side working with regional partners and um, developing those relationships and aligning uh, our strategy and our plans with our other regional partners. We just had uh, the county in a special study session here last week, so we were able to understand what their strategy and plans are. 
Uh, we've been working a lot on the COVID-19 response, helping with the encampment coordination, and then the facilitation and drafts of the ordinance, as well as in the future, the actual implementation that uh, helps us uh, be able to uh, roll out the ordinance. Moving on to our achievements for this fiscal year, on the clerk side, uh, the staff developed the Brown Act training for our city commission members, along with our city attorney's office and hosted a training on that for commission members as well as staff. We've administered 27 regular and special council meetings um, so far, and then had 98% compliance for our statements of economic interest, um, otherwise known formally as the Form 700. And then we've also managed uh, 232 records requests for fiscal year 21. Groovy Tuesday. This is you guys, so um, whether I don't know how it feels compared to what the data says, but the data says for uh, fiscal year 20 to 21, your average hours of uh, regular and special meetings is lower. So, but just for regular meetings alone, you are about the same as fiscal year 20. And then if you guys are feeling like a yo-yo, this is why. So. <laughs> For uh, the fiscal year to date uh, through, May, through uh, April 11th when I grabbed these statistics, uh, these are your council meetings in, in hours. So your longest council meeting, and I believe it's the longest meeting since I've been in the last two years of doing this job, uh, was 15 hours and 42 minutes. <laughs> that includes your breaks and lunches and dinner. So a lot is this one right here. Other achievements on the city council and administrative services side, um, we've managed thousands of emails to and for people and the city and triaged out to other departments. Uh, we've hosted about five citywide employee communication meetings and we'll probably, uh, we're at the run rate of having about seven of them by the end of this fiscal year. And then with council, we've developed and implemented the city's uh, recovery strategy, re-envision Santa Cruz. And then we're also, we've also developed a comprehensive citywide communications plan. On the program and project management side, uh, we've re-engineered a couple of core functions, uh, the independent police auditor, we have a new one in place now, and then the legislative program as well. We've made some really great progress on key climate sustainability and equity projects, and then we're in the facilitating work on a potential city revenue balance measure and um, have just finished polling and are working to come bring more information back to council in June. We've also uh, started and implemented pilot programs with street vending and then we will, by the end of this fiscal year, have an integrated citywide grant writing services uh, pilot completed. Moving on to uh, fiscal year 22 and what we're looking to achieve in fiscal year 22, aligned to our re-envision Santa Cruz and the fiscal sustainability side of it, we'll have um, finished the grants pilot from fiscal year 21 and then rolled that out with the citywide grants roadmap, uh, some central coordination to improve the way that we communicate in an integrated way and um, targeted specific grants for the city to go after and hopefully successfully be awarded. We'll have uh, hopefully a successful uh, uh, revenue ballot measure around November 21. It kind of depends upon the state uh, election process and then uh, partnership with the department for ongoing corrective structural fiscal changes. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, on the downtown and business revitalization core focus area, we'll be um, doing ongoing strategic communications to support the outreach uh, for the critical business and housing projects. And we also will participate and coordinate uh, with the workforce development and other green economy projects in, in conjunction with the other departments. On the infrastructure, and I also put in here services, equity, well-being, and sustainability. Um, we'll do various supportive services for the unhoused community. We'll talk about that in more detail um, in the next few slides. And then further adoption and rollout of health and all policies, as well as um, the development of Climate Action 2030. So 
Well, first cover city council and city manager's office. City, city council budget is pretty much status quo at around $493,000. It's broken out 70%, 30%, 70% to personnel and 30% to services and supplies. As far as highlights of the city council, um, as budget wise, the holiday lunch, which we defunded last year, is um, um, back, and then we also have ongoing funding for open streets, Santa Cruz Neighbors Citywide Block Party, and then um, for Tenant Sanctuary, uh, Tenant Legal Services uh, Organization, I just repeated, we just repeated the fiscal year 21 uh, funding for $30,000. The city manager's office budget is at around $6.27 million. Um, this side of the pie is the uh, city manager's core functions and the services that I spoke about earlier. The city manager's office composes about 33% of all the different activities underneath the city manager's office. The Commission for the Prevention Violence Against Women, their budget held um, steady as the same as last year. There are about 1%. Police auditors stayed the same as well, um, also about 1%. City clerks um, within city manager's office is about 16, climate action 3%, membership and dues 3%. And then the rest of these are funding uh, streams that go to partner recipients. So they represent about 45% of our overall budget and those activities are broken out into community programs and services. Uh, this funds things like the uh, mental health liaison, the downtown outreach workers, the downtown streets teams, and then the collection of results and evidence-based investments. Those are our core investments where we work and operate under the, the umbrella of the county core program. And we are holding steady with the current core recipient list and have funded all of that. Um, and um, I'll highlight this and I think in the next slide as well, um, but with NCOR last year, we did not fund um, a $45,000 set aside process. And I also held that study, so that did not is not funded currently and would be something to consider. Um, Animal Shelter and Services is also here and that's our uh, Joint Powers Authority with the county and other local agencies like Scotts Valley, Watsonville, Capitola and the county. And uh, we buy into that to receive our animal shelter and services uh, through that JPA and that's funded at 11%. Um, highlights in our city manager's office budget. We did reduce the temporary budget um, and this was prior to the ordinance and the impact of the various items that we were going to need to execute as it related to the ordinance. So um, we might, this might not have been a good idea in hindsight, but at the point in time when we submitted the budget, we did reduce temporary budget staffing. Um, the animal shelter contribution, that's the 11% from the previous that is uh, currently holding uh, steady and uh, that contribution is to be determined. But the initial conversations at that board level are that we will um, be reduced uh, because uh, other agencies are also struggling with COVID economic impacts. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm just struggling right now. On the... Uh, Core side, I had mentioned our set aside was unfunded last year and that was repeated. So currently the core, all of the core recipients, the standard recipients have stayed the same, but the set aside process where we have an application to go through, that is not currently funded in this budget. On the personnel side, <clears throat> the net savings, uh, we have a net savings of around uh, 52,000 in one time. And that is because we are uh, recommending to temporarily freeze a clerk's administrative assistant to position that was vacated through a retirement in um, the past fiscal year. And we're recommending to keep it open. And we're doing that so that we can um, fill the city manager's homelessness response position and then also combine and share the planning and community development and homelessness response director. So that would be uh, Lee Butler, our, our current planning and community development director, taking on homelessness response as part of his and, um, being, and that being funded as a deputy city manager. 
but we would defund the planning and community development director. So the funding on that budget would be decreased. It would move to the city manager's office and there would be a net $15,000 annual increase at a deputy city manager combined position. On, the, on that personnel side, why um, did we go the route of asking to fund the homelessness and recommending to fund the homelessness response manager position and do the deputy city manager combined job? Um, it is, it is th this ad hoc and programmatic work um, when we create an ongoing program. And as you know, with the unhoused community and our need to deliver assistance and services to them, it is a, a ever at this point and um, we felt that the, it warranted this homelessness response support structure. So between the various shelters at the Armory and potentially River Street and anywhere else, we might um, bring them up the point in time situation, our ongoing citywide operational coordination and our integration with the county and our other ser service providers um, operating tactically things like the shuttle. And then when you add on top of that, the need to support the camping services and standards ordinance with daytime storage, the min minimum 150 safe sleeping spots, and then the possible additional managed encampments. Uh, all that um, draws us to this is a substantial and significant homelessness response program and how do we go about executing to this policy? And in order to be able to um, support and execute that successfully, when we look at the work in this area, um, from the high level down to the operational details, uh, the way that we are seeing our ability to execute to this is in the planning and community development and homelessness response director position, that person would focus on policy, strategic planning, and measurement. And then as we transition from that strategic and programming level, we move over into the project and process level. And that's um, the request to hire the homelessness response manager position, which has been vacant for almost a year. It'll be vacant a year as of July. So we need that resource to be able to execute the process and project. And then on the financial administration and procedural and other documentation, um, we have a temporary resource to do that, that analytical and then basically management analyst work. So that's the, that's the suite of the skill sets going from to procedure and operational that we're seeing um, needing to be able to have in order to support all of the different uh, services that we want to deliver to our unhoused community. When you translate that into um, an organization, what does that look like in the city manager's office? The city administration and city clerk side. So we talked about our service areas in the city. This is our city clerk or deputy city clerk. Our records um, coordinator, our administrative assistant too. Uh, we have a part-time administrative assistant that we share with Parks and Recreation. And this is our frozen uh, administrative assistant too. So we have four and a half FTEs to cover all of the processes in those areas. Um, over here on the city administration, we have city council and administrative services. We have an, the assistant city manager, me, uh, a communications manager who works across and supports all program and project needs, not just for the city manager, but for all departments as they request. And then we have an executive assistant to the city manager and um, the city manager himself. Um, Project management side, we have a assistant to the city manager and that uh, person does the program and project management within the city. This is the general bucket. And then they also do administration and council support. We have a sustainability and climate action manager and then a principal management analyst. And um, that person also does administration and council support. Within the uh, homelessness response vertical, what we're re recommending is by combining the planning and community development director with the homelessness response director into one position, uh, that deputy city manager position, Lee would work approximately 25% of his hours on homelessness response and city manager's office duties, and then the rest of it would be filled 75% 
safety development. Um, right now, that uh, percentage is heavily skewed to the city manager's office, and he's obviously um, work, working more than one FTE. He's probably working more like 1.4 to 1.5 FTE, considering his overtime, um, and which is another reason why we are asking to fill the program and project manager in the homelessness response manager position. And then we have a part-time homelessness analyst temp that does the process, uh, procedural and operational implementation work. So within the homelessness response, we would have approximately 1.75 FTEs working in this space. As far as the, um, what those uh, homelessness response resources would be doing, implementing next, um, we, we would implement the services and programming associated with the camping ordinance. We would um, develop a city consolidated homelessness response plan, especially since we received the information um, with uh, the homelessness response um, information from the county, just and then based upon past and recent work, we would develop a comprehensive uh, response plan for the city. Uh, we also want to develop a program funding and staffing model. Um, the 1.75 FTE that we've got right there right now um, is a starting point, and then we also need to do a comprehensive budget in this space, and we just have not had the resources or the time to be able to do that. And then can, we need to, um, in the midst of all that, over our ongoing services and ad hoc response to emergent unhoused needs. Wanted to highlight a couple of service modifications in fiscal year 22. With the frozen administrative assistant two in the clerk's office, um, part of the main duties of that is the reception function. So we would continue to have modified reception hours given our reduced staffing in the clerk's office. And um, right now we are currently open eight to 12 and one to three Monday through Thursday, closed both Fridays of the pay period. And then um, the other service modification, and I believe this was asked, uh, might have been yesterday during uh, information technology conversation of the hybrid meetings in the foreseeable future, we would imagine uh, once we go back to uh, council chambers, we would still offer and support a hybrid model for meetings with the council and possibly with our other advisory bodies. Um, that is the for the city managers and clerk's office. Uh, what questions do you have? Thanks so much, Laura. Uh, I will look to see if we have any council members with questions at this time. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, um, Assistant, uh, Assistant City Manager uh, Schmidt for showing us in, uh, in uh, graph form uh, what what our our work looks like, um, or our, the time we spend. I um, am wondering if you could um, explain, so I have two questions, one related to the changing positions and then one to a, a current position that is temporary. I just, I just was learned that we have uh, based, what's essentially a perma temp in the city manager's office right now. Um, and so I'm just wondering, given that this person has been, has filled that role for quite some time um, and is seen as quite valuable to, um, in particular, homelessness response, I'm just wondering how that, where that fits in your thinking, if there's any um, thinking about making that a permanent position, it seems um, like it kind of is already. Um, and then my second question is, how is the um, proposal for shifting the, eliminating the, the planning director position and um, moving that, that work over to the city manager's budget, essentially, um, how is this different than the proposal we got um, back in at midterm? And is it different, I guess? And if so, how? Great. Thank you, council member. Um, regarding the, the temporary position and, and the person who has been assisting us in the homelessness response space there, um, 
we have ha we do have an overabundance of need in in this area whether or not we turn that into a permanent position and come back to council at some point to request that uh, needs to be part of that of staffing budgeting and um, homelessness response plan so I think given uh, formal direction and development of homelessness response plan by, that is specific to the city but leverages our historical work in this space as well as what the county is looking to achieve, um, that recommendation would come out of that process. Um, regarding the planning director position and how is this different from the last um, recommendation, um, it is different in the sense of I believe there was confusion at the last um, conversation that we had that we were keeping the planning and community development position frozen and then creating an additional FTE in the city manager's office. So that was the case, but I don't think we did a very um, good job of communicating that. So. This is the clarification that we are we are trying to leverage an existing city resources for a huge need for us to be able to um, have executive policy and strategy of our support of the unhoused community. And in order to do that, we're leveraging an existing department head and all of the knowledge he brings of the community and the housing environment into play that funding is moving from the Planning and Community Development Department over to the city manager's office. That director position is unfunded at that point and we cannot fill up frozen, it is unfunded. So that, that's the, the clarification. And I think the other, the, other, um, the other very important data points as of right now are what I showed in the circle diagram, the comprehensive list of services, projects, and operational work we have been directed by um, council to execute to in the unhoused space and to helping these um, persons in our community um, who desperately need it. And we're trying to organizationally respond with this work chart and the staffing structure Say, this is how we feel that we can best respond to how what policy you've established and the direction that you've given us. We'll go do this. This is how we think it's best to do this. And then also um, requesting to un or to unfreeze the homelessness response manager position. Thank you. If I may, just one quick follow-up question. Um, so, I, as I understand it, you um, you're suggesting that some of the decision making around staffing and the workload and workflow will be determined through the build out of a homelessness response plan. Um, and I'm I'm just wondering that that is not the case for what I'm from what I understand the other positions. So unfreezing the homeless resource manager and um, moving the planning director into uh, the deputy city mission, those are being decided before the whole, the overall plan. So I'm, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how that, that temp position is different than the other two um, or how you're thinking about that as, um, as we move forward. Um, the, the, the existing work that we have right now, the model that we can do to quickly respond is we already have a homelessness response manager position created that council approved in November of 2019. Um, it's been vacant since the incumbent resigned last July. So that one, the, the lead time to be able to fill that position and we know as of right now, the amount of work that needs to be done in this space. Uh, we know that that our that our existing planning and community development director is trying to fill both jobs right now, and it's untenable. So it, it's, a, it's a very easy mathematical exercise to be able to say, we need to fill the homelessness response manager, it's an existing and it, actually, it targets these job responsibilities and the program and project management execution space. 
on the homeless on on the tent position that has always been a it, it's been an up and down it's been a fluid position and we have staffed it with somebody who appreciates that fluidity and um, whether or not we have to an additional FTE in the city manager's office. Um, a lot of that work, if we have the homelessness response manager, the homelessness response manager can work fungibly across the spectrum. And we don't have, um, we did not want to come at this point without the, the fuller plan to the council to request a full-time equivalent. Okay, I'll I'll, um, I'll I'll stop there. I guess I'm um, I, I'm I'm still kind of wondering how you know the I'm thinking about this also from the perspective of our workforce and um, you know the the work the work that people do and the compensation they get for it and it's a pretty important job that I'm doing at the moment. So I guess I just um, I'm feeling like. I'd like to um, be supportive of you know the, our whole, the whole um, suite of, of workers and 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 folks who are um, involved in this homelessness response programming. Um, so uh, I'm I, I I hear your response. I'm I'm still a little um, I'm a, I'm a little concerned. Um, I guess that's for another conversation. I have Councilmember Cummings, then Vice Mayor Bruner. Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson and then Councilmember Watkins. And we will take a break after this item. And then um, hoping to have two more departments present and then hopefully we'll have a lunch break at 1215, just so everybody kind of knows the schedule ahead. Great, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, I'm just curious, because I, I have some concerns and um, just been hurt hearing from some folks in the community around you know the way this is structured and um and so i'm just curious if there's been because it sounds like you know we have this homelessness response manager position that hasn't been filled and as a result the planning director has been picking up a lot of that slack but i'm wondering you know what if any efforts have been made to try to fill that position because it sounds like you know we were able to fill that position that the homeless the planning director could continue in his role and this person could you know pick up that workload that um, is, you know, that we've already allocated funding to and has been unfilled. And, you know, this, especially since yesterday, we, um, you know, the city manager salary has, I think a lot of people have been concerned about, you know, adding positions and administrative load. And so I'm just wondering, you know, if maybe it, like if any work has been done thus far to try to fill that position. And if, you know, maybe that could be a first step rather than creating a deputy city manager. And I don't want to go into the, you know, should we do one or the other, but just, you know, really focusing on if there's been any work to fill that homelessness response manager position. Um, we, have, we have not tried to fill the position because it is frozen right now. We don't have um, the authorization to fill it. So it is it is frozen through fiscal year 21. So part of this budget process is we put it on the list of our budget recommendations to fill the position. Um, as far as filling that position and not doing a, a the deputy city manager move, uh, what we learned in the process of the recruiting of the first homelessness response manager and that person's tenure here, um, having that work person work the full spectrum of policy and strategy, intergovernmental relationship and um, intergovernmental um, um, policy development, as well as the program management and the project management and then operations, the, the spectrum and the scope of that responsibility was too broad to find a given candidate and it was too much work for any one given candidate to endeavor to achieve on a day-to-day -day basis. So that is how we, we ended up bringing Lee into play to be able to help 
because he is an existing department head who knows our community partners, has existing relationships, and is also used to working because of planning and community development work in the policy and strategy in our agency space. So that's the key role that that um, type of skill set plays in conjunction with the homelessness response manager at the program and project level and operations. And I saw Martine, um, our city manager, jumped on. I don't know if you wanted to add something. Uh, yes, thank you. Just a little bit, uh, a little bit. Uh, I think one of the major uh, things to just keep in mind is that uh, what we are looking to endeavor and to move into is is a really significant uh, uh, change to operationalize the way we're going to uh, respond to homelessness and and to set up the 150 sites in addition to the uh, uh, storage uh, as well as the implementation of the, the new regulations is 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 is, is a huge task uh, and that requires really a dedicated you know function. We're now operationalizing. Uh, and creating a new function essentially, and that requires appropriate staffing at the various levels. Uh, we need, with the homelessness, you know, we need the ability for uh, a level enough for someone that can work at the policy level with the county or regional partners, states and feds, as well as individuals that are being working at the program programmatic level, as uh, as Laura mentioned. Um, and so the, the idea here is to do it in this cost-effective way as we can. Uh, to the, with respect to the, the temp position, uh, again, just to highlight, that person has not wanted to work full time, and so we we are respecting, you know, that person's been highly accepted, um, and so we're, we're out of respect to, for her, you know, we're, we're, we have a structure that works for her, um, but the need is there, no doubt, and so we're happy to. Uh, uh, it's not uh, you know, a uh, uh, budget saving uh, strategy necessarily. Um, but again, I just want to emphasize that the, the key thing here is that we're moving to a different uh, model here where um, we want to change the way we respond to homelessness, and, and that just requires uh, the, the various levels of, of resources and staffing to be able to do that. Thank you, Martine. Uh, next up, I have Council Member, or excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, okay, so some of my question was also asked. Um, the homelessness response manager, um, well, overall, the city, the homeless response needs, there was a slide that you showed, uh, Laura, and um, I'm really, you know, as I'm new and being and have learned about each department, we really haven't invested in um, a type of homeless response needs uh, for the city. And um, so I see the overall uh, migration to address that um, where we have, um, you know, we don't have a department that addresses this huge need in the city. And so really filling this homeless response manager position um, will be crucial. And so um, you were saying there was a, I think with that slide, $15,000 net increase with the, the city planning position and the homeless response director position. Um, that is that correct? Was that the amount? Yep. Okay. Um, and so what is, okay, there we go. Um, and what is the amount of the um, homelessness response manager position? It is around $33,000 a year annually, and it is um, low. I have to double check my number. Uh, but it is, as far as the general fund goes, it's an allocated position across multiple funds. Mm -hmm. So the general fund impact of it is not the full 
a dollar amount equivalent of that position. Okay. Um, and I think um, regarding the uh, the temp position, um, I think what's really important here is to show the value of each work position and um, that we're investing appropriately in um, and um, not just at high administrative positions, um, and that, you know, we show um, that uh, in some way. And, um, you know, like Martine Bernal just mentioned, that the current temp position appreciates the fluidity and want, um, a, you know, and so I think showcasing that or, you know, um, addressing that in some way will be important in as we start to have these conversations of uh, the, the higher paid positions, I think everybody and, and our constituents, we want to make sure that all positions are valued compensated appropriately and not on the low end of any spectrum um, so when we when we tend to focus on you know one position or a couple of positions it's important to also bring in the whole team and to show that they are valued in some way so I hope that um, we can do that, and I hope that this homelessness response manager, as we unfreeze that position, that it's also looked at as um, they are compensated appropriately, and and that you know any of the work teams involved in 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 this particular area um, are valued, and it's shown through through their web. Benefits, permanent position, compensation, et cetera, um, because it right. takes a team, as we see across all departments. And um, so I just want to emphasize that I hope that we will see that going forward. Yeah, I very much appreciate your comments and, and the perspective that you and the other council members are bringing. The, 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 the interesting conundrum for us is it, to communicate how much we value that position. One of the reasons why um, it is had it stayed the way it is is because of the value that we put on that specific member. And I didn't think, I didn't personally want to air um, that employee's wishes in in a, a council meeting as far as why we've left the position as it stands today. Yeah, no, and I think it's important to understand each of those roles um, in those positions. And I think, you know, like you broke it down with the policy um, part of it could be this one section and then homeless response manager, you know, is really focused on the process, the project, the operations, you know, the program and project level um, rather than the whole thing. It's a lot. The whole thing is a lot, as we've seen. and. Um, um, you know, just really, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm happy that we're investing in this moving forward. So I just want to make sure it's equitable and fair and, um, and, you know, effective. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor, I think you're muted. I have Council Member Watkins and then Council Member, I'm sorry, Council Member Collintory Johnson is next, then Council Member Watkins. Uh, Council Member I have you up again. I might I might take a break if, if it's 11.15 so that we can at least take a little bio break since you had several questions. So uh, Council Member Collintory Johnson, please. Thank you. Um, some of my questions and, and um, the sentiments of my comments have been made by my colleagues, but I did want to just also express concern about the temp position. Um, it, feel, it seems that if we were able to um, 
this position fulfills a lot of the needs for our um, homelessness response. And if we were able to create fluidity in a way that creates security, um, could we look at part-time FTE um, so that this individual could get benefits and um, have some more security in that position um, while still retaining the fluidity that the individual um, um, would like in, in their position. So that's something for us to think about. And um, in terms of the deputy manager position, first of all, let me just pause and say um, thank you. And I appreciate that we are being thoughtful about really creating a structure where we can respond effectively and efficiently to what we desire as, as, as a city um, in homelessness response. <laughs> I should have started out with that. I really appreciate that we're looking at really building the infrastructure and building the staffing to support the work. Um, so in terms of the, the deputy city manager position, um, I, I really would like to, to understand and learn more. Um, and it, it seems like a pretty significant shift. Um, and with bringing on a new city manager in the next coming month, in the coming months, um, we may want to think about waiting until the new city manager comes on to make such a significant structural shift. So those are my, some of my thoughts and comments. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Council member Watkins. Thank you, Mayor, and yeah, just to sort of echo my colleague's comments, just, you know, I appreciate all the presentations. I appreciate the intention behind the proposals as well as the recognition of balancing program and people, and that's really true for any organization. Um, and I guess I'll kind of limit my, my questions um, or sort of uh, specify them I have, I have really essentially two questions because um, the majority has already been asked. One is um, in regards to the freezing of the city clerk position, um, how I interpret, I think, within the presentation is some of that savings is going to go to offset the, um, the homeless response efforts. Is that accurate? Yes. It we didn't necessarily want to um, open and unfreeze all positions given the ongoing structural deficits that we have. And is that going to be, I mean, kind of given a visual of the organizational kind of approach, does that impact that division significantly by not filling that position? Essentially, by freezing that position, what's the impact for that? Uh, the impact the, the impact is the modification of the reception hours uh, rather than opening up reception to being full time uh, after the covid restrictions are lifted re lifted we would continue to have the modified reception hours that is and that was the major okay. impact okay um it's the reception support okay okay i just wanted to get clarity on that um I, I, and then my other question was in regards to the tenant sanctuary proposed funding. What has been the outcome of those dollars? Or um, I know there was the set aside kind of historically looking back on how that came about. There was sort of that as an immediate need to support um, individuals at that time. And then as time has gone on, we've also had the core funding, the set aside funding. So. I wonder how that could eventually streamline into that process, essentially as a safety net service that we as a city support. Um, and what has been sort of the, um, what has been the reporting or the outcomes of, and, and what's the interest in having that as a proposed line item for this year as well? I think if if the council wishes to, instead of directly funding tenant sanctuary, and if I'm hearing you correctly, the possible consideration could be that um, it is another uh, applicant in a, a set aside process. Um, that that could definitely be a process option to pursue. Um, the actual outcomes. Um, 
they submit a report to the city manager's office. I can't remember how often that is, if it's every six months, and then that is distributed um, from the city manager's office or principal management analyst out to the city council members. And in it, they give um, a, a reporting of the essential clients that they service during that particular period. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't know if I've seen that recently. So if there is that, I mean, I'd be interested in looking looking at that. Um, and then I think the last question I have is in regards to the homelessness funding. I think you know, certainly that is a huge impact to the city, and it's been funded one way or another, whether it's been intentional or reactive. I'd say personally, having observed it over the past several years, um, so having some strategy around moving forward with intention, I think also looking at setting aside some or finding a way to identify some dollars for the impact and account around metrics of success or proxy metrics of success for what that, um, what those dollars are going towards. And then the other is really being aware of the funding potentially coming from the state in regards to supporting cities with this issue and how that could potentially be uh, a source of revenue to support any kind of administrative costs associated with that. Oh. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mayor. If if I if I can go back to potentially addressing Councilmember Kalantari Johnson's sure um, comment about the deputy city manager. Uh, yes, this this could be an option for the city council to to wait on a decision on that. But the other consideration to keep paramount in your mind is you've already given direction to this city manager to execute. And in order for us to be able to execute, where our recommendation and our request is to take a look at this organizational structure and for us to be able to implement effectively. The items on the to-do list and a lot of the great comments that you all have in previous council meetings of, you know, what's the budget approach? What's the funding model? What are the resources that we need? Uh, we have these historical reports. How is that information being integrated into it? Um, in order for us to be able to address those items and, and work effectively on it, this is why we're requesting what we're requesting to be able to spearhead that and to get that moving to be able to bring you the output and the results that you're asking us. Um, we could postpone it, but the, but the, the further we, we postpone it, the further and more difficult it, it becomes for us to be able to execute in this space. And as you know, um, the need is far outstripping our capacity right now. and and a delay of three to six months. It also puts us in uh, tactically the winter. So um, we have we have a timing issue here as well. So I just I just wanted to obviously this is something of, of deep consideration for you all and we very much appreciate the comments, but I wanted to clarify some of that. Martin Bernard. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, with respect to the, the temporary issue. Uh, uh, I just want to be clear that our practice as a city uh, is to, uh, if we have individuals that uh, start off temporarily uh, and for some reason that work converts into an ongoing uh, type of work, our, our practice and our preference is to convert that and it's the right thing to do to make it into a full-time equivalent position. That is our practice. So, now, sometimes that doesn't happen for a variety of reasons. At times it's because the individual has, you know, isn't interested necessarily, how that may change, and or the, the work is being evaluated because maybe the individual wants to work part-time but it's gonna be a full-time position or those kinds of factors. But again, we do not uh, purposefully make, you know, keep a position temporary in, you know, in order to simply save money. That is not really the, the, 
the consideration. In fact, or it's, it's, it's doing the right thing, which is, you know, if the person, if the job is there and it's going to be an ongoing job, we will convert it to temp. That is our practice. We've done that multiple times across the city over many years. That will continue to be a practice. I just want to be clear about that. that this, you know, we don't, uh, you know, I don't want the insinuation that somehow we're trying to somehow not be fair or treat an employee equitably because that is simply not the case. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Um, I'm going to cue myself in here real quick. Um, I believe Councilor Cummings and Brown had spoken, so I just want to try to catch this and then we'll take a break. Um, I'm happy to have you two. I'll have the two additional council members make comments as well, and then we'll take a break. Um, so I think I'm a little bit of the odd duck out this morning. Um, I think I've heard some support. Um, I feel that we have to put the structure in place. Um, so I am supportive of the staff, um, the staff structure that's been proposed, um, filling the homeless response manager position and the deputy city manager position. Um, I've talked over the last many months about how they're structuring their homeless response. Um, and you know, so many cities are facing this right now. All cities are basically structuring response teams and response um, departments because unfortunately the state continues to just, you know, hand all of these issues to, to local cities primarily and counties. Um, and so I think that there is some models that are starting to gin up. And I do think that Laura's um, uh, figure she showed where there is this kind of separation between sort of policy and operational that is um, complementary and incredibly important because you do have to have someone that's several steps ahead um, and really understanding and watching where things are pivoting at the state level through legislation, funding opportunities, all of that. Um, obviously tracking with the county, I think we've seen some good um, results, not exactly every result we wanna see. I'm not gonna say that everything is great with the county, but I think we've got better communication. There's some opportunities where we did get commitment to put um, additional shelter outside of the city through um, a combination of working with um, several of the supervisors. Um, so I, I think that the structure as we have it is working to some extent. I do uh, acknowledge that the response manager position is critical and it's and, and it's it's the part of the puzzle that really does need to be thought out. I'd like to see us operationalize that because we do um, with the new ordinance have a lot of um, operational concerns and operational facilities that we need to stand up and start to um, put forth. Uh, the RFQ, I think, has been a really successful process. Um, we are we are moving forward with helping people uh, and providing space for people who need uh, need immediate need. You know, meet, need immediate help in our community. That is what we're doing, and um, I think there is a programmatic, a fairly strong programmatic um, outline for this. And I I think. You know, we have a mid-year budget adjustment in January every year. Um, we are learning how to, to put together a department that's never existed in a city, in most city governments. Um, I think we can overthink this, and I think we should, um, you know, put together the system that we need in place with this budget uh, adoption in June. And obviously, we can revisit this when the new CM comes in. I'm sure this will be one of the first things we're going to want to look at is operationally what does this look like how do we w work towards that there's also the unknown about the funds coming from the state so whether those land here what are those for what does that look like how do we operationalize those um, but I think I think putting in place a structure with adopting the budget in June makes a lot of sense to me because um, I really think we are ready and 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 are and we've had success and we've had support. Let's do, let's do this work now. Uh, we're gonna learn a lot in the next six months. We're, it's not gonna be perfect, but I think we have to operationalize this department. So I am supporting, I would be supportive of, of uh, the outline that Laura put together today. And I'll go ahead and um, call on Council Member Cummings, I think was next, and then Council Member Brown. Thank you. 
Mayor, the question I, I was going back through <clears throat> some of the numbers that we had seen earlier, and I just wanted to get some clarification. My understanding is this deputy city manager position, they would continue doing planning at 75% time, homelessness at 25% time, and their salary would be increased by $15,000. And is that annually, or is that, 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 that would be an annual increase, right? That's the annual. And so I guess the, the question I have then is that, you know, there's, and then they, there's also the support of the homeless response manager. There is a temp position that's available as well. And um, I guess the question for me then is who, you know, that 25% time that we'd lose from the planning director's role because it seems like we're taking responsibility away from that individual. We're filling that responsibility with another role, but then we're increasing their salary. And so it's not as if the planning director has to do their job full time and then 25% of another job. And as a result, the compensation is $15,000 more a year. We're actually alleviating some of that person's role so that we can give them more responsibility, but then we're paying them more on top of it. And so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, with that, that reduction in responsibility from the planning director, someone has to pick that work up, especially if we know that there's a ton of projects coming down the line and somebody's going to need to be responsible for whatever workload the will no longer be doing. So I guess I'm trying to also juggle that in my head as to, you know, financially how is this working out? Because it seems like the planning director will have an 100% or the deputy city manager will have an 100% time position that would have been filled at the same level as the planning director, but now we're increasing by $15,000 a year. So, um as far as the responsibilities of a combined planning and community development and homelessness response director position, um, the, the salary related to that is equivalent to the, what we call the larger departments, such as um, public works and water. So the scope of, of, of responsibilities that the combined position would have is not only a specific subject matter in planning and community development, it is also the citywide responsibilities as it relates to homelessness and the coordination across all departments. So, and I think we all know that the, the number that the current person who's doing us the favor of doing this at a, at a very um, small premium is the reality of it is, is the, the number of hours put in um, instead of us having to create an entire position for this um, I believe the city's return on investment for that $15,000 here $15, is remarkable um, um, it, 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 on the organizational chart I showed 25% but I, I think I also commented is he's really at this point working probably one and a half jobs. And, and I don't see that uh, abating anytime soon. Um, what the planning and community development department on the other side of the equation has is um, they are and they have had to rejigger um, responsibilities. Um, it's a good opportunity for succession planning over there. And then um, the team has really stepped up to be able to help support homelessness response in the sense of they're rejiggering things in planning and community development with the assistant director um, stepping into some area as various folks in advanced planning and current planning. So um, the support from the other employees in our organization so that we can um, offer up assistance to our homeless response services has been remarkable. And then I guess the final question, maybe this was mentioned, but is there any offer of pulling the part-time person into full-time? I mean, because even with what was said about the planning director working on homelessness, I would imagine that, you know, anybody who's working on that topic is really doing more probably than, you know, they're at part-time, they're probably doing full-time. They're full-time, they're probably doing full-time and a half. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, and part-time employees in our city, you know, they don't receive benefits, they don't receive retirement. So, you know, um, they're not being compensated anywhere near as well as a 
you know, a regular employee would be. And so I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity to, or if there has been any discussion about trying to pull that individual on at full time, especially since we have a full time position that's vacant. So I'm not comfortable. Uh, I can assure the council that that the last time we had a conversation with our our incumbent that um, we are we have we did continue to take the approach that was supportive of the incumbent. If the council wishes to direct us to establish a full time position with the option of keeping it temporary, if that is the wishes of our incumbent, then I would be more than happy to include that in the budget. Member Brown. Yeah. And and I and I also don't know if um, uh, Lee Murphy had any clarifications on um, benefits as it relates to our part-time employees. I, I just wanted to clarify. I think maybe Councilmember Cummings was probably referring to a temp versus uh, part-time. But our part-time employees do get benefits; they're prorated based on the hours worked, and they do they are eligible for PERS. Um, but what Laura was just describing is interesting. If the incumbent doesn't want to work full time and we, we want to continue to accommodate that individual, there is that uh, what we call an underfill where you could add that as a full time position, uh, determine where your funding is coming from and allow that person to what we call underfill and fill it as a temp. If that, does that, we can, we can do that flexibility. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, so I, um, I just wanted to, I actually rose my hand to respond to Council Member Watkins. Um, thank you for raising the questions around the tenant sanctuary contract. I, um, I, because I do think that um, this resource, this resource for a very little amount of money and if you look at the reporting that they've sent you can see um, you know how much work has been done how many people you get a really good sense of kind of like qualitatively and quantitatively um, who how many people have been served who has been served um, and those reports do come to us I can't mine's archived in my desktop otherwise I'd forward it now, but I want so I wanted to ask um, Nate, perhaps Laura, um, if you have it somewhere, you could just forward that to uh, council members. And um, but I, I also think that um, you know maintaining it in the city managers or city council special projects budget is not necessarily the way we would want to go in the future, um, given that this this year we just we um, it was just a push on the. Uh, funding allocations. It seemed like uh, it would be it would make sense to have that com or to to make that decision in the context of next year's allocations and um, or the the process, the incoming process. And to, we could maybe discuss it at the community programs committee. I do think it's um, it's worth thinking about how where that the overall city um, operations and uh, community support, community program supports. And then I just wanted to do, just follow up on the. I, we've, you know, I didn't mean to bring up, a, <laughs> have a big debate over the one person who's a temporary, um, part-time worker in the in the department. I just, um, I just wanted to kind of following up on um, Council Johnson's point about trying to find some security within that flexibility and fluidity. Um, you know, it just seems like. Uh, somebody who's, who's making a commitment and staying on, you know, keeping, you know, is doing a great job and, and sticking with us um, that looking at, um, you know, benefits and how to make that position um, more stable, even if it continues to be part time. So um, since uh, Lisa Murphy came back on and, and brought that up, I just wanted to mention that too. Uh, and thank you for uh, giving me the time to speak up again, Mayor. Great. Well, thank, every, thank you, everybody. Um, I don't see any more hands up, so I think, um, Laura, you've gotten... One more quick I'm question. I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, well, where in the process will we have another opportunity to maybe 
um, discuss this again. So as far as the, the budget hearing process itself, um, that we received today uh, will go into any adjustments we make to the proposed budget, and then you will see the proposed budget on June 8th um, or the 22nd, depending on timing-wise. As our finance director said yesterday, they are targeted and geared up to deliver that to you all for consideration on the um, in that budget here in that budget adoption process itself uh, you could make um, adjustments and then okay and those would go into the adopted budget so we should expect to see um, some reflection in the june 8th and we can continue there yes great great thank you Thank you so much for that, all that information. Appreciate all that hard work. And the whole city manager's team, I know they work a lot behind the scene. scene. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And I um, want to acknowledge also, um, it is awkward a little bit where we went. Personally, I feel like, um, you know, it's really the job of the department to manage their employees and understand their employees' objectives in their lives. And um, talking about an employee, you know, in this public manner is, is and feels strange to me. So I, I, I think we need to be aware that we're working at a department level and, um, but I appreciate um, people's opinions and thoughts, but it, it, it is a, a fairly awkward situation. And I trust, I trust our department folks to assess those kinds of um, discussions with the employees. It feels like we're a little bit out of our lane right now. <laughs> um, so Laura, thank you very much. Um, I'd like you. to take um, a, about basically like a five minute break. Um, we're starting to run behind now. Um, so uh, we will come back in five minutes. And um, next up will be Tony Condotti, our city attorney, to give a presentation on the city attorney's office budget. And then following that will be Chief Andy Mills uh, giving us a presentation on the police department's budget. I did schedule in a, um, a um, lunch break but we'll lose that as we probably go through the day so just you know in terms of and again remembering that this is an iterative process you'll have plenty of time to ask a lot of questions of department heads i know that everyone will make themselves available to you as you learn about the budget this year this time so you know there's a several several steps in the process and i hope um council members remember that we can we could set up individual meetings, certainly with any department head, and, and look at all the numbers and get into the grainy detail on a lot of things as we move forward. Um, so we'll take, uh, we'll be back at 11:40. Thanks, everyone. Council members could maybe raise or uh, open or um, turn on your video, please. I'd like to get rolling because we're running late. Okay, we've got four members showing, so I'll see, and I'm sure other folks are maybe just, but I'll go ahead and um, have you go ahead and start up. Thanks, Tony. Welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, members of the City Council. It's a pleasure to be here this morning um, to talk about the City Attorney uh, budget. Um, our budget is somewhat in, in that um, we're not a city department, although we function as a city department, uh, but we're a private law firm. Um, that being said, we have served continuously as the city attorney for the city of Santa Cruz for almost 60 years, mm -hmm. since 1963 when Rob appointed city attorney. Um, and during that span, there have been three uh, city attorneys that have served the city. Rod until 1989, John Barrasoni until 2015, and uh, as of April 1st of this year, this marks my uh, beginning of my seventh year as your city attorney. Uh, I've got a slideshow here, and I'm just going to cross my fingers and hope. 
<laughs> it works. So, um, uh, in addition to having uh, served the, last, the past six years as your city attorney, I joined the law firm on September 13th of 1993. So this year will also mark my 28th year working with the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, our office uh, provides legal services to all of the departments that you have heard from, uh, in addition to the city council. Uh, and our, our uh, charge is set forth in the city charge. Uh, we represent and advise the city council and all city boards, commissions, and departments in all matters that pertain to uh, the respective offices. Uh, we represent and appear on behalf of the city and any city official or employee who is named in any legal action or proceeding in which the city is involved uh, official capacity or as a party. Um, we attend all city council meetings and give legal advice and opinions to the council both in a meeting forum uh, by phone or email uh, or in writing whenever requested to do so. And we do that for all other uh, boards and commissions and departments as well. Uh, we're charged by the charter with reviewing all bonds and all contracts made by the city and in approving those as to form in writing. Um, so all the contracts that you see in your uh, uh, agenda packets and, and uh, a vast uh, number of additional contracts that the council doesn't review uh, are all reviewed by the off one. Um, we prepare any and all ordinances or resolutions that are requested of us by the city council or city departments for presentation to the council. Uh, we're also charged with prosecuting on behalf of the people of the state of California, uh, all criminal cases for violations of city charter or city ordinances. We do not do criminal prosecutions uh, under the penal code. Um, some cities do, um, but that is not um, a charge that were assigned by the charter. And then we um, perform any other uh, legal acts or duties related to the office as uh, required by the city council. Uh, we're required to really keep abreast of a vast uh, store of knowledge with respect to laws that, that affect the city. In addition to those that you see on a regular basis involving the Brown Act and Public Records Act and conflict of interest laws and whatnot, uh, we also advise the planning department on zoning and land use laws, um, all departments on real estate matters, regulatory uh, matters like the Clean Water Act, CEQA, uh, envir environmental laws. Uh, we work with public works and public utility issues, um, construction law issues. Elections law is something that uh, is cyclical every two years, but we're uh, very much involved in all matters pertaining to city elections, including um, city-sponsored ballot measures. We deal with a lot of constitutional issues, uh, First Amendment, uh, Fourth Amendment, and eighth, recently the Eighth Amendment uh, prohibition on cruel and unusual punishment. Um, and we try to keep abreast of new legislation and case law that comes uh, down and uh, affects the city. And so um, we're very busy doing that. Um, So uh, I guess as I thought about what was really the most challenging issue or issues that we deal with uh, over the past year, by far the, the biggest is the COVID emergency response was something that um, nobody planned for, but we worked very closely with um, the city manager's office and other city departments in responding to the COVID emergency, including uh, drafting emergency eviction protections, um, uh, preparing um, all of the emergency executive orders 24 to date that have been issued in connection with COVID, um, ratify, you know, preparing those uh, for ratification by the city council and keeping abreast of the various um, regulatory actions, including governor's executive orders, um, CDC guidelines, all those sorts of things that um, have uh, sprung from the COVID emergency. Um, to a lesser extent, but also uh, a very acute situation that we dealt with was the CDU lightning fire, um, working with the uh, fire department and city manager's office on 
uh, executive orders and after the emergency price gouging ordinance that the council adopted in connection with that. Um, homelessness has also been a big part of the work that we've, uh, that we've dealt with over the past year, um, working on preparation of an update to uh, chapter 636 that the council has introduced and will consider at the June 8th uh, meeting um, participating in a, on a weekly basis with uh, campman assessment team and trying to um, work with, with staff on responding to issues surrounding homelessness. Um, and also related litigation in the uh, Santa Cruz Homeless Union matter. Um, we're also managing uh, 31 active litigation matters involving the city. Um, we're not handling all of those. Uh, several are, are being um, assigned to outside counsel, but we oversee outside counsel in um, 11 of those pending matters. I apologize for doing this. Um, so here's the city attorney budget for this year. It's slightly um, reduced from last year, I believe about $50,000. And I, I, I'll call it a status quo budget. What's, what's somewhat unique about the city attorney's office is, and what I think uh, needs to be kept in mind is that the city has a budget to forecast the cost of legal services, but our workload uh, is what dictates the actual cost of providing those services. We're, we're charged with responding to and providing legal advice and services to the city at, on an as requested basis. And so um, so we gear up or ratchet down the, the amount of work that we do uh, based on the demands placed upon us by the city. Uh, and, and hopefully um, the budget meets a target. Uh, we, we try to use city resources as efficiently as possible. And the fact that we have so much institutional memory means that we um, don't spend a lot of time reinventing the wheel. We focus on issues that are emerging and um, and new uh, new issues that crop up, and are able to rely on our store of knowledge to handle most uh, day to day legal issues that come up on an efficient basis. Um, our bigger challenge is keeping abreast of new issues that are constantly uh, coming up, whether it's legislation. Uh, or case law like the Martin versus Boise decision or trends in the legal profession, like trends uh, involving the California Voting Rights Act litigation and, and recent um, trends in uh, litigation under Proposition 218, which is a statewide measure that restricts um, your, your ability to impose fees and charges. Uh, one trend that has held fairly steady uh, it, over the past five years is that the number of hours we devote to general legal services, which are shown here in blue uh, as the base and standard has, has gradually increased uh, over the years. Uh, the litigation portion of the budget and uh, ebbs and flows, but we also have a fairly uh, heavy uh, caseload this past year compared to to years past, and like I said, that doesn't necessarily indicate a trend. It's really more of a the circumstance that we find ourselves in at, at the current at the current uh, point in time. But we have increased our staff. Uh, we are currently employed. Uh, we currently have 18 employees in our office, uh, including 12 very talented lawyers. That um, and, and of the 12. Uh, eight are full-time equivalent, or eight are full-time, and we have about 10 FTE uh, for attorneys. We also have six administrative staff, including two full-time uh, paralegals, a legal assistant, an office manager, uh, a file clerk, and a receptionist. Um, so uh, in about 2018, I started keeping track of um, the general legal services that we provide by department or category as uh, this is the percentage of time that we devote to different um, to, to different categories of legal services, mostly by department. You can see that 17% of our uh, time in, in 2020 uh, or this past fiscal year was um, 
service to the city council. And that includes not only just tasks assigned by the council, but also work in support of uh, individual council member initiative and work that typically arises as a follow-up to uh, council direction given at meetings. Um, I will say that a, a, a significant portion of the time that we spend in uh, service to the city council is right here in council meetings. So that skews the percentages uh, to make it that the council is, you know, using more time. Uh, but and, but and, and it is, but the meeting attendance is a significant portion of that. Um, we also recently uh, started tracking our time just responding to Public Records Act requests. So about 15% of our time is in reviewing records requests that are submitted to the city clerk, to the police department, or to the planning department. Um, and this is the total. Uh, and this represents a very small fraction of the actual number of uh, public records requests that the city receives, most of which are dealt with on a routine basis by city staff without our involvement. These are just the ones that we're asked to review for uh, attorney-client privilege communications or other or other exempt uh, 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 documents or, or records. Um, you can see that about 10% of our uh, time otherwise is uh, for city manager related work, 9.6% uh, for economic development, 9% for water, and about 7% each for public works planning and parks. Um, interestingly, we established an account to track our time on COVID-19, and you can see that it's about 7% of our time this past year was uh, devoted to responding to the COVID-19 emergency. Um, that fortunately is a trend that should steeply decline over the course of the next couple of months. And so uh, hopefully realize some cost savings associated with that. Um, I haven't created a, an track our time uh, dealing with homelessness because it's, it's kind of difficult to, to assign to a particular category. Some of that is working for the city council and developing ordinances and policies. Some of it is dealing with day-to-day -day issues involving uh, the city manager and its encampment uh, or homelessness response uh, activities. Some of that is dealing with parks and rec in dealing with day-to-day -day issues that arise. Uh, and some of it, of course, uh, would be um, working with the police department in uh, its response to homelessness. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm looking at establishing a way to uh, more act or to, to aggregate out the time that we spend in responding to homelessness so that you can see that in future um, budgets as a, as a category, because it really is a significant amount of the time that we, that we do. Um, this past year, the city of Berkeley uh, commissioned the firm Management Partners, who, who has done work for the city council, to do an analysis of city attorney budgets. And so that report came out recently, and um, that, that was interesting. But what you can see here is that um, what you can see here is that uh, of the cities that Berkeley surveyed, our budget is significantly below the next lowest uh, Richmond, uh, uh, dramatically below other cities of more or less comparable size. Um, it's impossible to, to compare apples to apples when you. Um, when you talk about cities, I've worked for several cities over the course of my career, and the amount of legal work that they generate um, is not based on a, it's not on a per capita basis. It really it has more to do with what specific uh, issues the cities have to confront with. And Santa Cruz, um, like Berkeley and Santa Monica, has a lot of the same sorts of problems and issues that arise. Um, we also actually work fairly closely with those cities in. Um, you know, coordinating efforts and discussing responses to problems. And so they're resources to us as uh, we are to them. Um, in summary, 
I would like to say that it continues to be an honor and a privilege for me to serve this community uh, and this council as our city attorney. Um, our office, uh, consisting of 12 lawyers and six staff, uh, all love the city of Santa Cruz and we're proud of the part we play in the community and government and the women and men who um, make up our team uh, are also proud of the role we play in keeping things on track from a legal perspective. And so I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much, Tony. Um, I will look for questions from council at this time. Uh, uh, Council Member Boulder. So one way we can save money is have shorter meetings. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I always say that 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 the makeup of a council is is more like a, a chemical formula, and so you add or subtract uh, one individual, and it will change the, the <laughs> dynamic of the whole city council and. And also over the years, um, the length of meetings tends to run on cycles. Um, it, it changes about every two years. So. That's great. <laughs> okay, any other questions from uh, council members right now? Tony, if uh, folks have individual questions regarding any items, are you okay with them contacting you directly and just working with you on some of those specifics? Yes, by all means. And let me just say that, uh, and I've said this before, um, we are here as a resource to the city council. I, uh, it's very common when someone has a legal question that they'll preface it with an apology for having bothered us during the day. Um, that's what we're here for. So I want to encourage council members to reach out to us when you have legal questions or legal issues that you're interested in pursuing. And of course, if you have any questions about the city attorney's office, or any budgetary uh, issues, um, I'm more than happy to uh, to answer them for you. I have one question for you, Tony, and you might have mentioned this, but I don't believe you did. Are are there any are there any PERS employees in, in related to the city attorney's office? Uh, I know um, some cities do that, and I, I believe maybe there may be a PERS a PERS package that's associated with your position potentially as city attorney? I'm just curious. Yes, that's been part of our contract since the 60s, is that okay. the city attorney is uh, authorized to enroll in CalPERS, and and, okay. um, and so I've been a participant in that program, but, okay. but no one else in our office has. Right, right, okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, okay, well, we will move on to, um, Tony, thank you very much. Um, we'll go ahead and move on to uh, the police department budget. And I will invite Chief Mills. Um, hi, Andy, how are you doing? Good to I'm see doing you. well, thank you, Mayor. We will um, turn it over to you now. Great. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you for allowing us to come and present. Uh, we're extremely proud of the many great accomplishments year that our staff has have done and uh, just really want to be able to present to you uh, what has been done and what we're looking forward to next year. If I can first start off by saying that uh, Patricia Dodge and uh, Bernie Escalante are on with me. Uh, we'll split this up uh, because mostly Patricia carried the heavy water here. Um, Patricia is an absolute ace in the hole. We're so grateful to have her, and she's done uh, just incredible work, and then Bernie oversees the budget in the department. And uh, again, I couldn't be proud of what the two have done to put this together. You know, this has been a pretty incredible year and an intense year for the police department. When COVID-19 first hit, everybody hunkered down their homes except for us and fire and some others. Uh, they went to 12-hour shifts. Uh, we did burglary prevention. They just did a phenomenal job um, bucking up and making sure that our community stayed safe. And uh, we couldn't be uh, happier with the performance of the men and women uh, who police the city. And then, of course, we went to a budget crisis. And part of the budget crisis was reducing uh, some of our workforce, unfortunately. Uh, and you'll, as we get into the budget, you'll see that uh, uh, this most significant portion of our budget 
is non-discretionary and personnel. So there's about 7% that can be looked at. And so we wound up having to lose some personnel, and unfortunately, we lost the Ranger program as a result of that. Uh, then we got, had another round of budget cuts, and uh, the POA was not able to come to agreement with the city, so we uh, froze and, and shifted and lost uh, a, a bunch of other positions that we'll talk about in the budget. Shortly after that, we had the murder of George Floyd, the tragic event that uh, truly shook our nation. As a result of that, there was a lot of civil unrest. And again, our officers uh, stepped up, were very compassionate how we dealt with the, with the civil unrest. And kudos and thank you to the council members who also helped us with that. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a shining example of what Santa Cruz is in the high ideology of what it takes to uh, run a city uh, of this nature. So we really want to thank uh, those who helped in overt ways, but also uh, behind the scenes. I know almost everybody was involved at some level, so thank you. Uh, after civil unrest, and we had, as you, as you know, we had a terror event in our in our area where uh, Sergeant Gutzweiler, Gutzweiler was murdered. Our officers responded to that, and uh, it took a significant uh, amount energy and, uh, and uh, stress uh, on the organization. But yet, in spite of it all, uh, this, this tough year that we faced, uh, we were able to see significant crime reductions and reported crime to the city, both violent and property crime. We solved two cold homicide cases that detectives have been uh, working on for years, and uh, we're really proud of and then uh, proactively, we leaned in and created uh, policy reform that we believe will have a significant um, impact on justice and, and equity and inclusion in our city. And again, thank you to the council uh, and the members of council who really helped with that. Uh, we've increased transparency in neighborhood policing in addition to an overwhelming effort to really make sure that we're as best we can within the law and still being constitutional, dealing with an incredible homeless uh, problem in our city. That unfortunately gets put on the shoulders of the police department when we know that uh, that isn't, those aren't solutions. So when it comes to uh, for the city and revisioning Santa Cruz, uh, we really believe that uh, we, we take this seriously and we do everything we can do to align with the idea, uh, ideas and vision of council in this area. So um, one of the things that we can talk about is that uh, in the next slide is that uh, we are a very lean uh, staffed police department uh, compared to many other cities our side with size with uh, similar uh, demographics and similar things going on. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Deputy Chief Escalante from here and then, uh, and then Patricia will wrap up, and then uh, we'll certainly be happy to enter entertain any questions that you might have concerning uh, the budget. Bernie? All right, thanks, Chief. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Myers and, and Council. Um, so as you can see, here's our, our organizational chart. Um, Pretty, pretty plain and simple, no, no real changes from the uh, previous year or, or years in the past. Um, I will uh, go ahead, next slide, Patricia. Um, so this is what's uh, kind of a, an idea of our, our budgeted positions over the last um, uh, two years, including uh, fiscal year 22, the third year. Uh, you'll see the Ranger program there that the chief talked about uh, that we, we lost. Uh, we were able to hire several of those rangers. Um, unfortunately, a couple of them, there were some other circumstances, uh, whether it was the, the hiring process or the, um, um, the field training program um, that we lost a couple, but we were able to retain most of them. Um, and you'll see that technically on, on paper, we have a, a budget of 101 law enforcement positions. Uh, that does include a seven unfunded positions that was approved, I believe, uh, several years ago to allow us to get ahead of the, the hiring um, practice and, and get ahead of the game when we knew somebody was, was gonna be retiring or, or leaving. Um, 
We had some professional staff there. Uh, those were basically frozen positions for fiscal year 21. Uh, we had one property attendant, uh, a records attendant, uh, our purchasing and payroll clerk, um, and uh, <clears throat> and then we also had a uh, our crime analyst position that was removed from the fiscal year 21 budget. So that's what's on paper there. But uh, the next slide will show uh, kind of the the reality of of our challenges in in 21. Um, as the chief mentioned, we had 10 positions that were frozen, um, sworn positions due to the, um, um, the, the budget cuts. And um, that, that included six sergeant positions and four police officer positions. Um, so in reality, we're budgeted for 101. Uh, seven of those are unfunded, so that puts us at 94. Uh, last year, we were operating at, at 84. Um, so we uh, are hoping to bring some, some good people on board into the organization this, this coming year and get ourselves back up to closer to the 94 positions. Uh, course, you know, you, you have essentially four components to the organization. You have your operations or enforcement, and that includes just patrol, neighborhood policing teams, uh, an alcohol enforcement unit that works closely with ABC and our alcohol establishments, uh, our emergency services unit and canine unit. Uh, I'll show that we increased our canine unit from two canines to four. Uh, one of those additions is a uh, black lab uh, narcotics dog. I don't know if you've had the, the pleasure of, of meeting that, that canine, but it's a great, great resource for us. Um, investigations, most of that is, is all the same. Um, and again, the cold case investigator has really been a joy for us to be able to bring uh, some justice to some families that have been uh, waiting for a long time. Uh, so those are really, really exciting cases for us. Community connections, again, uh, Joyce Blaski has just done a rem remarkable job with connecting us with uh, our entire community and, and through social media, our volunteer program, I think is up over 40 people now. Um, we, we had a seasonal community event. If any of you saw the, uh, the uh, Christmas event down on Church Street where we had a lot of limitations because of COVID, but we still, uh, still made it happen. And that was all due to Joyce's efforts there in our volunteer program. Uh, and records, uh, they do a lot, and um, most of it goes unnoticed. They're behind the scenes processing all the work, all the paperwork, all the PRAs that Tony Condotti talked about. Uh, most of that all falls on that staff there. So uh, again, the chief mentioned, he highlighted some and, and some of these achievements um, that we're, we're proud of. One was the um, <clears throat> The, the rainbow pride patch uh, in support of LGBTQ community, uh, that was a huge hit. We got so many requests from all over the world, really, to, to send them samples of that, uh, a, a huge success. Um, you can't say enough about COVID-19 and, and the challenges around enforcement. Uh, as, as you probably know, the community was very split on the expectations of mass, no mass, uh, tickets, no tickets. Um, it was tough. It was really tough. And we were kind of caught in the middle of a lot of those challenges and different perspectives or opinions uh, and changing directions um, with, with the CDC guidelines. Uh, we made some great strides with the black community in, in the city of Santa Cruz and even beyond. Uh, we, we hosted a, a great event with Santa Cruz Warriors staff, uh, really coming together, working together and trying to move, move policing forward and, and learning from things that we needed to do better. So that was a great event. Um, <clears throat> We had a lot, the chief, chief touched on this, we had a lot of policy changes um, gearing towards, you know, promoting social justice, equity, uh, and, and knowing that we needed to reform the way we did business in, in a lot of um, 
you know, as an example, we banned the predictive policing model that that we were current that we were using at the time, amongst a lot of other policy changes um, throughout the year, and, and we continue to evaluate uh, where we can do better. Um, we all know all of the the multiple protests. Uh, that we were able to really work well with the organizers for the most part and keep things peaceful um, and, and protect the First Amendment rights, but yet also protect uh, life and property during those events. Um, we, we have the transparency portal on our website. We continue to add to that to increase our level of accountability and transparency. Um, also, we added the uh, new police audit um, which is actually, I believe, in the city manager's budget, but uh, it was something we did not have um, the previous year. So we're, we're proud to have that as a great independent review and auditor of our organization. Um, as mentioned, uh, the use of force policy has gone through many changes in, over just the last 12 months. Uh, including increased use of force training and de-escalation training, uh, and, and all of that is now in our policy, required by policy, and uh, we continue to look at ways to get better um, with our training to um, provide our staff with real live scenario situations to try to work through some real um, split-second decisions and, and difficult situations to work through. So um, as mentioned before, the volunteer program uh, and, and you are not alone program uh, just continues to build, continues to uh, improve. Um, they're just such a great group of, of men and women, uh, young and old. Uh, we have all, all different aspects of our community in that group and they're just so helpful to us. Um, we're really grateful to have them. And, and again, Joyce leads that group um, and they, they just add so much to our program or to our organization. The, the canine expansion, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, four canines now um, and we expanded from two to four. And uh, they've been a great asset to us, not only in the city, but as uh, in the county. Um, <clears throat> Chief mentioned the mutual aid response to the uh, murder of Sergeant Gutzweiler. Um, you know, again, very painful, uh, and we continue to assist the sheriff's office. I know they have a, a, an anniversary coming up and we will be assisting them um, to allow them to um, remember during that day. So uh, that'll be a, a tax on our resources, but we're more than happy to offer our services to the sheriff's office. CZU fire, um, gosh, you know, we were there uh, day in and day out. Um, although most of it was up in the county, we were up there 24-7 um, trying to help the sheriff's office and, and let the firefighters do their, do their uh, important work. I, I mentioned the Santa Cruz, the Santa Cops event down on Church Street. Uh, what a great event. Uh, it was very needed at the time. December mid COVID, uh, families really enjoyed that event. So that was that was awesome. Um, and lastly, for me, just again, our accomplishments for the calendar year. Uh, I just want to reiterate that. Oftentimes, uh, our UCR data um, is uh, sometimes it, it gets showcased in a more of a budget year, but this is a calendar year number. Um, we had tremendous reductions in, in violent crime and property crime. Uh, we're seeing a slight increase in property crime now, um, but you know you do see a lot across the, the country of significant increases in, in crime and especially in violent crime right now. So we're really proud of these numbers um, and continue to work to, uh, um, you know, continue to, to work to lower them even if we can. So. Um, that's it for me, and I'll let uh, the professional uh, Patricia talk about our budget. Thanks, Bernie. Um, so we're calling this the new status quo uh, that we're maintaining this upcoming fiscal year, and I say that because we did have a pretty significant decrease last 
fiscal year um, structurally um, that we're hoping to work within. So if we take a look at the last few years of our budget, the line in yellow is what we've been working with in the current fiscal year. This is after the structural decreases that we experienced um, and based on the, the salary freezes that happened during the current fiscal year. So the pink line, the proposed department request for 2022. So when we compare our status quo um, you know, basis, we really want to look at the orange line, which is the original adopted budget for last year, with the current proposed budget in the pink line. So as you can see, no increases um, from last year's original budget to this. We, of course, have some decreases in salary based on the structural cuts. Um, but in terms of services, supplies, other charges, um, that's, that's actually decreased a little bit from last year based on some um, kind of accounting change that were not submitted by our side of the house. So our overall department budget request is just over 28 million. And just to show you the way that those expenses are split out, um, patrol is 56%. Um, the records division is 13%. And one of the reasons why that's a little bit larger than you might expect is that this is where we also budget for our SRC 911 contract. That's a huge portion of that budget in there. In terms of how we're spending our money, uh, like so many other departments, it's really all about personnel costs. So altogether, the personnel-related costs comprise 85% of our budget. Um, Netcom 911 and other regional partners are 8%. So we're really just dealing with 7% that's discretionary. Um, but discretionary funds for us include building maintenance, our sexual assault nurse contribution, MDIC contributions, uh, uniforms, supplies, and vehicles. So that's a pretty tiny slice of our budget that we can work within, um, but not a lot of luxuries built in there. So I'll wrap it up, um, you know, again, we have no big increases, no big asks this year. It's a status quo budget, but we're also happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Patricia and Bernie and Andy um, for, um, yeah, just your year has been something that uh, hopefully we won't have again for a long time. But so we thank you and all your um, teams for all the work they've done for our community this year. Um, I will go ahead and turn it over to council at this point. Councilmember Cummings and then Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for that presentation. This is, it's kind of a more general question um, that relates to PD, but also some other departments. Is there a point when we you know, might be able to consider um, it seems like status quo now is we made cuts last year and we're just carrying things over. And, you know, I know, for example, folks in the community would like to see the Rangers come back at some point, along with many other programs, whether it's arts or, you know, things that are in other departments. And I'm just wondering if there's a point at which we may be able to consider, maybe not this year, but, you know, in the future, um, like what we can bring back and keeping a running list so we can kind of see where, you know, there might be priorities for bringing things back in the future. Maybe I can try to answer that question. I think I think that really is just subject to the, the status of our budget. And I think uh, uh, to be able to be in a position to do that since we're facing a structural deficit would mean if we are successful in obtaining additional revenue sources, which um, there is that possibility. So if a uh, revenue measure is, is placed on the ballot and it's successful, I think the council can be in a position to look at the uh, enhancement or uh, to bring back uh, uh, services and programs. Uh, um, but that, uh, alternatively though, you would have to reduce somewhere else to be able to bring something back. But and then that's obviously at your discretion, but uh, to be in, a, in, you know, in the best position to be able to address this, as well as to bring back uh, uh, 
and to enhance where needed. And consistent with the uh, canceled goals would be uh, uh, really contingent on the success of a, of a revenue measure. Okay, thanks. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patricia. And uh, my question is where in the budget do we, where is budget allocated for training? Where do we see that? Oh, well, so training under the patrol budget. Okay. And, um, how does training um, work with um, partners like the uh, 911, the NETCOM partnership? Um, do they do their own training? Do we, do all the other agencies contribute a certain percentage for training them? I was just curious about that. Yes, I can address that. Um, NETCOM has their own separate budget. It's allocated every year, and I know that uh, the city manager sits on the executive board of NETCOM, and uh, along with other um, elected and appointed uh, positions, and so uh, they have their own training budget, separate and distinct from from what we have. Great, thank you. And um, is that an area that? Um, has increased or stayed the same or has a need for more training? Um, I know in light of this past year, so many things have come up. Um, and, you know, I've certainly been in many conversations with you about that. Is that uh, an area that you feel is, is accurately funded? So I just want to be clear, are you talking about the training budget for NETCOM or our training budget? Your training budget. I can talk a little bit about that historically. Um, last year, we did have a pretty significant cut to our training budget as part of our cost saving strategies. Um, so that was a little bit more doable because people were traveling to trainings and so the costs were, were, were better. Um, this year, we are redistributing some funds back in to our training budget. Um, so, you know, just the, on the status quo basis, we've moved a few things around, and that's one where we wanted to make it a high priority to uh, refund. That being said, um, our total light item for that uh, as a proposed budget is 70000 for the upcoming fiscal year, and we consistently spend every dime of our training budget. So what that tells me, just from a budget side, is that we could certainly use more. <laughs> that um, as we get a lot of new folks coming in and new um, social issues, legal issues entering our door, we um, training super to us, and we can always use uh, more, more support in that area. Just real quickly on that, there's three really areas of training. One is the initial training that they get when they go to the academy. Uh, the okay. second is uh, in-service training that the officers get um, every year that, we, that are mostly state-mandated trainings like use of force, first aid, things. And then when you get promoted to a position or we need to have some specialized training, we send them to post schools elsewhere. Uh, all those are expensive. And uh, that doesn't leave room for the, some of the enhanced training that we as a command staff really need and desire to do. Like, for instance, uh, we try to carve out money to a expert uh, who can talk to our officers about documenting use of force and what that looks like. Uh, in the long run, that helps us uh, articulate those use of force instances better, so we're bringing uh, that person in here in the near future. We also want to be able to do uh, training that is part of the mandate of the policy changes, such as uh, improved diversity and equity training and inclusion training for the department the rest of the city. So those are all really important. And uh, what we do now is Bernie and I go hat, hat in hand to Patricia and say, can you carve out some money for us to get this done somewhere else in the budget? And, uh, and she's been a magician up to this point, but uh, <laughs> certainly uh, extra funding for those specialized trainings uh, would, would be very helpful uh, to the department. 
Thank you. That was it for my questions. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Are there any other council members with questions for our police chief and his team? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Um, great. Well, as as I've stated before, I'm sure um, follow up is totally appreciated with any and all folks from the department. So. Um, so we will go ahead and take a break um, for lunch. Uh, why don't we, we've got um, one, two, three, four more presentations it looks like. So um, why don't we go ahead and come back at 1.15. Um, I also, before we break, um, just want to take a moment of silence. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's been reading the paper today, but uh, there were eight people killed in the city of San Jose this morning at a shooting incident um, at the Transit Authority. And uh, as a city that has a lot of folks whose lives, you know, interaction with the city of Santa Cruz and um, just want to take a moment to recognize the loss of those folks before we break. Thank you, and we'll see everyone back here at uh, one fifteen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming back. Okay. Okay, we will go ahead and continue with our, for the public, uh, we are today, our agenda is focused entirely on presentations from each of our um, departments regarding their department's budgets. And um, this afternoon, we will be hearing from our fire chief on the fire department's budget, our public works director on the public works budget, our on parks and rec budget, and then our city manager will uh, end the day with uh, a presentation on our capital improvement program. Um, so I want to also want to just thank uh, the council members. I know two days of full day meetings is a lot to ask for all of you, and so I just want to recognize you spending all this time and learning directly from the departments, um, both their achievements and their objectives for next year, as well as reviewing their budgets. So. Thanks for putting in the time. Jason Heydrich, our fire chief, is up next. Welcome, Jason. Mayor, City Council, Jason Heydrich, your fire chief. Uh, thank you for uh, having me today. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here and we'll get going. Um, all right. So with me today, um, can you see this by the way? Yes, we can. All right. So with me today, I have Rob Odie, Division Chief, as well as Paul Horvat, our OES Manager, and they're going to uh, fill in some of the blanks here. Um, so for our budget, um, we represent about 20, a little over 20 million uh, out of the general fund for our expenditures. However, that's reduced um, through a number of different um, uh, contracts that we have uh, and represents uh, about $16 million uh, out of the general fund. And that's due to um, increased revenue contract for services through UCSC, through Capitola for lifeguard contract services, as well as some OES reimbursement. Um, and it's, it's basically a status quo uh, expenditure when you compare it to our 2020 actuals uh, for, um, it's a little over 1% increase from that. Uh, it's an increase from last budget year just because of the budget reductions and the 10% um, uh, furlough and uh, bargaining groups and whatnot. Um, so it's basically a, a status quo budget for us going forward. Here you have our organizational chart. Um, and what's important to look at this is that almost 85% of our budget and 85% of our personnel 
are very much in line with response. We're very much an operational response-based organization. Um, the other difference that we have compared to other uh, departments is that we are a for our operation. Uh, there's never a time, it uh, doesn't matter if it's daytime, nighttime, holiday, uh, it, you know, we always are on duty just because of the nature of um, our response. And so we, we do have uh, administrative functions, um, and then we are broken into three shifts, A, B, and C. And then those are further broken down within our stations. We also have our marine safety um, component, uh, which is seasonal, uh, where we ramp up during the summer. However, it is a year-round presence and a year-round need. And then we have a battalion chief of training that uh, we are going to be filling here um, after the, uh, the budget reductions uh, that we were in underneath the last year. So really, you know, 85% of our budget, 85% of our personnel are operationally based. They, uh, they respond, and, and that's what we do. So our core services, um, fire, rescue, medical, that is what we do. And um, this year has been no different. And I would say that this year is our office. Um, this is what we do on a daily, nightly basis. And if you can look at those ladders that are perched up against that building, that's because we have people inside that building that you. Um, that is their working environment. And, you know, we're no different than anyone else in the city as far as the impacts of COVID, um, but we still had to show up. And, you know, COVID is spread by being in an enclosed space uh, for a prolonged period of time with a number of people. And that describes a firehouse. And so we really had to work hard this year to make sure that we were able to maintain that response for fire, uh, rescue, and medical while protecting our folks. And uh, we've done a really good job, but it's been a really what we also do within our core services is our Office of Emergency Response or Services and then prevention. Um, if we can prevent this call from happening, that's a really good day, um, but we will respond to it. And so our prevention department, our OES department, as well as our um, response folks have been working really hard. And it fits within our three pillars that we have within our department, which are our personnel, our response, and our community. And they're all interconnected. Can't do our job without people. Um, you know, our response is what we do for our community and then also trying to prepare our community to prevent these things from happening. This is um, a little bit, I want to show about some of our call volume. In 2000, we had a little over 4,000 emergency responses. And you fast forward to 2020 and uh, we had uh, about 7,700 calls. And these are for emergency responses. These aren't for all the other services that we do. We had a little dip um, in the number of calls um, because of COVID, but they didn't go away and we're expected to eclipse that this year. Um, so, you know, when you look back on the organizational chart that I showed you, we have not manifestly changed who we have available to respond to calls, but the number of of calls that we respond to has gone up. Um, and that's going to be a growing issue as we go forward. Um, and again, COVID uh, has impacted all of us. And, uh, you know, the men and women of this department have done a really good job of being resilient um, and moving forward with minimizing the impacts to themselves, as well as protecting the community, which is on a daily and nightly basis. Our Marine Safety Division, is comprised of a couple different uh, things. It's the seasonal lifeguard staff that you think of um, and the towers, but it's also the year round response for aquatic emergencies. Um, and they happen uh, in all sorts of different locations. But West Cliff is probably one of the most technically challenging uh, water rescue places you can have. It's exposed to large swell and it's really easy to get to for a lot of people. You don't have to hike there. Um, and so uh, again, the men and women um, of that division are there on a daily, nightly basis. Um, these photos are here because they're taken during the day, but um, they are also doing this at night. They just don't show up in photos that well. Um, but again, when we get back to that prevention mode, those preventative contacts, when people come to our city and they come to Main Beach, and over a half a million people came last year, and I expect that number to probably double this year. Um, those preventative contacts, that educational contacts about telling people uh, what they can do safely and for dangers that they may not be aware of, that's really a significant value uh, to our visitors and to the people who live here. And these lifeguards uh, in the Marine Safety Division also support the Junior Lifeguard Program, and we spoke about it yesterday as far as the value of that. Um, number of rescues, and a lot of them uh, last year were on the 4th of July, 
Um, I'm expecting a really large beach presence this year on the 4th of July, just because it's um, after, or it's on, a, it's on a weekend this year, it's not midweek. Um, and if the weather's uh, anything like it is going to be this week, and we expect to be busy, but again, those men and women will be there. I'm gonna turn it over to Paul Horvath for the next slide. He's gonna responses this year for OES. All right, thank you, Chief. Sorry. Actually, hold on. I, I got my slides mixed up there, I'm sorry. Um, I'm gonna talk about state OES just a little bit. Um, this, you know, CZU was a huge impact for our city this year. Um, but within the state system for OES, that system that responded locally and supported our efforts over you know, the, the, the weeks that that event was going on is the same one that we respond to statewide. We had over 45 requests for uh, personnel or equipment from our department, and some of those requests ranged from two days to 30 days where we had people out working, um, and a lot of them were in our backyard uh, for the CPU fire. Um, but as part of that, the city was reimbursed over you know, $1.8 million, which exceeds the personnel costs that are associated with it. Um, I support it because it's something that we tapped into this year um, as far as CZU and needing those resources to come into our community. But it's also training and experience that our personnel gain when they go out and engage in that. They bring that to their daily uh, service response here within the city. Uh, a large scale incident like that uh, really is over how to approach that problem in a systematic way and have the best positive outcome that you can. And I'll also say that this state OES response Unfortunately, unfortunately, I believe is part, is part of our new reality as far as climate change, wildland response, disaster response. And so we're, we're a participant in that, we're a recipient of that, and uh, I think that that's something that we can see more of as we go forward. Um, but that response does come with a reimbursement from the state. And I'll turn it over to Paul Horvath to talk about our internal city OES response. All right, thank you, Chief. Um, good afternoon, uh, City Council. Uh, once again, my name is Paul Horvath, and I wanna just spend a few minutes and talk a little bit about uh, the city's Office of Emergency Services while the state does, the city has one as well. Um, and what we do is we manage uh, emergencies through our Emergency Operations Center. Uh, once again, the EOC is a place where uh, we gather um, all uh, city emergency managers, uh, across departments as well as our community partners so that um, effectively and quickly um, so that we can focus our uh, efforts on protecting lives, property, and the environment. Um, our emergency operations center is at the 911 dispatch center where we rent space there and we have all our equipment um, so that we can operate effectively. Um, just to kind of highlight the importance of the uh, OES function, um, especially over the last four years within the city, at our EOC numerous times for the 2017 winter storms um, that you all remember, where we had about 3.5 million in uh, infrastructure damage uh, to the city, mostly uh, water uh, supply lines from the water department. Um, we've also been managing the COVID-19 emergency over the last uh, almost year and a half where we have uh, close to uh, $770,000 in FEMA reimbursement there. Um, that's been kind of a unique uh, EOC activation where we've done that virtually. Um, and we also manage the uh, CZU fire and, and uh, you know, try to reduce the impacts that it would have on the city through conducting vegetation management uh, um, throughout the uh, wildland urban interface where the forest meets the city, as well as activating our volunteer teams to go through uh, and knock on doors with neighbors to help them harden their homes um, in preparation uh, if the fire had reached the city. Unfortunately, it didn't. Um, so those are the things that we do in the EOC and, and just kind of highlighting the importance um, of those things. Um, these three emergencies that I mentioned here over the last four years are the biggest emergencies in modern times um, outside of the Loma Prieta earthquake. So, you know, we can kind of see this trend on how uh, important OES has been uh, to the city. In terms of protecting the city, its residents, its infrastructure, as well as our city employees. Um, so we're looking to have all of our uh, COVID-19 EOC planning activities, hopefully wrapping up soon as, as we see ourselves uh, uh, moving more in line with uh, 
um, what the state is uh, setting up for June 15th, where we'll go back to normal operations. Um, however, we still are in uh, the yellow tail tier. Um, so we're gonna continue to develop our incident action plans, which kind of outline what the city is doing and what the city is going to do in terms of uh, being safe uh, with COVID-19 for our employees, for, for visitors within the city, um, as well as contractors who visit the city. And we, we follow those guidelines closely with the CDC, uh, Cal OSHA and local public health. Um, part of uh, what we're doing, as I mentioned earlier, is we're tracking all of the costs and we're gonna continue to track them for the FEMA reimbursement. Most of the costs um, for the city have been uh, for personal protective equipment, masks, um, as well as uh, appropriate signage and keeping city facilities clean um, as well. Um, in addition to the OES functions, uh, just managing the uh, budget for the fire department and uh, other administrative tasks in alignment with the um, personable management analyst uh, role. Um, in addition, um, you know, as we uh, all are doing is helping out with the, you know, homelessness issues at encampments as it, as it impacts uh, the fire department um, and the city manager's office. Um, so that is all I have for you today and uh, for uh, allowing me to present. Thank you, Paul. So next I'm gonna to go to um, Rob, uh, Rob Odie, who's our division chief uh, fire marshal, and he's gonna discuss some of the efforts that we've made within the prevention world um, for trying to limit some of the impacts of uh, what we've seen. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Paul, thanks for having me uh, and giving me the opportunity to speak on uh, the fire prevention efforts this last year. Um, so on this slide, you can obviously see a lot of the high points, uh, some of the stats, 216 fires that include you know, structure fires, wildland, others, that, that could be you know, vehicle fires, trash fires, um, some that are difficult to classify. Um, some big um, figures to focus on are our fire investigations. We had 150, that's a significant increase from years past, partly due to, um, we have increased um, you know, investigators on the shift level. So we have shift investigators that are on the fire engines as well as on-call staff um, within the Fire Prevention Bureau that includes myself, Deputy Fire Marshal and an inspector. We're also part of the, uh, and have headed the uh, Santa Cruz County Fire Investigation Task Force, which has led us to other parts of the county to assist in this important task, uh, as well as um, participation in a tri-county fire investigation group. Um, that it provides us opportunities to train, gain more exposure, and of course, aid our partners in investigation. Uh, last year, a little dip in our fire and life safety inspections, part, well, primarily due to the COVID-19 impact on um, construction and businesses being open. Um, but as you can see, thus far, just this year, we're you know we're going to eclipse that number of last year. We have 136 so far in 2021. Um, and in addition to those life safety inspections, some other um, notable figures are um, with the outdoor expansion of businesses and restaurants in uh, throughout the city. We've done over, you know, less, uh, outdoor expansion inspections, and they continue to count um, to continue to grow. Those numbers do. Um, a lot of pl uh, plan and project reviews because, as we all know, we have uh, multiple projects coming down the pipe um, for development. Uh, 347 construction inspections. Um, consultations are uh, plentiful. Um, and these also include many um, uh, consultations with businesses, restaurants alike, um, for the outdoor expansion program that we've assisted uh, economic development with. Um, and then public education and outreach, you know, 5,000 plus, that's a big figure. That was primarily due to um, a lot of the outreach. I believe it was 4,000 4, plus. Um, during the CZU uh, complex fires where, uh, as Paul noted, we had members of CERT, the P police department volunteers and lifeguard staff, as well as staff from fire admin, went out and making contact with residents throughout our wildland urban interface. And that is why you have that map in front of you, which is our GIS map that denotes those areas. And essentially um, those groups of volunteers, and that also included retirees that um, felt it important to come back and assist their brothers and sisters in arms um, to get out and spread the word of home hardening and vegetation and defensible space in these areas. And they knocked on every door that you see in those uh, highlighted areas 
Um, if they didn't talk to residents, they left them with materials on emergency preparedness, vegetation management, and home hardening. Um, as you can see in the bottom there, you know, with some of the, the new things that we've done to sort of address um, our, our inspections is we've in, in implemented an engine company inspection program and uh, temp inspectors that have come back to help us um, get out and make all the life safety inspections that we need to, to do to keep our community safe. And so um, it's, it's been a great uh, addition to our existing program. Next slide. Um, in addition to um, our typical duties, some of our highlights for the year, obviously I mentioned um, some of them. We did some Firewise outreach. We have some uh, um, existing Firewise neighborhood groups. One exists in the Prospect Heights neighborhood, and we had one that was recently created in the Highland area. Um, both have been tremendous partners with a whole lot of motivation. And helps us get the word out, um, the importance of defensible space and home hardening in these areas. And with those groups, we were able to uh, participate in the 2021 Wildfire Prevention Day event that was up on uh, off of High Street um, with the Highland Firewise group. That was in May 1st. Um, in conjunction with these groups, we do a whole host of home hardening and vegetation management consults. Um, because of COVID, we haven't been able to host any in person, but um, myself and my staff have gone out to homeowners associations and neighborhood groups, firewise groups, um, and had these important conversations with the homeowners and how they can better prepare um, for the uh, and a, a wildfire event. Um, we've also um, taken the emergency preparedness flyer, which you see on that slide. We've updated it with uh, updated information, as well as in the process of um, translating that into Spanish will be available. It is available in English on our website. Um, we'll have it once it's translated in Spanish. And of course, we'll have physical flyers to pass out at any events or to any of the outreach that we conduct within the city. Uh, as I mentioned, we did a tremendous amount of outreach, 4,000 plus with those residents in our um, wildland urban interface, um, have done a tremendous amount of work at that same time during the CZ, where myself and my staff went out and assisted the water department uh, in uh, providing defensible space and hardening of all the city infrastructure, primarily water assets, water tanks, pump stations, um, in and around Loch Lomond itself, and then of course NETCOM in De La Viega. And then we continue our uh, efforts in vegetation management. It's an ongoing process. Uh, you can see here's a, a project that we did, we're just finished in Lower De La Viega, about seven acres, where we're clearing uh, fire access roads, creating fire breaks to slow the spread when an event occurs, and of course, uh, clearing ladder fuels to prevent the rapid spread. Um, so far this year, we did the seven um, acres in Lower De La Viega. We did another about two acres on the trail in Pogonip, and uh, we are in the process of starting a project in Arroyo Seco to treat 26 acres um, next week. Um, and then, of course, continue about 10 to 20 acres in Upper De La Viega, again, all with improving access for our firefighters, creating fire breaks, and removing dead or dying fuel. So a continuing process requires a lot of time and energy. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. So, you know, thinking back over this year, uh, there's been a lot of impactful moments. And um, one of the things that I'm most proud of was our response to CZU fire as a whole. Uh, we had people on the front lines who were actively putting out fire, but collectively here within the city, the coordination between all the departments um, and I mean, reaching out to IT, having HR, uh, the HR director serving the EOC, public works, economic development, uh, city manager's office, city attorney's office, um, parks and rec. Um, it was a really big effort for a very impactful uh, event that was coming into our city. Um, and like I was talking about, we went out and knocked on doors and we connected with people in our community and gave them the tools to be prepared. Uh, and that's, um, that was a collaborative effort between all of our suppression folks, our admin folks, uh, he alluded to it. We had retirees who came back not only for the emergency operations center, but also out in the field. Uh, we had our volunteers from Santa Cruz PD. We had our volunteers from CERT um, serving in, in functions that they normally don't do. 
Um, and, and that outreach, um, in my mind, really encapsulates the entirety of what we do as a department. We had the response and the suppression efforts, we had the prevention efforts, we had the education efforts, we had the coordination efforts within our EOC. Um, and this was against the backdrop of COVID uh, that was still occurring. Um, and so I'm, I'm optimistic that uh, we won't have another event like this uh, this year. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful for that, but I do know that we are better prepared and more resilient to minimize those impacts if they do happen. And it's an ongoing effort uh, within our department. Um, and with that, that concludes our presentation and um, I'm available for questions uh, uh, if you have some. Excuse me, thank, thank you, Chief. Um, great presentation. Um, I am happy to have um, council members with questions. Uh, I've got council member Golder. Um, thank you guys for everything you did do this year. It was mind blowing when you took us up on um, what all you did to help secure the water infrastructure and keep our city safe during those horrific fires. And I have a question um, about the OES reimbursement. Um, and so you mentioned that the money that you get back from the state covers the costs. Are those costs the overtime? Is that what you're, you're talking about? Yeah, so the, the way the system works um, is that when we send personnel out, the, there's an overtime cost for that. Um, mm -hmm. And in essence, the state is renting um, our personnel for their experience, for their ability, for their certifications, as well as for the equipment. And so uh, that is for uh, a big, big chunk of our overtime budget that is reimbursed from the state response. Um, and it, it, there's money in addition to that that comes back to the city. So it's above and beyond our personnel costs uh, for what the city receives. And so that money goes back to the fire department or back to the general fund, the extra? Um, there's a portion of it that we're, um, and if, if, if uh, Kim is, uh, is online where we are using some of that money to uh, for long-term capital for equipment, um, but it does go back into the general fund, no different any other department um, that operates within uh, the city. Thank you. Is that right, Kim? Uh, yes, it is right. Um, I don't know if you recall, we made an adjustment at mid-year to adjust fire overtime and um, increase the revenue to reflect the payment. I have, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chief Iduk. Um, so in regards to equipment, you had, you just now mentioned um, some of it goes back into equipment, some into the general fund. And um, in your, your budget, for equipment, um, what are we looking at? I know there have been talks in, uh, in previous conversations regarding equipment for the fire department, new truck, a new engine. Um, is that incorporated into this budget? Um, a portion of it is, and uh, when we have the CIP conversation here um, after all the presentations, uh, that is uh, slated to be um, replaced this year. Okay. Um, it's, and then we're also looking at replacing a type one engine. Um, our oldest engine, which is in reserve status right now, is a 1999 engine. Um, if you think about the technology uh, that's happened in the last few decades, um, we are due for replacing those on a regular basis. Uh, and the goal is to not have a one-time cost where we replace all of them at the same time, but we use them uh, and cycle them through so they become frontline engines. Mm -hmm. And then when they're older, they become reserve engines. Um, the other challenge for us, um, it's not just a one-for-one. One. Um, if I have one engine in my fire station and it gets a flat tire, I need another engine because we have time-dependent problems. And so we have to always be able to respond, and that's part of it you know, response to the community that uh, we are available, we are equipped, um, and you know, the right people at the right time with the right equipment to have the right outcome. Yep, thank you so much. Um, Chief, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, 
sort of the opportunity that the state, you know, is kind of presenting with a lot of money for sort of fire prevention and fire planning, um, you know, big dollar amounts like $20 million. And then also, um, as council members are aware, we have a growing interest in um, firewise neighborhoods, which is a really great thing, you know, to have people really trying to plan for one of these events within their neighborhoods. Um, and I know probably what makes sense, what looks like a lot of money is that quite hard to obtain and then distribute, especially down to sort of like a neighborhood group like that. And I'm just wondering if you could just kind of maybe give a little bit of a big picture of how do we, how do we as council members and as, a, as the city sort of help these folks, um, these firewise communities that are forming, what's the best place for us to sort of uh, support them and uh, we also, you know, support you, your department, if this is going to be kind of a growing, kind of a growing effort on on the, the behalf of, you know, neighborhoods in, in town. If you could just maybe a couple minutes on that. I know yeah. you spoke, but. So um, I view this, it, it's not a singular action or um, it, it's multiple actions and it's collaboration. So I view the fire uh, neighborhood groups as being uh, similar to a neighborhood watch for crime. Firewise neighborhood groups are preventative actions for those neighborhoods. What actions they can take to prepare uh, their individual homes, their neighborhood, and then you know that, that has that kind of ripple effect as far as uh, minimizing those impacts. That's something that we started years ago. We actually had the first firewise uh, certified Firewise group in Santa Cruz County was formed in the city of Santa Cruz and Prospect Heights. Uh, Abby Young called in yesterday to voice her support for the, the grant for the work that's being done. So that's one, one effort, and that's the, the individual neighborhood, the efforts that they can take, and that's really about that constant steady work to prepare themselves to have a plan and to minimize the impact of the fire if it happens. On a larger scale, and you alluded to it for the governor, um, for funding for vegetation management or those proactive um, efforts. Um, it's a huge amount of money, but it gets filtered through all the individual counties to the individual cities, down to the individual neighborhoods, if it's available. Uh, we are looking into that. Um, uh, the, the water director, Rosemary Menard, myself wrote a letter in support of an assembly bill coming forward that's for fire prevention, vegetation management, and protecting our watershed, which is a critical, critical thing for our city. So the grant that we accepted uh, for the work is just one action that we are taking in that. Um, they are competitive, but I will say that the work that um, Chief Odie has done has mapped out all of our uh, wildland urban interface areas within the city, has mapped out the ongoing vegetation management that we need to do both in linear feet and acreage. And, um, and so we, we were successful in getting that grant with Tiffany Wise West, Dr. West, um, because we had that already identified. Uh, we have the area, um, and so we're able to give that in a, in a package. And so we are pursuing those grants as they come up, um, and we are ongoing in those efforts uh, you know, to minimize those impacts within the city-owned open spaces. What we need for, from our neighborhoods is they need to do the work on their own house and their own neighborhoods. Um, it's not city-owned, and we are here to provide that information and uh, guidance. Um, and you can do it just because you have a fire doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to have that impact in your neighborhood, but you have to do the work and it has to be on a regular basis. So we are trying to manage our open spaces that we own that surround the city and protect our infrastructure. And uh, we are advocating for our neighborhoods to do the same uh, in, in literally their backyard. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. Any other questions from council members on fire department? Not seeing any. Thank you, Chief. Yep. We appreciate it. Next up, we will have Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works, to give a presentation on the Public Works budget. Good afternoon, um, Madam Mayor and Vice Mayor, member for the Council. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and present the Public Works budget. All right. Can you see the presentation? Yes, we can. Looks good. 
Okay, great. So, um, let me go ahead, let's do this. So the agenda this afternoon uh, is the department overview with our organization and FTEs and their core services, then the department achievements, and finally, uh, the department FY22 budget with overview and changes. So public works, this department, most diverse um, with mission is based on health and safety and quality of life. Uh, we have seven divisions. Uh, our largest division is resource recovery with almost uh, 92 FTEs uh, since we collect and process uh, all the waste and recycling. Uh, our second largest is wastewater, 50, almost 56 FTEs. Parking, is that we broke that out as a new division this year. Uh, they're up to almost 48 FTEs. So they're, they uh, have a lot of facilities, as you'll see, and, and, and efforts. Operations is 32 FTEs, engineering, 19 FTEs, and then traffic engineering, an F of six FTEs. So the core services for resource recovery, um, We've broken them into three different uh, sections, collections, resource recovery, and waste reduction. The collections group provides uh, resource recycling green waste collections to residents and businesses, provides food waste collection to commercial kitchens, and we will be expanding that uh, with a pilot to households, as well as hopefully expanding to all households and start looking at 2022 or 2023. Uh, we'll roll that out in a small group and kind of work out the kinks before we roll it out citywide. We also provide street sweeping and we removed nearly 800 tons of debris last. We're also piloting a mandatory parking restrictions on your sweep days. So you wouldn't be able to park on your section of your street for a limited amount of time, one to two hours. So we can come in and get curb, uh, curb swept and uh, we'll pilot that again in a couple of areas, work out the, the kinks on that. Um, but we have, we'll start with a volunteer area and could learn from that and then roll that out. We also respond to illegal dumping, camp cleanup support, and hypodermic needle um, collection and reporting. A resource recovery group, uh, the processing, really process, market, and sell all of our recyclables. Um, the facility works with the county to accept household hazardous waste. We divert construction material from the landfill and repurpose that material as uh, we're just offering redwood from lumber that we've collected, um, but also we'll grind up concrete and uh, offer a base rock. Resource recovery also manages the airspace uh, in the landfill to ensure the largest, uh, uh, most efficient use of the landfill cell that we develop. Um, we historically they used to use fill material to cover the the refuse, and that took up a lot of valuable airspace. We cover it with tarps, and we'll pull that off, and then we'll manage that. Um, only put refuse into the into the cell, so we extend the life of the cell as long as we can. Current life of the landfill is over 50 years, and when I got here, there was 24 years of, re of life remaining in our landfill. So they've done a great they've done a great job of managing that. And we also extract the methane from the landfill to produce PAP and reduce our greenhouse gases. Under the waste reduction group, uh, we promote the reduction of waste to meet city and state goals and mandates uh, through public interest, uh, public information, business and school outreach, educational programs, special events. We educate about source reduction, re reuse, recycling, What's wish cycling, where you throw things in your in your blue can and hope it can be recycled? Uh, composting and pollution prevention. They also lead policy development in the city through ordinance such as restaurant to go, food packaging, and we provide waste reduction audits to the city green and city green business um, facility, uh, the certification program. We go to the next. Uh, wastewater Division Core Services, um, they're also divided into three groups, Collection, Treatment, and Environmental Compliance and Lab. Uh, our collections 
maintain over 150 miles of underground uh, sewer pipes and 18 lift stations. We replace up to a mile of pipe every year. We clean and maintain the storm drain network and provide flood control support, respond to sewer overflows, and maintain leachate collection system from the resource recovery facility to take the leachate to the wastewater treatment facility to, pre to treat it. At the treatment facility, core mission includes treating wastewater through an all natural biological process, treating over 7 million gallons a day. Uh, we're a regional facility with 50% of our customers located outside the city. We also generate in excess of 70% of our energy that's used on site to digest your gas, cogen, and solar sa saving on solar processing, saving customers over $700,000 a year. We're a key partner in the Pure Water Soquel project to pr protect an important county water supply from saltwater intrusion. We use treated water inside our facilities for process water, say, and we produce biosolids for reuse on non-food-based crops. We also educate our customers about our service through outreach and facility tours, and we hope to restart those soon. Uh, the third group is uh, environmental compliance in our laboratory, and we provide inspection and monitoring and guide to local businesses on discharges, safe discharges to their sewer system. We'll issue discharge permits to our industrial dischargers and list liquid workers. We work to eliminate violations, but can levy citations and fines if it's required to change the behavior. The laboratory provides a wide array of analytical and technical sampling and monitoring of the wastewater treatment process and supports the city's stormwater, watershed, and landfill program. We also provided some COVID testing uh, sampling and testing during the COVID outbreak to kind of track um, the extent of the virus. Uh, the lab provides mandated monitoring of our nearshore bacteria and other indicators of environmental health. And we provide analytical support to other city departments in the county. The core services for our parking division, um, we manage four parking structures, 25 parking lots, 100 meter spaces. The parking on the wharf also processes over 500,000 transactions per year. They manage the bike locker program, the revenue collection and parking enforcement, the citation review and collection. A parking programs group manage the residential permit programs, the downtown permit programs, the validation program, wharfs, local program, special events and warrior game parking, park cards, park mobile, and in, uh, EV parking and charging systems. Um, and parking maintenance, they're also responsible for the downtown cleaning, uh, including parking, park Civic Avenue seat, streetscapes, cleaning and trash removal, cleaning and maintaining public restrooms, maintaining the parking pay machines and equipment, power washing the sidewalks and, and keeping the area clean, trash pickup, meter repair, and and graffiti removal. Um, some of the things with parking also um, that we saw um, of, of our, all of our budgets, parking was probably the most impacted with COVID. Um, they have a, rev a strong revenue base, but it's based on demand. And at the end of FY20 and through FY21, we saw heavy impacts to parking revenue. Um, our week over week revenue losses were 60 to 70 percent of on and from on street meters, surface lots, and garages. Um, despite the challenges, the impact to staff levels, parking service continued to provide vital services, uh, street sweeping, bathroom cleaning, other parking downtown, and other parts of the city with little disruption. Uh, with indications of a strong return to economic activity this coming summer, we're projecting a return to FY22 revenue to pre-COVID-19 uh, levels. And this, along with new revenue sources, which you approved with the beach meter increases and parking and loop fees, we're anticipating a strong parking revenues. Uh, our operations division, um, this is broken also into three groups, our streets group. Um, the small streets and traffic team about just 
11 field positions responsible for vast majority diverse array of critical and res responsibilities including sidewalk, curb, gutter, catch basin, installation, repair, replacing and repairing street lights, uh, managing the vegetation along our sidewalk, roadways, bike lanes, and other areas uh, to enhance transportation safety, um, vegetation, uh, sediment, debris removal from our creeks, rivers, and maintain flood control, assisting police and parks departments on encampment debris removal, providing critical project coordination and logistical support to our uh, city projects, uh, repairing, replacing, installing street, street signs, fencing, guardrails, and producing signage in-house for other city departments. Uh, painting and including street markings, curbs, striping, crosswalks, critical logistical supports for special events and here by setting up barriers for outside, outside dining in our downtown. The mechanical maintenance group, a team of seven mechanics and one accounting assistant, provide maintenance of the city's fleet, including police and refuse vehicles and heavy equipment. They administer city's fleet including vehicle replacement process, working to replace our vehicles with electric alternatives or alternative fuel vehicles whenever possible, including a grant for an electric refuse truck and providing 24 hour fueling services. Uh, facilities and maintenance and energy projects, a uh, very small team of four provide routine maintenance and repairs for 28 city owned facilities. They provide 24 hour response for facility emergency provide certain janitorial and sanitation services at, at our facilities, provide safety inspections of all facilities, and our energy project coordinator leads city's critical energy efficiency programs, retrofitting projects as well as overseeing solar photovoltaic operation, applies for funding, rebates, opportunities to assist with meeting city's 2030 climate action goals. We've also established a charging network for future electric vehicles at the city's club yard. Our engineering division, core services, uh, is divided into engineering, uh, funding, and capital investment program. Our engineering group designs, implements capital projects, including repairs, improvements, projects and programs associated with multimodal transportation, street design, reconstruction, slope stability, utility undergrounding, sanitary sewer collection and treatment, stormwater collection, refuse recycling and facility, city facility improvements. Engineering develops um, project concepts. They secure grant for funding for projects. They also review and do inspection of development projects. They issue permits such as street opening permits, utility installation, concrete work. And they, they create planning environmental documents, including sequence certifications, traffic input fee studies, fit plans, utility and facility plans, et cetera. They develop and implement the city stormwater, wastewater, and refuse plans and programs in compliance with state and federal mandates. And the funding section really Engineering really manages administration's administration of and utilization of key funding sources, which pay for a majority of the repairs in our general fund, and especially roads and all and storm drains, and then manage also uh, sewer and refuse facilities. Gas tax SB one, Measure D, Measure H, funding pay for street improvement projects and raising the city pavement condition index trying to reach our goal of 70 out of a, a possibility of 100. Making progress, but we're not quite there yet. Measure E also provides funding for projects and programs intended to keep our rivers and beaches clean. And engineering does an excellent job of seeking grant funding for projects to supplement the city's funding. Under the capital investment program, engineering develops and implements the city's five-year capital investment plan Engineering assists other departments with implementation of their capital projects. We've had two major long-term projects that engineering is working on now is the improvements to the intersection of Highway 1 and 9 and the Murray Street Bridge seismic improvement project. 
As you saw yesterday, the city faces a shortfall in long-term unfunded list of capital projects in excess of 300 million. And a significant portion of those are transportation projects, and those will be discussed in the capital in investment program section. Um, Port Services, a transportation engineering division. Um, there are also three groups, the engineering section, the transportation planning, and the education and outreach. Um, transportation engineering, they design capital improvement projects for the city's parking systems, uh, respond to citizen requests and hazard notifications to improve and maintain city's transportation system, analyze traffic patterns, issues, solutions, including traffic, the traffic signal system. They develop and implement plans for downtown parking via transportation and other parking analysis. Develop and implement citywide active transportation plan to improve pedestrian and bicycle networks. Uh, perform, develop, review, and inspect private development projects as related to transportation. Implement the coastal rail trail by levering lo leveraging local dollars, Measure D, as a match to state and federal grants. Under our plan section, they develop and update active transportation plan and to apply for the active transportation program, ATP grants. And they've been very successful as you've seen. They develop local roadway safety plan as you saw yesterday, used for highway safety improvement, uh, HSIP grants and help prioritize fundable cash crash projects. Actively seek and secure grant funding for transportation improvement projects identified in the ATP and elsewhere. The division currently has approximately $21 million in grant funded projects scheduled through 2024. And they assist with the development of the climate action plan. Set goals for greenhouse gas and trip reductions and ways to improve our multimodal plan. They assisted with the development of the West adapted plan used for the Coastal Commission and the city to manage and re respond appropriately to changing uh, conditions. Our education and outreach group, they create and implement several education outreach programs in support for creating safer streets and encouraging alternative transportation. Go Santa Cruz is one such, such program which has been very successful, which through February have signed up over a thousand individuals, distributed over 630 free transit passes for participants and accounted for 50,000 miles of non-single occupant driving. The division uh, also utilizes the Street Smarts program to provide targeted education with videos. Our latest one shown in the, the slide here is push that button to activate those, those rapid flashing beacons. The, the, the group's also working on development of a city vision zero implementation plan and working with other agencies to restart our bike sharing program countywide. Next, I'll be giving you some accomplishments and highlights for the, from the current fiscal year. Uh, these accomplishments are organized by the major categories, re Santa Cruz interim recovery plan. And the categories are infrastructure, fiscal stability, and downtown and business revitalization. Under infrastructure, um, some of our notable accomplishments, uh, the rail completed segment seven, phase one of the rail trail project uh, from California to Natural Bridges and received a $9.2 million grant to construct segment two, segment seven, phase two, which should bid out in the fall. We've completed the grant funded highway safety improvement program, a citywide crossing improvement program with the 21 rapid flashing beacons. We initiated, initiated construction of highway one and nine um, we developed and bid out the San Lorenzo River Lagoon culvert project, which will be awarded next month. Substantial completion of the ultraviolet disinfection system replacement at the wastewater treatment plant, resulting in energy savings and environmental protections. We completed the solar voltaic uh, expansion projects at the Corp Yard, the La Vega Golf Lodge, and the landfill at the Dimia Lane. We completed the water and river streets paving, cold in place recycling and overlay projects. Um, completed the water street protected bike lanes um, and added green 
Street with upgraded access ramps. Completed of the Ocean and Water Street Northwest corner intersection improvements to improve bike and pedestrian safety. Regional partnership with Purewater Soquel in the design and facilitation of the water reuse project. We completed an installation of the food waste processing equipment at the research facility, allowing for expansion of our pilot program and increasing the number of businesses participating in the food waste collection program. And hopefully um, soon wrote opening that up to our um, residential customers. Uh, fiscal stability, we continue to re replace high operating cost vehicles and equipment with alternative fuel and energy efficient models. We've applied for over $39 million in transportation and safety and infrastructure grants through traffic engineering and engineering um, for projects. Uh, we initiated changes to provide, initiated changes to private development review fees to capture all staff costs. We've kept our public services, uh, the public counter development review open throughout the pandemic, despite uh, reducing our general fund costs. We accomplished low interest loan from California, from the California Infrastructure Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank, the iBank, for the wastewater treatment facility, um, UV disinfection system replacement. And we will be looking for them for larger repairs at, at the wastewater treatment facility when we look at the electrical system upgrade project. We implemented an in lieu fee and other charges for downtown parking, parking deficiency program. As we phased out the parking deficiency program that put the onus uh, for lack of parking on the businesses. We shifted it to the developer and that has been a successful program actually, um, which we first had our first payment with the Anton Group of over $620,000 of parking, parking in lieu fees that'll go towards future parking costs. Um, we, we paused the approved wastewater user rate increases for one year um, COVID relief and completed the, the, the refuse and recycling user rate study. So you'll be seeing new refuse rates, including a rate for food waste coming to council on FY22. Uh, we revised the sewer connection fee for development uh, to reduce the cost of multi-family housing uh, to encourage that, um, to not, not to reduce that barrier on multi-family. And then for the downtown business re revitalization, uh, we assisted in the setup of downtown business outdoor dining expansion areas throughout town due to COVID-19 indoor dining restrictions. We closed the block of Pacific from Cathcart to Lincoln to traffic. And um, we wanted to provide that outdoor dining in a safe, um, safe environment. We assisted in the commissioning of managed encampments at the National Guard Armory and provided ongoing support for the other encampment areas. Teams also assisted police department and parks department in camp logistics and debris cleanup on a weekly basis. All parking fees, downtown, daily rates, monthly permits were waived in March uh, until July 1, 2020. Um, parking deficiency fees and quarterly invoices were suspended be beginning in March 2020 and currently still being waived to give a, a businesses a chance to, um, to, you know, to reduce their costs. We provided curb pickup meter hoods for businesses at no cost beginning in June 2020. And when parking fees were reinstated, we put in place a daily limit of $3.75 um, as a maximum daily fee uh, to, to reduce the cost of parking for businesses and, and, re and visitors downtown. We completed phase one of the downtown bike locker uh, replacement program, completed bike and pedestrian crossing connections to downtown and the wharf with construction of the Pacific Avenue sidewalk infill project. Uh, we focused attention on private development review, permanent coordination, and we bid and award a number of large and small projects. 
now I'd like to talk a little bit about what do our expenditures look like. Basically, we're providing you a, a fairly status quo budget. Um, we are a very diverse department. Our total expenditures are almost $70 million, um, but we have two major um, divisions, wastewater and refuse make up uh, over 65% of that. And then if we combine parking, the general fund portion of parking in the district, uh, it's, that's all, almost another 10 million. Um, the remaining operation streets, uh, 3.5 million fleet, which is an internal service fund, about 3.7 million. And then um, several small um, divisions, engineering and traffic engineering, as you can see, they're very small. Facility small and um, Measure E is also a, a that's a very small group of two that supports our uh, clean water group. Uh, revenues by fund uh, again they mirror the previous slide. Um, refuse wastewater uh, both uh, rates supported uh, mostly fully supported uh, parking district again is a revenue supporting as well as a general fund most of that is parking revenue we do bring in equipment operations like i said was um, internal service gas taxes come is a state funded work parking is also general fund but it's a special fund um and then measure e is is state is property tax based uh same thing with stormwater stormwater overlay and then our traffic impact fee is developer based uh, total revenue, 0.3 million. If we look at how our expenses and how our revenues compared against last year, uh, amended budget to um, requested budget, uh, and expenses, you can see we have a reduction of almost um, about two and a half million, um, or three and a half million actually. That is is in reduced, uh, we did some belt tightening, uh, tried to reduce our costs and some of it's in capital outlay is reduced. If we look at revenue, again, um, revenue's down about a million dollars um, between the two years. A lot of that is parking uh, revenue that is down, but we hope to see that uh, come back. If we look at net general fund cost, out of $70 million, um, our bottom line to the net to the general fund is about 3.6 million. Uh, our total expenditures are 8.6 general fund. Uh, WARF is another 0.7, a 9.4 um, general fund cost, but we bring in a revenue of about 5.8 million. So our net impact of general fund is 3.6 million. Some of the general fund reductions. Um, that you heard yesterday, um, we did cut our general fund budget by 340,000, plus we added about 300,000 in uh, parking, new parking revenue um, through the beach meters that you approved, and we upped our parking estimate another 100,000. So um, we think our parking revenue will be about 400,000 greater than last year. We don't think this is gonna have a great impact on our ability to, to operate the Local roadway safety plan was completed this year with a grant, so that's a savings. Facility supplies, uh, uh, some remodel work and solar savings is in their the street division materials and service. A lot of this um, street work has been shifted to um, homeless uh, cleanups, and so some of this materials have not been spent, and so we think we'll be fine this year by reducing it. Uh, that's a one time. A ride share program of 34,000 was replaced um, by general fund and put in the Go Santa Cruz budget. Our merchant bank fees, those are credit card charges for parking were reduced, um, less credit card charges. And then we just have some miscellaneous and supplies and just some efficiencies. I'd be remiss if I didn't um, acknowledge the great work of our staff. Um, you know, you heard it with Public Works Week, but I, I'll reemphasize. Um, obviously, I don't do this work. Uh, my staff does this work. They do a great job. They are out there 24-7, um, um, ensure things work and, and function properly. 
and they're they're the ones you call when there's a something in the road or um, something falls down and we need to get out there and make it safe and these are the guys that are these are the men and women that strongly support um, the city the businesses the visitors and our other city departments and so I'm very proud to work with them and I'm here to answer any questions thank you mark <clears throat> great presentation and as usual um, always a humbling it's always humbling every presentation it's like wow um, appreciate all the detail and um, I'm happy to have uh, council members uh, if you have questions re regarding this council member Cummings and then vice governor <clears throat> well as the mayor said it's always great to hear about this presentation and it's impressive all the work that <clears throat> public works does to make things move and I think people really don't always appreciate it as much as they should but uh yeah thanks to all the hard work you all are doing and and um and the great work that all your employees do uh, I did have a question I just wanted to see if you could clarify there's been some I think confusion in the community or maybe rumors popping up but I'm wondering if you could just explain a little bit more about what's happening with recycling in particular I think that there's you know some people think that we're just putting recycling in and it's just and we're not actually recycling and I know there's some been some emails floating around about you know recycling with UCSC and the city and I'm just wondering if you could just highlight you know what's happening with recycling to provide some clarification around that and yeah sure I'm happy to do that uh, that's a great question um you know we uh, we process all the recycling that comes to us um there is no doubt that um some of the material that comes to us is contaminated and um we work very hard with our education group um, waste reduction um to try to get people to recycle correctly we have videos on our website um we'll go out and do site visits to we have master recycler program that will come to your facility and help you figure out what's working and what's not working if you're a business uh, about a year ago UCSC um, made a strong push to try to recycle all of their material um, and unfortunately they combined a lot of the material together some of the material was not recyclable for us and they unfortunately contaminated a lot of the material and we told them um, that we couldn't accept that material after we had you know we had invited them to come forward we worked with them um and we did work with them to get them to get the the contamination out of the material um and we again started accepting their material um but they're having to do some pre-processing and they've decided that um they're taking that material to marina because they don't have to pre-process it um unfortunately it's not all recyclable uh there's about a 40 percent waste of that and they're having to that material sorted and and, and taken um so recycling is not wish cycling as i kind of mentioned um it's really there are certain things that we have to process that material we then package it and we have to market that material and five years ago the recycling got the quality got fairly bad because all the materials being shipped overseas and then where you sent them and so quality control was was kind of was not a high priority for a lot of people and then you heard of the china sword where they stopped taking all that material mm -hmm. and that shifted all the focus back on on quality of material and our we have to market our material to suppliers that means contamination has to be below five percent something on that order have equipment that sorts that material and people that have to go in and then hand pick um contamination out of it and i'm hope we do have video tours but i don't think it's as impressive as actually being up there and <coughs> that facility work and we're hoping to restart those tours um and once we do if anybody in the, that you're hearing is concerned what happens to that material we have them on a tour and, and and show them you know firsthand what comes out of the truck how it's processed and 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 what happens to it and where do we market it and how it goes it's amazing to see the volume of material that goes through the resource recovery facility uh, that gets processed 
And um, I mean, the metal metal pile is one example. The waste metal is just tremendous amount of volume that within a month you can just see the tons and tons and tons of material that comes in and gets recycled. So, yeah, that's a great question, and we're happy to provide that. Um, you know, the, the any more detail that you'd like on that. Thanks. So that was great to get that clarification. And then the other question I had was around the. Um, the composting, I know there's some members of the community who have been reaching out, they the bike pot, uh, bike composting um, again, and they were interested in, you know, wanting to get engaged with the city and help the city in those efforts. And so I'm wondering uh, what the best way we could connect them to you all or how they could, you know, help with those efforts. Yeah, I, I would I would suggest they, took, they reach out to Leslie O'Malley, and if you can send me the the contact information, I'm happy to get it to her. Leslie's our waste reduction coordinator. She deals with waste reduction. Um, and we do have a compost program, a compost bin program. We will do a pilot food waste collection. Right now we have a five food waste drop off um, in a couple of our parks and one at City Hall that people have to sign up and get some education and we're starting that. but. Um, we're hoping to do a small pilot with food waste collection residential and, and learn how that works. So if these people are interested, those are the people that we want to get engaged early on on this system and, and have, see how that works. But bicycle compost, we reached out in originally when that was going on to see if we could partner with that group, with the original group, and it just didn't work out. But we're happy to have a conversation there. Great. All right. Thank you. Vice Mayor Bruner. Thank you. Um, my, I have two questions, and one of them was on the wish cycling. So <laughs> thank you for addressing that. Um, my other question, um, I always knew there were so many parts to public works, and I definitely experienced many of those parts in my daily job. <laughs> Uh, downtown, um, but there's so much more. It's amazing. And um, in terms of budget, you had mentioned the rideshare program moving over to the Go Santa Cruz program. What? Um, so, my understanding is the Go Santa Cruz program is downtown specific. Was the rideshare program? How was that different? Um, yeah, that before was. Um it was basically with funded out of general fund, but we shipped that over as parking funded now, parking district funded. So that's funds go Santa Cruz um, to help encourage people not to drive alone downtown and park, but to use alternative transportation, whether it's a free bus pass, um, free bike lockers, those kind of things. Anything we can do to encourage people to do alternative transportation. Um, we're gonna need all of that with our, our parking uh, as you see with the development that's coming yep. uh, and losing public parking. But we there's some positive things. We have uh, new parking equipment that's coming into place that will give us some flexibility on how we redesign our parking permits uh, downtown. Going away from a monthly permit maybe to a, a per use permit and maybe you can buy them in bulk so we can issue uh, more permits uh, as well as encourage people if I don't want to drive my car today and I want to ride my bike, I can save some money on the parking instead of, oh, I paid for parking, it's free, it doesn't matter. Um, and then also looking at a residential parking permit um, so that people that live downtown um, can have a that will allow them to, to park overnight and if they travel out, uh, free that space up for somebody else during the day. So. Um, those some exciting news and parking, but that's not, you know, as we get ready for the mixed use project, we're gonna take some parking out of the system. So we're gonna have to um, have the Go Santa Cruz program and all kinds of uh, creative ways to reduce parking during that construction time. Yes, thank you. I appreciate it, Okay. Any other questions from council members? Okay. Thanks very much, Mark. Appreciate You're welcome. You and your Thanks for the opportunity. Great work. Next up, we have our um, Parks Director, Tony Elliott, and he will give a presentation on the Parks and Recreation budget. 
All right, good afternoon, Mayor and City Council. Share my screen here. Oh, which one is it here? Hang on one moment. Hey, Bonnie, if you were there, I'm having a bit of an issue sharing my screen. Would you mind uh, sharing? My screen right now in terms of the uh, yeah, but it, it's not in presentation mode. It's okay. There, there you go. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll run with this. All right, thank you for your patience as we get started here, and uh, appreciate the the time and opportunity to present our uh, fiscal year 2022 uh, budget proposal. I wanted to acknowledge um, uh, our principal management analyst, Lindsay. Uh, Park Superintendent Travis Beck and Recreation Superintendent uh, Rachel Kaufman are waiting in the wings for any questions or detailed discussion uh, that we might have a little bit later. Uh, so I wanted to also just acknowledge uh, Lindsay and Travis and Rachel's work going into this budget. They've really, they've done, uh, they and the supervisors uh, have really built this budget. So just wanted to uh, highlight their work and appreciate uh, all that they've done to, to build this out. Um, as a brief agenda, we'll give a, a short department overview. Um, we'll highlight a couple accomplishments from fiscal year 2021, uh, and then briefly go through our fiscal year 2022 budget uh, proposal. Uh, so just to start, um, in terms of the mission, I always like to sort of ground um, this in our mission here uh, in terms of what we do to start. Uh, so I'll just read this here. It's providing environments, experiences, and programs that enrich the lives of residents and build a healthy community. So everything that we do, whether it's in parks, recreation, down at the wharf, the golf course, wherever it might be, uh, driven by this mission uh, to serve the city of Santa Cruz, residents and visitors uh, alike. Um, in terms of our department overview, um, we have a very large uh, and diverse scope of operations within parks and recreation. Uh, we shared this with the council um, and the Parks and Recreation Commission a few weeks back uh, at a joint session, so I won't go through this in, in a ton of detail, but just an overview, um, the Parks and Recreation Department maintains and provides over 1,700 acres of parks, beaches, trails, open spaces, uh, city trees, uh, forth. Uh, we provide over 169,000 square feet of facility space, including venues like the Civic Auditorium, London Nelson Community Center, the Santa Cruz Wharf, uh, and Parks and Recreation develops opportunities uh, throughout the year for residents and visitors to play, learn, engage, and socialize. Uh, as I mentioned, maintains the wharf, uh, the golf course, De La Vega Golf Course, uh, open spaces such as Arana Gulch and Poganip, uh, Harvey West Pool, West Cliff, Maine and Cowell Beach, uh, all of the city's medians, um, so on and so forth, just a bit of a snapshot. Um, we host a lot of iconic programs such as Santa Cruz Junior Guards, uh, events like the Clam Chowder Cook-Off in partnership uh, with the Beach Boardwalk. And we provide opportunities and spaces uh, throughout the city for youth, teens, uh, seniors, um, and really all community members uh, across the city. We also partner with uh, a number of organizations that really serve as, a, as an extension of Parks and Recreation. So we partner with the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, uh, Community Bridges at the Nueva Vista Community Center, Market Street Senior Center, uh, and many more. Um, and additionally, as we experienced uh, over this last year, um, calendar year 2020 and really fiscal year 2021, uh, Parks and Recreation really serves uh, in an essential role. Um, over the last year, we've served um, in numerous capacities through the different emergencies we face. 
you know, the Civic Auditorium and staff served uh, to provide an evacuation center uh, during the CZU fires. Uh, the Civic Auditorium, as you know, um, is currently home of a COVID testing site, uh, which will continue through September. Uh, park staff worked alongside uh, fire department personnel and water department uh, to clear vegetation around critical infrastructure during the fires. Uh, and the recreation team, uh, recreation platform uh, through the pandemic and provided essential child care services in response to uh, the scenario that we faced through the pandemic. So parks and recreation, um, I'm not even sure I was aware how much parks and recreation would, would uh, or could really uh, be at the forefront of those critical services through emergencies. But in many ways, uh, parks and recreation was right at the forefront with our colleagues and partners uh, at the fire department, police, and so forth. Um, as a department overview, uh, briefly, one thing I've, I guess, learned from um, our colleagues at economic development and IT and planning is we need to get professional headshots as part of our um, org chart here. Uh, but here's just a brief snapshot. We've got three divisions, recreation, administration, uh, in our parks division uh, that you can see here. Again, Lin um, Lindsay Bass is our principal management analyst, Travis Beck, our park superintendent, uh, and Rachel Kaufman oversees uh, recreation. All right, in this next section, I'll just highlight a few of the accomplishments over the last fiscal year. So we have a, a graphic here, and I won't go through all of this, but um, these are a number of our fiscal year 21 accomplishments. Uh, that are included in the budget packet for city council and how they align with the uh, different priorities and principles as set by re-envision Santa Cruz. So how, how these really line up with uh, the mission and vision of the city council. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of these. Um, uh, some of these accomplishments this year were expected or unexpected um, as a result of the, of the pandemic and the fires and so forth. So, a couple of the key accomplishments, um, the golf course, uh, De La Viega golf course had its best year in over two decades um, as a result uh, of the new golf course operations plan, but also increased play during the pandemic. Um, the department completed a number of new plans to guide our operations into the future. So the parks master plan uh, was adopted and approved, the wharf master plan the street tree master plan and the first uh, recreation and leisure study that we've done uh, for the department um, accomplished those to really set the vision for the future. Um, we've also uh, adapted how we provide recreation and services, to maximize equity and maximize accessibility for our community members. So I alluded to this a little bit earlier, but we worked with uh, community bridges on the Senior Center Without Walls program, we launched a, vir a virtual recreation platform and distributed nearly $30,000 in scholarships for low-income families uh, over the past year. And then we'll talk about capital improvement um, just a little bit later this afternoon with uh, really all of the uh, departments, but a uh, quick highlight on some of these accomplishments here. Um, Let's see, Parks and Recreation completed uh, renovations to the town clock. Uh, this was just a, a month or so ago. Uh, and we'll uh, also complete improvements uh, to the Central Park Playground, but new playground over at Central Park uh, with funding through the Community Development Block Grant uh, Program, the CDBG program. Um, and so we'll talk about capital improvement a little bit later, but I think some of these accomplishments, while well, we're very proud of these this year, are, are, pretty, are pretty minor um, in comparison with some of the major needs we have uh, across the department. So we'll talk about that uh, just a bit later. Excuse me, one moment. Thanks. All right, this last section, I will talk uh, about the fiscal year 2022 budget. Uh, so just to kind of uh, turn us off here, um, as we looked at the budget, we, we prioritized the guiding principles set by uh, re-envision Santa Cruz. Uh, we aim to ensure that we continue to provide essential services, um, that we prioritize equity and well-being, uh, we prioritize an engaged community, 
and continue our efforts in sustainability and the green economy. Um, over the past year, we have seen that the demand for parks and open spaces and outdoor spaces generally has been higher than ever. As we head towards fiscal year 2022, uh, just from a strategy standpoint, we see it as being critical to rehire for many of the positions that have been vacant over the past year that have contributed to the closure of a lot of our uh, city parks. So in order to open those parks, make sure they're safe and accessible, um, really prioritizing uh, our ability to rehire staff going into 2022. Um, our, with, all, with that said, concern the context of the city's structural deficit. So we wanna make sure that we are uh, effective stewards of our budget. Um, so you will see that some of our strategies were budgeting on the margins um, and ensuring that the, the reduction proposals that we are putting forth uh, are really strategic. So we wanna um, making uh, reductions or proposed reductions heading into fiscal year 2022 in a way that allows us to build back better uh, or recover and be more sustainable moving into the future. Um, and if you recall from our meeting a few weeks ago with uh, the Parks and Recreation Commission, uh, we, have, we have a long way to go. So currently, um, and, uh, let's see on the next slide, uh, I'll talk about our number of FTEs, but we have about 82 um, or 83 FTEs. And really the target to provide a baseline level of service for Parks and Recreation is about 101 FTEs uh, and a consistent four to six million dollar annual investment in capital improvement. So um, again, currently we're about 20 FTEs off of that mark and about four to six million dollars off of the capital investment. So we've got a lot of steps we need to, to take to get to that point. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so last thing I'll say is that as we go into uh, the next couple of slides here on our budget proposal, I uh, just wanted to be sure to mention that in May, the Parks and Recreation Commission uh, approved their affirmative recommendation or support of the department budget. But one item that they specifically called out, um, and this was similar to our joint session that we had a few weeks ago, the commission wants uh, the department to look at the potential to bring back a park ranger program uh, within the city. Um, as you know, that was cut last year through the police department budget, uh, but that's something that our commission feels strongly that is critical for uh, staff safety, public safety, and the success of the department uh, moving forward. So they want us to, um, and the council to consider that, uh, and for us um, as department staff to look at that in coordination with the police department uh, in the coming years. All right, so here we go. In terms of our budget proposal for fiscal year 22, um, I'm looking at the table on the right-hand side of the screen here. So our proposed budget uh, is approximately 16.3 million. Um, our revenue budget uh, is um, almost 4.2 million. Um, in terms of the, the kind of the ratio of the breakdown here, personnel, as you can see, uh, is a little bit over 10 million. So that represents about 64% of our entire budget uh, is built on, uh, built on staff uh, cost, personnel cost. In terms of cost recovery, um, so the 4 million versus 16 million roughly, um, our total cost recovery is 28.9% which is right on par with the with an app. The proposed reduction that you see here, um, again, highlighted uh, on the right-hand side of the page, um, our proposed reduction is 617,171. Um, and that really comes from um, a, a, few, uh, a few areas that we'll talk about here um, in, the, in the next few slides. The last thing I just wanted to uh, call attention to is the regular staff FTE, the full-time equivalent uh, number on the bottom. Uh, we have 83 and three quarters currently, um, but through our budget reduction proposal here, we would actually reduce that to 82.5. Uh, these are vacant positions. These are not uh, filled positions. Um, and again, we'll talk about that in these uh, next couple slides here. 
All right. Um, so in terms of the potential reduction, the first strategy that we've taken, and, and let me kind of contextualize this a little bit, looking at fiscal year 21, uh, the majority of the cuts that we made uh, within Parks and Recreation were one-time cuts. Uh, so in part, the rationale behind putting forth structural cuts for this year um, uh, is due in part uh, to the fact that most of our cuts last year were one-time. So by uh, offering $617,000 in proposed cuts this year, although it's very painful, um, that really gets us on par with uh, the percentage of budget reductions that virtually every other department across the city made uh, over the uh, over the last year in terms of so it it creates parity a little bit of parity uh, among other departments. Um, to uh, really, what's behind this budget reduction uh, are a few different factors. So number one, um, we aimed to, and this is kind of in the in the uh, blue color. Uh, we aimed to budget on the margins. So we carry a fair amount of budget uh, for a variety of things, including camp cleanups in our open spaces, uh, to holding budget to pay um, umpires and referees, uh, to hanging on to budget to pay uh, class instructors um, uh, for, you know, for different classes that we offer through recreation. So rather than hanging on to that budget and budget, we are uh, what we're calling budgeting on the margins, which is um, letting go of that uh, that excess. And if we need it, we would then come back to the city council uh, to request additional appropriation for funds to, uh, for example, hire umpires or referees. But what that would mean is that we would be asking for additional funds, uh, but with the expectation that there would be revenue to match that uh, coming back in. Uh, the second big piece, uh, service elimination. So this is in the orange. Um, uh, we've got recreation events that we are proposing to uh, uh, really reduce. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, our FOPAR, uh, Friends of Parks and Recreation Scholarship, uh, we would cut that amount. Um, I can talk about that uh, as well. Uh, community parks, um, we would not have staff uh, dedicated to in-house construction work. So it would be an elimination of a vacant construction specialist position. Uh, and then the third piece, uh, the service reductions. Um, I'm sorry, this is actually the blue section, the 46% that you see. Um, the Civic Auditorium, we would uh, scale back on operations of the Civic. We would have much more limited operations of the Civic. Uh, in our open space, reduced levy maintenance, uh, and camp cleanup budget. And then in urban forestry, we would reduce our tree work in the wildland urban interface areas. Um, and happy to discuss that more uh, in the next slides. All right, so uh, drilling down into some detail in terms of these budget reductions. So in terms of recreation events, um, uh, we support events such as Woody's on the Wharf, uh, Aloha Polynesian Festival, uh, Japanese Cultural Fair. And so in our proposed reductions, we would uh, propose making cuts to the support that we offer to these groups. This is not a judgment call on the, the value or the importance of these events to the community, but uh, simply um, a needing and, and facing uh, structural deficits across the city uh, where we think we can make cuts, uh, but still, uh, work with our partners. So for example, Woody's on the Wharf, we, even in the case where we reduce budget to pay for things like tents and tables and supplies and so forth, we still wanna work with them. We hope that event runs, we wanna support it. And so we could help uh, in terms of generating sponsorship or finding alternative ways uh, to generate revenue to help run that event. Um, but roughly, um, just as an example, Woody's on the Wharf costs the department roughly about $20,000 a year to help support Woody's on the Wharf. So it's a, um, a high dollar amount, but a very important uh, uh, event to the community, uh, certainly, that we hope will continue to run. Um, so let's see, on uh, the next item, the Civic Auditorium, um, what we would propose on the Civic Auditorium in the way of cuts, we would reduce some temporary staff uh, and make a number of other cuts to the Civic Auditorium. This would allow us to continue to operate 
uh, and worked with the Santa Cruz Symphony uh, to, to allow the symphony a, a home, uh, and then also Cabrillo Festival. Beyond that, community events ranging from Santa Cruz Follies to the uh, Roller Derby uh, to the Martin Luther King Jr. Um, event, all of those uh, we are, um, we're not entirely certain that we will, um, well, I would say that we won't be able to support those in the way that we have historically. It's not to say that those can't run, but the way that those events will have to be dramatically scaled back. Um, even meeting space, the Tony Hill Room and so forth over at the Civic Auditorium, this, these proposed reductions uh, would mean that for um, a meeting organizer wanting to set up in the Tony Hill Room, that they would take on the setup and the organization of that, that our staff would not be able to do so. So the symphony would, would remain, Cabrillo Festival would remain. Beyond that, uh, we would have very limited capacity uh, to support um, uh, other events uh, at the Civic Auditorium. Um, the one piece I do want to mention on the Civic is um, the, the context in recommending this particular cut. And again, this is not a judgment on the value of the Civic Auditorium, but we want to approach the Civic Auditorium moving forward. We have the golf course in developing a business model uh, that's sustainable. So currently at the Civic, uh, just rough numbers, uh, the Civic costs the, the city about a million dollars per year to operate, and the Civic brings in roughly a half million dollars in revenue. So the city, and historically, has subsidized the Civic Auditorium roughly uh, a half million dollars per year. And so part of making these reductions now, um, it's an opportunity for us to sort of recalibrate, uh, develop a better business model, and then reopen or rebuild um, the Civic Auditorium in the coming years uh, under a more sustainable uh, business plan. Uh, in terms of the strategic shifts um, uh, in recreation, uh, again, some of the cuts that we are, are proposing here uh, are strategic in nature so that we have the opportunity hopefully to reorganize a bit within the department and make sure that we allocate resources uh, to our most critical functional areas. So we want to make sure um, that we're providing uh, support to our youth and teen services and programs um, and to sports uh, and beaches. So things like junior guards, little leagues, uh, adult softball, um, those also have a really high cost recovery uh, in those, at least in the sports and beaches area. Uh, so um, again, wanna make sure that we prioritize um, those, those core areas by reorganizing. The recreation and leisure studies that I mentioned earlier also is a guiding document on how programs we offer um, and what their what their cost recovery uh, needs to be and how we balance the services to make sure that our programs uh, are affordable uh, and equitable, but also sustainable as we move into the future. So the budget reductions, um, the implications to the parks division, uh, I mentioned that the construction spec would be a position uh, that would be um, eliminated. It's currently a vacant position. So small construction projects, we would contract out, um, or in some cases, uh, projects may be left undone um, in, the, in the near term uh, with that vacancy. Um, we would have less funding in parks for temp staff uh, across the division, um, and then uh, we're not cutting, we're not proposing to cut entire camp cleanup or uh, hazard tree work budgets, um, but specifically to camp cleanup, our budget has increased actually over the past couple of years uh, to upwards of $150,000. So we are, we've put a, a proposed reduction in there actually to reduce that budget down to approximately $1,000 um, for camp cleanup. So our hope, uh, our hope is that um, the city's camping ordinance uh, in part will lend uh, to hopefully our ability to not have to invest as much in the camp cleanups and our open spaces. Um, but also as it relates to wildland urban interface work or camp cleanups, there is grant money available that we've uh, successfully uh, been able to capture uh, to appropriate toward uh, those needs um, as they arise. So. 
um, a little bit of context on the uh, on the uh, parks implications there. So again, I wanted to just come back next on these budget reductions. Um, it's not a fun conversation, certainly, to be proposing um, budget reductions here again through our budget process. But um, again, as I mentioned, given the majority of our fiscal year 21 reductions were one time, uh, we're proposing, um, again, approximately 620,000 uh, in structural reductions in the fiscal year 2022 budget, um, spite of many of those uh, one-time cuts. But we want to do this and kind of looking at the graphic, we, uh, these cuts that we're making are really in the spirit and the context of what is shown in the, in the I'm gonna call it a sunrise here, uh, fiscal sustainability, uh, downtown and business revitalization, uh, and infrastructure. So we wanna make sure that these cuts we make are strategic and allow us to build back into the future. Um, presently, um, the number of vacant positions that we have created by the fiscal year 21 hiring freeze and early retirement um, mean that we have greater flexibility now to make structural reductions. And so if we delay potential reductions um, to a later year, 23 or 24, uh, there's a risk that positions filled uh, might need to be cut at worst, uh, or positions would have to remain vacant um, uh, into the future. And so, um, for example, specifically on that, our parks division has had approximately eight vacant positions over the past year, which represents roughly 30% of our park maintenance uh, division. So this is why places like Lower De La Viega uh, Park, uh, Laurel Park, George Washington Grove have been closed. We just haven't had the staff to maintain it. So part of what we're proposing here in terms of these reductions would allow us uh, the opportunity, we hope, to rehire staff into those parks positions where community demand uh, lies. Our community saying reopen the parks, reopen the parks. Uh, and we've seen that use demand increase. And so part of these reductions really lend to um, an opportunity to, to reorganize a bit, especially within recreation, but give us the opportunity to rehire uh, specifically uh, within parks. Um, so just to kind of round this out, um, the Parks and Recreation Department uh, is really committed to maximizing our efficiency, uh, diversifying our revenues and optimizing our fiscal sustainability. So we have a lot of opportunity, as we've talked about uh, here, to increase our efficiency, increase our cost recovery. But with that said, we want to make sure that we, um, uh, we want to make sure that our programs and services are affordable and accessible and equitable. Um, and so we, we're gonna continue to really aggressively pursue grants, uh, work with FOPAR, our Parks Foundation, uh, to develop philanthropic support, so on and so forth. But with that said, those efforts internally, that, that takes time and we're gonna build those over the next year and two years and three years to, to be more efficient. But the revenue, revenue is critically important for our department as well. So as the city considers a potential ballot measure, a ballot measure for the department would be extremely uh, critical in helping us into the future and even a future bond measure. Um, and that'll kind of lead into the CIP uh, conversation we'll have a little bit uh, later this afternoon. But those things are critical as we really strive toward uh, getting the resources we need um, to really to get to a baseline level of uh, maintaining and operating the park system uh, here in Santa Cruz. So uh, with that said, um, thank you for your time and appreciate it. Uh, again, Travis, Rachel, and Lindsay are waiting in the wings for any questions uh, that you all might have. Thank you, Tony. Uh, are there questions from council members at this point? Council Member Brown, and then Council Member Cummings. Thank you, uh, Tony, for the report and to everyone in Parks and Rec for all you do. Um, I um, had got most of my questions answered when we met previously, um, so I don't have a whole bunch, but I, I was wondering um, if 
if you could talk a little bit more about the, um, you know, what your thoughts on how the, how the increase or rehiring uh, uh, in parks maintenance will um, kind of help address some of the need in the parks, but then you also mentioned that there's safety issues and, and really bringing the park rangers back, um, which isn't happening this year, um, but certainly is something that the community has said they want and you know the value and kind of we all know the value. So I, if you could just talk a little bit about how that's, how you see that um, looking year, we have clearly, um, you know, our parks are experiencing a lot of impact for from a lot of different types of users and I, I worry about the um, kind of the, the challenges of trash you know dealing with trash and dealing with kind of the waste management questions as you know as people are dispersed out into um, the community further as they um, with, with the new uh, camping standards ordinance so I guess I'm just trying to like understand how you see yourself your, your department being positioned to deal with some of those challenges ongoing and potentially increasing in different um, areas um, with the uh, additional staffing that you might be able to get. Like how many of the eight do you think you can um, hire, hire back? I guess the, the really concrete question. And then just a little bit of your thinking on that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, of those, of those eight, we're hopeful to, to rehire seven of those positions. The one exception would be the construction specialist, which we included with our uh, budget reduction uh, submittal uh, here before the council. Uh, so our hope is to hire uh, the other seven. That's gonna take some time, certainly over the summer, um, uh, to get all those folks on board. Uh, so, uh, but getting those people on board would mean that we can, we can reopen parks. And some of the parks we're gonna reopen, we'll, we'll be able to kind of uh, shift people around and reopen sooner. So for example, Lower Dela, we will plan to open uh, in mid-June. Uh, but George Washington Grove, Laurel Park, we're still very limited on our ability to um, uh, to reopen those until we get new staff. Um, a few different uh, things here. So um, temp staff are really important, especially in the summertime. Um, that is an area that we have proposed making some cuts uh, in general on our temp staff. Um, but uh, we are also looking uh, to um, increase our volunteer uh, program and efforts. So we've started to really build out our adopt a park program. Um, in in uh, some cases, that, that that adds a bit more work, uh, but we're trying to really streamline that and refine it to leverage volunteers successfully and and uh, efficiently. Um, and then we're talking, you know, longer term in the in terms of the green economy and green jobs, for opportunities to work with the community with students. Uh, with partners, for example, at Downtown Streets team, uh, ideas like an apprenticeship type of program, but how do we build a workforce that can lead into park maintenance, um, get extra hands to support? Um, so that's, we don't have any concrete details on that, but we want to really build a, help build a pipeline because the work that we do in parks and recreation, um, it is the green economy. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, kind of build that pipeline to get to get new people in um, uh, over time. So that's a bit of that strategy. And um, I know Travis is out there somewhere. If there's any other details, I would welcome Travis to weigh in on that as well. Thanks, Tony. Uh, thanks, Councilmember Brown, for that question. Uh, we are planning on rehiring those full-time positions. We're also coming off of the, the furlough. Um, I think the piece of the, the question, though, is related to Tony's earlier comment that really to maintain the park system uh, at the level we would like to, even additional staff are needed. So refilling our vacant positions, coming off of the furlough, hiring temps as we are able to will bring us back to more of that basic level of service where we are keeping up with the refuse, we're doing the you know safety inspections, the basic maintenance. Um, turf care, et cetera, but to really do some of the enhancements that we would like in, in parks is a project for down the road and uh, hopefully additional staff we can bring on. Thank you. I really appreciate 
hearing from you and all of your thinking that's that's going into this. And so it, it sounds like things are going to get a little better. You've all have been hit so hard, and so it sounds like a little bit better, and there's still a lot of work to do to get you back to – or get you to off. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Myers had to step out, so I will call the next question, is Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, well, first, I want to appreciate all the work that you all do and the presentation that was provided. Um, and I really appreciate you pointing out, you know, um, trying to address the kind of expense to revenue generation ratio at the Civic Center, and I mean, we, it looks like, you know, there's an amazing job that was done with the golf course and the pandemic definitely influenced that a bit to like encourage more people to get out golfing. But, you know, I think that um, it does go to show though that, you know, um, if we can maybe, you know, figure out how to optimize use of the Civic to really, you know, have the match the revenue generated that there's a, you know, real opportunity there to, to cut costs in that way and to make up for that deficit. Um, the question I had was, you know, um, the discussion around cuts and kind of reorganizing to improve cost recovery. Um, and, you know, to Councilmember Brown's point, you know, a big part of that is focusing on, um, you know, getting these positions, you know, refilling these positions for like, which is really critical to get people in the parks. We really need to have like maintenance and upkeep. I guess, where do you kind of envision, like, you know, what programs would get cut? And then, like, what's the what would be like a timeline for seeing those come forward, and and kind of tied to that is whether or not there's potential for kind of public private partnerships to help keep those programs running. Yeah, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. I'd like to invite Rachel Kaufman, our Rec Superintendent, uh, to weigh uh, to weigh in on that in terms of timing and kind of what the details might look like. Um, at a high level, what I would say is. Um, uh, similar to what I shared in the presentation, we, we want to make sure to match up our staff resources where the highest need and demands are uh, from the community in terms of our core services. Uh, and also consider that in terms of cost recovery. Um, um, so anyway, I'll, I'll send it over to Rachel to kind of speak to some of our strategy uh, behind, um, uh, behind that discussion. Sure, thank you, Tony. Um, as far as recreational programs that we're looking at eliminating or reducing, again, that's strong event side. So it's uh, reducing um, support to um, Woody's on the Wharf, Japanese Cultural Fair, and then eliminating um, some positions in, um, I mean, some events support entirely like the Aloha Festival. And again, we're just shifting gears to some of these core program areas where we see a and have seen a heavy demand um, throughout COVID, which is our um, youth programming. Um, the child care was a big program and a huge demand at our summer camps. We're increasing um, to get requests and demands to continue to provide those services and into the future, providing more kind of child care options for parents next summer trying to shore up those program areas to be able to support the need in the community. And then also seeing just a huge need in our uh, sports programs. Uh, beach permits have uh, rocketed way up with people wanting to use the beach and beach volleyball. So these are areas with good cost recovery that we have high demand. So that's why we are kind of moving resources to those two areas hoping that the events can run, um, we are still going to support them in uh, sort of non-financial direct needs like Tony mentioned. The ways we support them now are things like, you know, Alexis party rentals, DJ costs, security, these direct, you know, financial support that we offer, but we will continue to support in numerous other ways. For example, you know, we provide storage year-round for Japanese cultural fair, you know, we'll provide support, PD provides support to Woody's on the Wharf with the parade off the wharf. The wharf staff provides support with refuse and staff and so forth and parking. So there's numerous ways we as a city support that um, event, we'll continue to do so. 
um, but just a reduction in the event services. So I hope if that answers your questions on, on basic programs. And then with the civic, I'll just say that, you know, it, with events, um, it, for example, the blueprint um, guidance just came out on Friday. So we just continue to pivot to know what our program will, will even be next year. So we're digesting that right now. It, it just came out on Friday and what we'll be able to offer in terms of events. I will say we have the staffing that is creative and resourceful at the Civic to do so. I have every confidence in our supervisor, Jesse Bond and her team that we are gonna work together to figure out what events that we can run in a um, alternate business model. And it really will be on an event by event basis just to see um, what staffing support we can provide, how we can um, have a different modified way of supporting events um, to make them happen. Great. Thanks. And then I guess the last question is um, in terms of, you know, parks use and, and I know we've been getting some inquiries. I've been sending them over to the parks and rec director, but there's, you know, for example, a group that's interested in bringing rugby to Santa Cruz and wanting to do a public private partnership where they can, you know, use a field and hopefully they could, that could help generate some money or some revenue for the parks. I'm just wondering if, if that you know, potential, and could that be expanded to other groups that may want to, you know, use fields and, and um, you know, also that there are, you know, private people who are interested in kind of supporting that through financial um, donations? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, so, yes, I mean, we would welcome, uh, you know, rugby leagues or really any, you know, virtually any interest uh, you know, that the community has in using our parks. It's a, an opportunity for recreation and to get people out, especially after the pandemic. Uh, it's right at the core of our mission to provide these spaces for public engagement and use. Um, but it's also from a, a number standpoint, a revenue generator uh, for the department uh, and helps us sustain uh, these places. So um, yeah, we would definitely welcome new groups in terms of out new amenities or developing new fields or assets we're likely not in that um, in that window right now for that opportunity to build new but as far as our existing assets uh, fields or facilities or whatever it might be we certainly welcome um, you know really all use um, again a number of perspectives but it's at the core uh, of our mission and a little bit of a, um, uh, a kind of a riff off of that uh, we have a lot of uses happening in our parks uh, on an ongoing basis uh, that we aren't necessarily aware of um, or that may not be permitted. And so that's another area that we want to work with these groups, you know, not to squash them or anything, but to work with them to make sure that these events are safe, uh, you know, permitted appropriately um, and, and accessible to the broader community. Um, in a lot of cases, we'll have, you know, big pop-up events will occur. Uh, that'll have a major impact on trash or traffic or whatever it might be. And we had no idea that was even occurring. So if we can get a hold on a lot of that activity that happens sort of on radar, uh, that alone would help us generate revenue and would create more opportunities, uh, I think for the broader community, you know, in a more, in a more public uh, sort of way. Yeah, and I'm wondering, maybe we can talk offline about it, but if there's ways that we can do like, you know, outreach, um, to different groups throughout the community to really to showcase, you know, use. But if you want to throw an event, like here are the impacts that that can have. And we really want to, you know, and the permits that you pay for, it really goes to help support us keeping these open spaces. And so I think like just educating the public on like, you know, here's where, you, you know, when you pay for that permit, here's how your dollars are spent around maintenance and cleanup, you know, that maybe that people that would, hit people home and, and they'll be more willing to, you know, not only support, you know, by just getting the permits, but even potentially donating to the parks, you know, program. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, I could keep going on that, but yeah, I think the partnerships are a huge opportunity that kind of connects into that philanthropic element or the grant element. Um, you know, the pickleball community has offered funding to help build pickleball, or we can engage with our community. Uh, and be aligned on those opportunities. It, it does uh, help us start to address some of these uh, issues that we face with capacity and, and limited resources. Okay, thank you. And 
Thank you, Vice Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other council questions? I'll cue myself in there then. Um, I was wondering if the De La Viega golf course included the disc golf course? Uh, in terms of revenue or? As part of your, uh, yes, revenue, maintenance. Uh, yep. Yes, the, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, the disc golf course is largely managed by our uh, partners, the De La Vega Disc Golf Club, and we uh, work with them to assist with make there and um, also uh, the management of that area from the park side is the same uh, unit as our golf course. I see, okay. Um, and then I'm glad that the other questions came up because uh, with the budget, it, it, it there's so much built in that is so necessary and um, yet it seems like the hardest hit industry during COVID and, and this past year has been arts and culture events and those artists and venues are struggling to come out of probably the worst year ever. So, um, you know, the Aloha Festival, Japanese Cultural Fair, the Civic Auditorium, that all falls into our arts and culture. And, and um, any way we can, you know, direct funding to continue to support those areas are often the first to get cut, um, it, I think is very, very crucial. Um, you know, along with the programming and childcare and sports, I get it. There's a limited pot, but it's a different kind of community need um, to have those. It's not a. Um, it's not the same. It's the same impact, maybe a one-time event. But um, I just want to emphasize of really limiting cuts to our our amazing arts and culture programs and support and venue, our civic. Yeah, if I may just respond to that. I, you know, when we had, before the stimulus came in, um, we had a, a, certainly a higher target in terms of our reduction number. And we went through a process internally, and I think that departments uh, did, uh, in terms of um, in terms of what those greater reductions would mean, and we we're just at a very lean uh, a very lean moment in time in terms of parks and recreation. So as we went through that, and even at this point where the reduction um, you know is roughly half of what we had put together a couple months ago, mm -hmm. um, we're still so lean that that any cuts we make are very visible and very impactful. So whether it's a cut to you know, the community center or the civic or to events or, um, you know, keeping parks closed uh, for the next year or, or beyond, you know, that, that's kind of the level where, where we are in terms of that, you know, no was easy and, and uh, there, you know, other than the, the sort of budgeting on the margins that we talked about, there's just not, um, there's not a whole lot of room, uh, you know, to, to make, uh, make those cuts. So whatever they were, they were going to be impactful um, and, and very visible. And, you know, and again, credit to the team because they went through this exercise of uh, plastic cuts. Fortunately, we've, we've not had to uh, put those forward. But, um, but yeah, the exercise has been uh, certainly uh, pretty brutal, um, uh, you know, in the context of, of being pretty lean. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Thank you, Vice Mayor, and thank you, Tony, and I think happy birthday. Am I right? <laughs> yeah? Maybe. Okay. Like 29th today. Oh, yeah, mine's, mine's always the same. That's right. Oh, yeah. I love it. Um, well, no, thank you for being here with us on your birthday. I, I just had a, um, I don't know if this is something that's ever been done, but, you know, you see in different, you know, um, I'm kind of thinking about like different zoos or other types of uh, private places where you have sponsored areas by philanthropic dollars. So it could be like the so-and-so family, this and that, or whatever it may be. And I'm wondering if that's something that 
a parks department has either explored or you know could explore in terms of um, having you know, private donors help really sustain some of these really incredible assets, not only assets and events potentially, and kind of drawing on some of those community resources as well. Uh, short answer, yes, absolutely. We've got a sponsorship policy in development. Uh, we have kind of an old sponsorship uh, program, if you will, but we're updating that, and that would fit in really well um, uh, in that realm. Also, this is a big goal of ours for our, uh, our friends group, our Parks Foundation at FOPAR. Uh, they really, at least my, my hope uh, for FOPAR is that they can pivot um, to not just uh, be an agency to give out scholarships every year. I think that's an important of it, but I think that the opportunity is there for them to also raise uh, capital dollars. Um, I have challenged them to uh, raise a um, uh, million dollars per year for capital investment. Um, so they're starting to dial in, you know, what are the specific needs we're working together uh, to do that. But I think there's huge opportunity, I think, as a, as a tourism town. Uh, but also, I think there's a unique aspect about Santa Cruz where, um, uh, I'm not even sure how to articulate it, but, but it's, uh, there, there's just this love and connection to the community where people want to, to be involved, I think, in that type of way. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity and that's something that we hope to build on um, heading into this new year. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tony, for all your work and you and your whole entire department. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so we will move on. I will now call on Martine Bernal, city manager, to give a presentation on the capital improvement program. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm actually gonna introduce the presenter uh, for, for you today. So next is the capital improvement program, which is the, uh, all the, from all the various departments. And uh, we're gonna have Lupita Almas, uh, our budget manager, do that presentation for you. And then we're happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. So without further ado, uh, here is Lupita. Thank you. Unmute myself. Um, thank you, Martine. Good afternoon, Vice Mayor and Council Members. Um, today we'll be uh, ending the uh, public hearings and discussing the capital investment program. The, the capital investment uh, program spans um, from fiscal year 2022 to 2026. So mainly today you'll hear um, the projects that are appropriated in fiscal year 22. Um, we'll go over uh, the funds. Um, overview as it is now and our top priority projects and then we'll turn it over for each department to present their own projects and we'll pause in between each for any council questions. So with that, I'll start. So our CIP in fiscal year 22, our fund is appropriate, has appropriated 113 million for projects as you can see, the majority of that funding is in our water, our water and public works departments, which hold a lot of our enterprise funds, um, and they're able to leverage a lot of those revenues into um, projects, as well as um, economic development. Um, while not having any um, enterprise funds, we did hear from Bonnie this morning that they are able to leverage a lot of their CDBG and HUD funding and other grants to support affordable housing projects. So this is what is funded in fiscal year 22 by the and on the flip side, we have here um, a chart showing the um, unfunded projects by department, equaling 307.6 uh, million. Um, and unfortunately, um, over the years, we have had to defer a lot of CIP um, projects, in particular those funded by the general fund. Um, as you can see here in the chart, uh, public works transportation improvements makes up the majority of the list at 
241.9 million. Um, and a large component of that is um, or what it would take to implement the um, active transportation plan. And if the council would like to review a list of all of those unfunded projects, you can find them on page 230 of the budget book. And we won't go into those in detail, um, but um, really demonstrating here uh, a significant need for our capital program. So what we did this year um, so we, is we asked departments to um, request that they evaluate their fiscal year 22 um, general fund CIP projects against the set um, to determine priority. And the criteria was tied to the re-envisioned Santa Cruz um, focus areas. Um, we asked about fiscal sustainability, um, whether the current the current project had any funding tied, whether it was grant related or some other funding source, the location of the project or the asset, whether it was located in downtown or any other business sector. And we also asked about um, infrastructure questions about the asset or the project, whether it was regulatory or um, mandated um, to invest or replace. We asked about the asset condition, um, whether this was going to sail within the next year or so. We also asked about the maintenance value of the project or the asset, uh, meaning that does it cost more to maintain than it does to replace? We also asked about longevity and obviously project readiness. Um, as we've heard a lot of the money coming from the state and um, federal um, grants and stimulus money are going towards those projects that are shovel ready. So um, based on that criteria, um, the top 10 projects that um, here are um, this list of 10 um, equaling about 3.7 million um, in general fund need. Um, and we have here a variety of projects from a um, fire truck to civic roof repair, mm -hmm. parking lots, West Cliffs Drive stabilization. But what we will be asking the council to do on June 8th is to approve these top 10 projects as a group um, to leverage the $2 million that we have set aside um, for CIP for, to um, leverage against those um, state and federal grants um, coming through the stimulus. So that's what, um, what we'll be asking the council and department coming up, we'll talk about these projects within their list and um, they'll be available for questions. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Public Works. Good afternoon, uh, Chris Schneider, Assistant Director of Public Works, City Engineer. Um, the uh, slides that I heard for this are essentially um, uh, two uh, for now, and then I don't know if I was supposed to talk about our unfunded list right after this, so that's going to be later. Um, but anyway, uh, oh, we're starting with the unfunded first. Okay. The most significant unfunded projects that are on this list are really those projects that have already been um, included in the capital improvement program for a number of years, but the funding for next for the next fiscal year keep getting pushed out. And so I'll go through those projects. We didn't we didn't go all the way back to the three hundred thousand dollar or three three hundred million dollars worth of unfunded projects that are on uh, that much larger list. Um, the Poganet Creek sedimentation removal project, um, one where we have done some temporary work to reduce flooding of the Harvey West area, but we need to go in and um, actually um, create a new channel and the estimate for that work is 250,000. Uh, if we don't do the work, potentially we will uh, exasperate the uh, funding or uh, flooding of Poganip Creek uh, towards Harvey West. We're also uh, essentially in a code enforcement action against one of the property owners on the other side and uh, the work that we do will affect the outcome there. The Chestnut Street storm drain and paving rehabilitation. Uh, the storm drain rehabilitation is 875,000. That's what it's estimated at. And 
it's based on this storm drain that has collapsed in three locations and potential collapse in others as time goes on. It's luckily, I think, in the parking area, so it doesn't get uh, the impact loading from moving traffic or from uh, the railroad, but it is important that we repair it as soon as possible. The paving component is included in our paving program, and that's approximately a million dollars. But we don't want to pave the street until we can uh, storm drain. Uh, we are looking for grant funding, and uh, we potentially have a source for some of it. Uh, we'll know more in the next uh, two or three months. Uh, the Wharfgate parking equipment replacement, 450000 is really uh, one that's very important. We currently generate 1.2 to 1.4 million uh, in general fund revenue uh, from the wharf for parking, or at least pre-COVID, that's what it was, it's lower right now. And um, the equipment that's out there is no longer supported by the vendor. The vendor went out of business they were the same vendor that was that were supporting uh, the the um, parking garages downtown that have equipment, and we've bought all the spare parts that we can from the vendor, but we're running out of spare parts. Um, the downtown garages they're all getting replaced. Um, we've already placed one of them and working on the remaining two. Um, what happens if the equipment falls apart? Uh, we're um, uh, waiting to see if we can fund this is that essentially uh, we will have to you know spend more money using staff to collect revenue and potentially have to um, allow for the free use of parking um, we're hoping uh, though to increase the parking rate or in the near future, uh, but that does require a coastal permit to do so. So I have more information on that again in the coming year. Uh, Westcliff Drive stabilization, that project is estimated at half a million dollars. And this is to repair um, the revetments that are currently or have been um, displaced in the last few years affecting the pathway. And so there are two locations uh, that would be repaired with this money uh, near David Way and Woodrow, um, and then also um, another location closer to Woodrow. And the path is impacted, and you can see that out there with a number, a number of barricades that we have to maintain. Uh, ongoing wave action, et cetera, will affect these locations and potentially will create additional damage. Um, while grants may be possible, um, public works staff hasn't seen any uh, that fit this kind of situation in a number of years. The city hall parking lot repairs, uh, this is to repair and reconstruct the parking lot behind Parks and Rec. Uh, that is uh, employee parking during the day and then uh, when City Hall is closed, it's often used for the civic or other events uh, in the area. Um, it is down to the base rock in a number of locations uh, where we have, uh, you know, pothole tripping hazards and, uh, you know, localized flooding. Uh, flooding. And it would be really important to uh, repair this if it's going to be uh, continue to be used. Uh, public facilities, energy savings, and maintenance. Um, this is the bare minimum that's needed uh, to help us uh, patch a number together as we move forward and is, you know, a sign of deferred maintenance over many years. Um, as I believe Mark said, we maintain about 28 buildings, and this would help us with, you know, fixing leaking roofs, um, water lines that break, et cetera. The energy saving component, we've been successful in getting uh, loans and grants um, essentially to uh, replace uh, HVAC systems, et cetera, that the energy savings or future cost of energy that we're saving is used to uh, fund the uh, the project. So, for instance, we just awarded a contract in the Civic uh, to replace the boiler and also 
out at the um, Harvey West pool to replace some pumps. Uh, those are um, the projects from the un unfunded list that we are proposing to get funded in this um, initial uh, initial offering, I'll call it. So um, to get back to more of the really the bigger part of the CIP uh, that we have, um, the five-year plan uh, before you includes over 100 projects at a cost of about $156 million. And a, um, a third of it, which is either funded by grants or, or future grants or fees. Many of the projects are multi-year efforts. Um, I did um, provide to you, or at least Bonnie did, essentially uh, two spreadsheets, very small print of all these projects, which is a summary of what's in the capital improvement program, as well as a memo that explains how do you read the capital improvement program and um, what is a capital improvement program or a capital investment program. For a number of years, we call it a capital improvement program. It's pretty hard for me to remember to change that, even though it's been about three or four years. The um, Public Works Department manages 10 CIP categories, gas tax, arterial streets and roads, the general CIP, which is funded, um, and the general CIP citywide, which are funded through the general fund, but also through a variety of other funds, mostly grant funding, wastewater, enterprise, stormwater overlay, which is an enterprise, and the city, um, clean beaches and rivers, which is enterprise, refuse as well, parking, which is the downtown parking district, and is funded through um, fees and revenues from the parking district. There are a number of uh, uh, funding sources that are outlined in the CIP, including gas tax, SB1, grants, traffic impact fees, general fund, measures D, H, and E, uh, wastewater rates, the sanitation district, which pays for uh, their share of the improvements to the wastewater treatment plant, uh, stormwater rates, uh, refuse, refuse rates, and the downtown parking dis district, deficiency fees, or uh, in lieu fees, parking permits, and uh, garage and meter fees. The Transportation Public Commission um, um, discussed the CIP in March, and their recommendation was that the council approve the fiscal year 22-26 uh, CIP with the comment that city council review the city hall parking lot repairs project and consider discouraging driving by making all parking lots in the city limits, paid parking lots to better align with the city climate action goals. So, you know, it's it's uh, obviously not enough time to go through all the projects that we're doing. So what I'm providing to you is the significant ones that we're working on. We're working on a number of other smaller projects um, that will, uh, during the, the next coming year or two, but these are the larger ones that we're working on. So the Murray Street Bridge Seismic Retrofit, um, we're working through the right-of-way process, and once that's uh, done, we'll hopefully be able to finalize the design and get the project up to bid. State Route 19 intersection improvements are under construction, and there's been some activity out there recently. Uh, downtown intersection, two-way left turn lane improvements on Front Street is uh, in the design process. Some of the um, new development downtown will be um, designing and actually uh, constructing some of the improvements. West Cliff Drive storm damage at Chico. This is a uh, FEMA-funded uh, storm damage project from 2017, and um, the design is complete. We're uh, out getting uh, permits for the project. The uh, rail trail segment seven, phase two, I think as Mark had noted, we have recently received uh, construction funding through the um, ATP program, active transportation program, and we hope to be under construction um, in the next fiscal year. The rail trail segments eight and nine, which is uh, intersection,
section out to 17th, which is a cooperative uh, program with the uh, county, Public Works, and RTC. Uh, the design environmental review effort has been initiated, and um, there may be a good chance that we can actually get a 20 plus million dollar construction grant uh, soon for that project. Trevithin storm drain and sewer. Uh, the storm drain is one that we've had difficulty funding over the years, it affects a number of uh, flooding, a number of uh, garages and front yards, et cetera, but we'll be moving forward on that project uh, this year. The city of arterial collector and residential street, you know, we're, uh, have awarded a number of projects, two projects, so you'll see more activity um, as the contractor mobilizes uh, this coming month, both on the arterial streets and in some of the residential areas. Uh, pump station uh, modifications, this is in uh, a wastewater pump station in the Carbonera area, uh, awarded, and uh, that construction will be starting soon. The San Lorenzo uh, River culvert, um, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about, uh, will be coming to you soon uh, to award the construct award the contract uh, for construction of that project. Um, the San Lorenzo River lighting, which is a grant funded project from water to Highway One, uh, the commission, the Transportation Public Works Commission recently approved it, becoming the council in June uh, for authorization to advertise the project. Um, every year we do a number of uh, the sewer system improvements where we line the collection, sewer, sanitary sewer collection system. We spend um, at least $600,000 a year and we usually line about miles worth of, um, of the sewer lines in the city. And we have a lot of work going on at the wastewater uh, treatment facility, uh, replacing major equipment, uh, doing a big upgrade on the electrical system, which is about a $14 million project. Um, and then uh, we're upgrading um, digester and um, uh, some other equipment at the plant. And then the resource recovery facility, landfill cell 3B, um, has just been awarded uh, this week and uh, anticipate that the project will start construction uh, probably in July. Uh, this, all these projects are large. The smallest one is uh, probably a half a million going up to, like I said, $14 million. I think that concludes uh, my part of the presentation. Do you have any questions? Great, are there any questions from council members? We have one, Council Member Cummings. Thanks uh, for that presentation. And, you know, sad we don't have all the money we would like to have to make all these improvements happen, but hopefully eventually we'll get to as many. Um, I did have a question. I know that the Civic Center roof replacement has been a pretty big item, and there's, you know, cascading effects if you have, you know, um, a leaky roof and then what that can result in in terms of damage to um, you know a building and so I was just wondering I didn't think I, I didn't think I saw it on there but um, I'm just wondering in terms of and I know that's been on the list for a pretty long time so I'm just kind of curious about that um, and kind of what's being done you know in the meantime if, if that you know if we're not gonna be able to replace the roof anytime soon yeah so so that is on the unfunded list um, it's a parks facility, but uh, Public Works operations staff is working closely with them on um, that whole roof uh, replacement. Again, it is um, maintenance and um, not uncommon with uh, many of our facilities. Uh, Tony may have more to, to add to that. Yeah, that's right on. Thanks, Chris. Um, we do have it listed um, uh, on the CIP priorities that are before the council. Uh, the uh, figure is 420,000 for the civic roof repair. Um, this is, I'll talk about this a little bit more during our uh, Parks and Rec uh, portion, but uh, we may have an opportunity in partnership with Public Works through an energy efficiency program um, to, to get this covered, but for now we do have this uh, before the council 
uh, for consideration as part of the, the CIP uh, top, top 10, top nine, if you will. And um, another thing that I did forget to mention is, you know, we have, we have submitted some of these projects um, for stimulus funding once that um, and if that happens. So hopefully that'll be another avenue that we will be able to fund uh, some of these projects. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions from council members? Thank you so much, Chris Schneider. You're welcome. Lupita, do you want to introduce the next item? Yes, next we have parks and recreation. Uh, Tony is gonna be presenting. All right, thank you. Um, I don't think I've actually seen this photo. This is cool. Uh, thank you. All right. Um, yeah, Lupita, thanks for just uh, jumping right in there. Appreciate it. Um, all right, so just wanted to start in terms of our capital improvement um, summary uh, by just briefly covering where our capital improvement funds come from. Uh, so uh, as part of the budget discussions um, over the past couple of days, really what we're talking about is, of course, uh, general fund, um, uh, as a source for capital improvement. This is an area where we really haven't uh, received funds as a department uh, in about 10 years um, for uh, investment in CIP. However, we do have some other sources, and so these come up from time to time by community um, and the general public. So we have our park facilities tax uh, in Quimby, which is very similar. Um, it's basically an impact fee, $3 per square foot. Um, that goes through our planning department, our, our uh, building permit process um, as an impact fee that we're able to capture to appropriate toward um, uh, new amenities um, across, uh, across the park system. So we've got a little bit of funding in our park facilities tax in Quimby, as you can see. Um, in terms of annual revenues, but it is a small fraction um, and it's really limited in how we can spend it. It's not aimed at maintenance, it's really aimed at um, uh, replacing or um, adding new amenities. So we're really limited uh, to that stream. Um, in our operations presentation, uh, I mentioned our pursuit of grants. So that's probably our largest source of capital improvement investment. Uh, through grants, um, and we're also trying to build out our philanthropic support. Uh, I have on here, we have a, uh, um, an opportunity. This came from a, um, uh, a dollar amount that we received from PG&E uh, as a result of an easement um, over on the east side near Frederick Street Park. Uh, so there is some funding um, in the City Public Trust Fund uh, that we are uh, proposing for appropriation towards some of our emergency capital improvement uh, work. We'll talk about that uh, on a next slide here. Uh, so as I just mentioned under public works presentation, um, the civic roof uh, is in desperate need of repair. Uh, the cost there is about $420,000. Um, again, this is on that top nine list in terms of capital needs. Um, this is really an emergency need. Uh, we have leaks uh, already in the civic roof, um, so it, it's become a really critical. Uh, um, we are looking at an opportunity uh, to fund this uh, through an energy efficiency program, um, as I mentioned, so we're hopeful to, um, uh, to see the numbers work out uh, on that. It's not quite on bill financing, but it's a similar kind of uh, uh, approach. Uh, so working with Public Works to hopefully uh, do that, but for now, is uh, for, up for the council's consideration uh, for capital uh, budget appropriation. Uh, similarly, oh, I'm sorry, um, thanks. Uh, similarly, the Harvey West ball field lighting, this is another uh, really an emergency uh, item. Uh, this is one of those items within Parks and Recreation that is never a fun item to spend money on. It's expensive, but it's a big need. Uh, the lighting at Harvey West is um, and it is inefficient lighting and uh, we worry about the, the structures um, over time. So the lighting at, just at Harvey West is approximately $900,000. Uh, 
So we have proposed um, in our budget uh, $320,000 from the general fund and then um, uh, $580,000 uh, from the city public trust fund. So a combination of sources to uh, get the Harvey West ball field lighting uh, complete. Uh, this is another opportunity that perhaps we could fund through the energy efficiency program uh, through SiteLogic in partnership with Public Works. But again, for now, we've kept this on the uh, request list for funding uh, for the city council. All right, next slide, thanks. Um, as a five-year, um, our, our five-year capital improvement um, unfunded projects list uh, totals about 12 million. Um, overall, our deferred maintenance, our unfunded uh, capital improvement across parks and recreation, approximately 100 million. Um, but these are the critical, uh, or the most critical unfunded projects over the next five years total, just shy of 12 million. On this uh, slide, we've got, another, this is really the, the sort of aggregation, if you will, of a number of uh, capital improvement projects uh, will fund through primarily Quimby and Park Facilities Tax, uh, or that we would propose um, uh, funding in the upcoming fiscal year 22, um, and in those that are existing. So on the existing, you can see San Lorenzo Park redesign, uh, Harvey West Pool Feasibility Study that we talked about with City Council last budget year, uh, and new restrooms on Beach Street, or Main Beach. And then a number of new projects, several of these are funded uh, or would be funded with Quimby uh, and or park tax, um, but uh, some include uh, CDBG funding and or uh, capital improvement dollars, such as Harvey West Ballfield Lighting. So just a quick summary of um, the, the overall capital improvement projects that we'll be looking at for fiscal year 22. Uh, so this is a sort of a breakdown of what we have proposed in terms of CIP. Uh, so you can see the Quimby breakdown. Quimby uh, must be appropriated by geographic district. So you can see the uh, proposed allocation um, by uh, at least in two of our uh, two of our four uh, geographic zones, the proposed appropriation of park CDBG, uh, the general fund um, would be the uh, Harvey West Ballfield uh, lighting, and then the remainder would be uh, the uh, city public trust fund uh, to cover the ballfield lighting to get us to nine hundred thousand total. And in this uh, slide. Those, um, you can see up at the top, um, if we can move forward with the site logic um, project portfolio, uh, this is that energy efficiency program, this is how the breakdown um, uh, would, would be appropriated. So we would still allocate um, uh, a significant chunk of park tax, CDBG and Quimby, um, but the city public trust would be less. Um, However, we would, uh, and we've recommended an appropriation of 400,000 from the PG&E fund uh, through the public trust to help us buy down the cost of the site logic energy efficiency program. So this will come back to council if we can move forward with this. This is kind of a lot of detail and it dovetails with a number of other projects and public works. So we would bring this back to the council. But um, the purpose of this slide is simply to show uh, that if we can move forward with an energy efficiency program, we could uh, reduce the impact on the general fund for the CIP request. Uh, and this is somewhat self-explanatory here. We've got, uh, again, approximately $100 million in unmet needs, um, capital improvement, uh, unfunded or across the department. And then again, the, the sources of funding that we have between Quimby and park tax are limited and uh, both in terms of use, but in terms of uh, amount. Um, uh, but again, general fund is an area where we really need commitment uh, over time, uh, really in the ballpark of four to six million per year um, in, a, in a really you know, kind of optimal um, uh, situation. Uh, to invest into the park system. So we have not had, other than I think one or two emergency situations, uh, have not received general fund CIP uh, in a decade uh, or more. So this is a really critical aspect uh, for Parks and Rec. 
And yet, and yet on this slide, just in terms of the vision, um, we've got a lot of opportunity, and this is again through uh, grants, through philanthropic support, um, obviously park tax and Quimby to some degree, but again, the importance of general fund uh, is just very, very high to help support uh, the needs across uh, parks and recreation. So um, that's it, and we just hope to uh, work with the council uh, and community, whether it's through sponsorships or uh, you know thinking about how we can uh, find um, in dedicated funding over time. This could be, a, again, a bond measure uh, to invest in a lot of deferred maintenance across the park system. So uh, thanks, um, appreciate your time, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any council questions? Let's see. We have Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Tony. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what you know we would need to do to move forward with an energy efficiency plan. It, it came up a bunch, um, but it, I, it wasn't clear like what Council could do, you know, in order to. You know, provide staff with support for accessing those funds or applying for grants that could help towards those projects in particular. Yeah, if uh, Chris is out there still, I might uh, lean on him. But this is a, a program through Site Logic. Um, I believe uh, my understanding is that it could be um, uh, there could be up to I believe three million dollars in projects that would be covered, and it's a. Uh, Similar to an on-bill financing program, um, but uh, yeah, thanks. I think Chris is here, and Chris, I don't, you might explain it a little bit better than I can. Well, I think uh, just just more in response to the question, um, by including this in the capital improvement program and having this discussion, is the support that we need uh, these you know grants um, to apply for these grants and to. Um, you know, have the ability to uh, get at this money. Uh, Site Logic is helping us with a number of projects and finding the funding sources in order to, uh, or these grants and loans in order to get these projects, uh, energy projects done. Yeah, and I was also curious, are there opportunities through like AMBAG or CCCE? Because I know they do a lot of grant funding for programs as well. Um, we do uh, work through AMBAG and whatever, um, the Air District and a number of um, sources, a lot, often there for um, vehicle conversions or going to electric vehicles, et cetera. Um, but we're always looking for any kind of program that can help us fund our projects. Great, thanks. If, if I could add just a little bit on the site logic, um, ball field lights are really important difficult to um, get into the program unless you have a bunch of other energy efficiency um, efforts that have a shorter return on <laughs> return on investment. So by doing a combination of solar roof repair with the Civic, you have to do the roof before you can do the solar. So you do that together. There's other solar that are packaged into this um, proposal. We can fit the ball lights in um, a portion of them anyway, and that's why uh, Tony's looking at a contribution so that we can make the package pencil out with a return on investment within the time period. So it's currently at the finance department for review and hopefully, I mean, um, you're way soon. Thank you for that additional information, Mark. Uh, let's see, Council Member Brown. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, quick question on the Senior Center, the Market Street Senior Center uh, capital funding. I know that um, at, on the Community Programs Committee and then the, the Council did approve funding through CDBG for that project, and I'm just wondering, is this in addition to that funding? Is there a kind of a, a bigger set of um, renovations that need to be done, or is this captured already? I mean, it says unfunded, and I think there was some funding for for the senior center. So, yeah. thanks, Councilmember Brown. That's a good question. Uh, if Lindsay Bass is still out there with Parks and Rec, I would uh, welcome her in. But um, generally speaking, you're right on. I think CDBG will cover a portion of it, but the costs at the senior center. 
um, were much higher. Um, essentially what, what was the catalyst to this whole situation is we had a plumbing leak uh, and we started to open things up to see what the issue was and we thought it was a $5,000 issue and it was a uh, six figure uh, issue. So I'll have Lindsay speak to this in a bit more detail. Yeah, that's correct. So um, the allocation from this year uh, will build on um, the allocation that was received last year. And um, our request last year was um, for a portion of those funds. And anytime you open up an old building, um, all sorts of surprises are there and waiting for you. And so we anticipated that um, we would be probably restricted in the amount that we would be able to do with that initial um, round of funding. And so the um, second appropriation um, will be really helpful in allowing us to get to um, some of the uh, repairs that will actually actual programming within the center. Um, to your point, though, um, it's a good one. Um, we could have listed that um, under the existing program that was receiving additional um, revenues, but because um, it was a little unique, we just kept it in that new category. So thanks for the um, question so that we could clarify that. And then just to add to that, Lindsay, uh, would you say that it's also listed as a because it, it does not have general funding appropriated to it as well? That's correct. It's solely grant funded. And there are the, the amount of the appropriations that we received um, still uh, do not um, get us to the full amount that we anticipate to complete all the repairs that are necessary. If that helps. Thank you. Are there any other council member questions? Seeing none, Lupita, we'll okay. hand it off to you. Thank you, right here. Okay, next on our um, list is development to present their CIP proposed projects, and presenting will be um, Bonnie Lips Lipscomb, our economic development director. Thank you, Lupita, and good afternoon, Vice Mayor and members of the council. Um, we have a, a few brief slides. I'll try to go through them quickly. We don't have a lot of new items on the CIP, um, but the focus is housing. So um, next slide. Uh, our PAC Station North project, our PAC Station South, and our library mixed-use affordable housing project, and I'll just give you a brief overview of those. So the first project is our Pack Station North project. Um, specifically, this is 90 to 100 units of affordable housing, uh, retail, second floor office of a, you know, approximately a little over 8,000 square feet and 1,000 square foot by cub, uh, about a 2,500 square foot office for Metro and the 22 bus bays. Next slide. Uh, Pack Station South, um, we have $2 million in our CIP for this project. It's 70 to 85 units of housing. And I didn't mention this earlier, but I, I want to now. The reason why there's such a variation on this project is because of the funding sources we're applying for, which um, are the one current application we have out there that's outstanding, um, wanted more two, three bedroom units. So those are larger units. So if we get that funding, it means that we'll have more family affordable units in the project. So that's why there's the variation. If we don't get, we'll probably go with a larger unit count. So it's, it's, it's a mix and it's a mix also sort of looking at our arena, our arena numbers and um, what is really the need and the unmet need in our community. And then that has between 18 and 20,000 square feet office space and medical office space for um, Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Deensis. And then about three to 4,000 ground floor retail space sort of oriented toward a cafe as you see here onto the Paseo. Next slide. Um, and then the library mixed use project, we have uh, three million, three and a half million funded um, out of the CIP across the funding sources um, that are contributing to the project. 
Um, we have uh, at least 50 units and hopefully quite a bit more. We're in the final stages of selecting um, both the affordable housing developer. We've received all those applications. We have five really solid applications for developers on that one. And um, we'll start setting up interviews for that next week. And then quickly to be followed by the master architect selection. And that RFP has closed as well. So we've been really active on this project. Next project. Um, so ongoing CIP project that were funded from previous years um, crosses a number of funding categories, including our affordable housing trust fund, you know, economic development trust fund, and our former redevelopment agency bonds. And they are the infrastructure and support investments, downtown infrastructure, and wharf infrastructure and rehabilitation. Next slide. Those projects, just going a, a little deeper, um, are what you've seen. We've completed this project. We have just some final items to close this out, is the citywide wayfinding and signage. Um, this project was funded with former redevelopment dollars. And um, we have our two new electric trolleys. Um, most recently, those were funded with grant funding um, from the Air District Board. And then we have some uh, residual funding um, for broadband implementation, that's sort of ongoing support. And with some of the America Rescue Plan funding coming through across our jurisdictions in our county, there's some interest in leveraging funding together. So it's good we have this funding here so that we can participate if there is a countywide effort around connectivity around broadband. So it, that's, that's a good thing. Um, we also have uh, downtown infrastructure in investments, um, prior uh, prior funding commitments. So specifically for the farmers market structure, it's a past council approval out of ED Trust Fund. We have um, our former bond redevelopment bond funding um, for Lower Pacific Avenue and downtown alley improvements, and as well for Ocean Street and Lower Pacific Avenue improvements that are um, associated uh, with our two projects. And then getting towards the end, we have our wharf in infrastructure investments. And um, these are identified in the wharf master plan. Um, and then the exciting news is that we just found out uh, that we were awarded a grant application that we actually applied for um, last June, uh, which is the EDA grant to do the project, which you see on the right, which is desperately needed to be done placement project under the Miramar um, for the demo of that project. And so really uh, repair that infrastructure and get it ready for, for new development um, and activity on, on the wharf. Um, and so we're gonna use, uh, we have approved by council previously some ED trust fund money to be the match for the 620,000 uh, grant projects that um, we were just awarded. And so finally, just to recap, funding um, the projects from prior years, this year is all affordable housing for those three projects. But in prior years, we have that sort of across these three funds, affordable housing trust fund, ED trust fund, and the former redevelopment agency bonds. And how that breaks down, um, it's a little under 10 million. Uh, you can see the majority of it is our affordable housing trust fund for affordable housing projects. Um, a little over 2 million is our RDA successor right. agency bonds for bond funded projects. We have here the Measure S, 11%, um, so a little over a million um, is, around a million is specifically related to the library portion of the library project. And this is not yet spent. Um, the city uh, public trust fund money is specific to, uh, actually what's budgeted here is specific to funding um, that we received into the general fund, but it was on behalf of uh, 555 Pacific, and so it was a parking contribution, and so that's what this fund, this funding represents here. And that concludes my brief presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions, and I also have um, Kathy Mentz. Um, available um, as the budget lead um, should there be any specific questions about our revenues and our expenditures. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. And Mayor Myers has returned, so I will hand it off to her to call for questions. Thank you. Great. Are there? Thank you for covering for me, Vice Mayor. Um, are there any questions for Bonnie regarding the capital improvement program she outlined? Not seeing any. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to have to uh, rely on our team, Bernal, um, to call whichever department is up next. Okay, next we have FIRE um, to, propose to present their CIP, and presenting will be um, FIRE Chief Jason Hayek and our Division Chief, Bravia. Great. I'm Aaron, City Council. Um, so, are you, uh, Lupita, are you putting up slides or? Oh, did it stop sharing? I'm sorry. I'm not seeing it on my end, but it doesn't mean it's There we go. Right. Okay. There we go. It stopped sharing. Okay. Um, so, I have with me uh, Division Chief Rob Young, who is intimately familiar with our apparatus, uh, having run um, that program for a long time. And so, uh, I'm really going to pare it down to what our needs are, not just our wants, and, and share a little bit of the background uh, behind this. So, next slide. <laughs> So what you see is uh, the CIP program going forward, and you can see a ladder truck uh, 2023. You can see a type one uh, that's listed a little bit further out in 25. And then there's a note saying um, this project uh, for a pumper is a listed in the priority one funding category, and that's really what we're asking for. And um, if we go to the next slide, I'll kind of explain the conundrum that we have. So what you have here is PA 1901, which is our standard for auto, auto, um, automated fire apparatus. And that kind of dictates the standard for what fire departments should do. And so this is something that we've been advocating for and putting forward uh, for years. And um, I need to get a little technical here with some of these, but a type one engine is what you consider to be that's going down the road. Um, a type three is a wildland fire engine. It's a uh, smaller, um, more capable, it's four wheel drive, it operates in the dirt. A truck is uh, uh, the ladder, it's got our, our teller truck that's the ladder on it. And we use that not just for firefighting, but we also use it for uh, cliff rescue. That is what our overhead anchor point is. So people who um, are at the bottom of a cliff, off of, which happens on a regular basis, this is the tool that we use to get them. And then a rescue, um, is a smaller apparatus, um, but more importantly for us, it houses our mobile air cascade. And so in some of the pictures that I showed um, earlier today in the budget presentation, you saw firefighters with uh, uh, the SCBA, the self-contained breathing apparatus, uh, those bottles. We have to fill those bottles up. That's how we do it. So um, our conundrum has been that uh, for years, we've had a replacement plan that we put forward in the CIP. Um, and I'm gonna get into a little bit of detail here. Um, in essence, putting aside a half a million dollars a year so that we can purchase a type one engine um, and have that frontline apparatus that goes into reserve status and then goes away after 16 years. And our conundrum is that we have our two oldest engines are one is a 1999 and one is a 2002. So we're well outside our specs for um, reliability and um, you know when we get a call, breaking down and then calling an Uber is not uh, part of our uh, you know our response plan. And so um, you know we have um, asked for this and, and the second part of this is we had the same issue years ago, about 10 years ago, and all of our apparatus were failing. And so they bought three type one engines in 2012. So all those engines are coming due at the same time. And so what we're trying to do is space it out so that we don't have the same bottleneck of apparatus costing a lot of money all at once, but then also kind of getting to the end of their service life all, all at the same time. So our type one engine uh, that we're asking for is really to try and negotiate that end of service life, repairs that are coming, and maintaining that reliability that we have to have, and that is, I mean, this is a um, kind of a core base functionality for a fire department. Our firefighters are who do the work, but their toolbox is fire engine, and you have to have both at the same time. And so if you look at the bottom of this, um, you can see our replacement schedule. This is something that has not changed for us. Um, but if you look at uh, the bottom that has our apparatus or our fleet uh, inventory, you can see that we have three engines that are all the same year. Um, and then our oldest one, again, is a 1999, and then we have a 2012. And those are our frontline apparatus that are right now in reserve 
We are looking at spending upwards of forty plus thousand dollars uh, just to maintain that usability within that reserve apparatus. So, um, really, what we're looking for is within that you know highest um, that that tier one funding is to also fund uh, the type one engine. And this is going forward. You know, we we have this replacement schedule that is a core function. It's not an add-on to our to our what we need to maintain um, you know, our ability to respond uh, going forward. Um, if you look at the mileage, you look at the hours, um, these are well-used engines. And if you see the NFPA 1901, it talks about eight years front line, eight years reserve. That's kind of, um, there's a little bit of flexibility there, but given the call volume and the use for our department, um, that's stretching it, to, to be quite honest. Um, and so that's really, uh, we've got some unfunded uh, CIP asks as well that are uh, larger, larger. But this is just trying to maintain our our, our core functionality, not adding a station, you know, replacing a station, you know, our lifeguard headquarters. And this is our ability to meet, uh, you know, the public expectation of a fire department. Um, next, so that's really what we have as far as uh, what we're pitching. And I have Chief Young with me again, who is. Uh, much more familiar with the ins and outs of um, uh, of our apparatus. Are there other questions for fire on the on their ask on the capital improvements? I am just going to close my thing. Any other questions from council on this? Not seeing any hands. Okay. Well, thank you, Jason, very clear. And next, I see we have the water department. Afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, this is Water Director Rosemary Menard. I talked to you about this yesterday in part because pretty good chunk of change in our operating budget is debt service. And so when I want to talk to you about what our operating budget looks like, I want to be able you what we're purchasing with that. And so one of the big things we're purchasing is capital investments and the improvements that go through there. So could I have the next slide, please? Uh, so you saw these two slides yesterday, but you can see that uh, as, as noted in the uh, pie chart that Lupita showed you earlier, we have an $81 million budget next year. It's funded. Uh, we are moving ahead with construction on two projects, the Knoll Creek Inlet Outlet Project, which has a $69 million construction budget, and uh, the, the Concrete Tanks Replacement Project, which has a $28 million construction project. Those two projects are moving ahead, and uh, one is under construction now. Now the next one is mobilizing for construction that's expected to start soon. Uh, we do have work going on on a number of other major areas. Oak Creek pipeline design work, looking at one of the things I, uh, I heard earlier when I think uh, the, the, there was a conversation going on earlier about some of the failures that we had when uh, Paul Horvat was talking about the emergencies in 2017 where we were looking at New Oak Creek pipeline failures. So there's money in the, there for um, of design work and uh, environmental review work that we're looking at there that would key those projects up to move forward into construction in uh, out years of this plan. Uh, we do have uh, funding under FEMA for the Brackney landslide area pipeline risk reduction. It's a very specific area above Felton, between uh, Felton and Loch Lomond where we have a landslide hazard that uh, could a pipeline out and would not be a you know a simple two or three day fix. So that's a project we're finishing some work on this year, and then would uh, have that set up for construction beginning next year and the year after. Another major project that I think you heard a little bit about yesterday was the um, facilities improvement plan for the um, the ground plant when the construction of the concrete tanks is finished with here in about 2024, then we'll be ready to move that project into behind it. We will be bringing the council a recommendation on a design build team to uh, do a contract with and get first phase design underway in uh, August, we believe. Um, so we do have a very active um, 
capital program, and I'm going to, if you'll uh, move it to the next slide, you'll uh, see kind of how the, the basic purposes served by these various projects. And uh, uh, this year is like uh, the 81 million, and then in the next year, it goes to 291 million for the five year period. You can see that uh, we have a lot of infrastructure resiliency and climate adaptation there in the red bars. We've got water supply augmentation in the green bars, and we're um, we're looking at some opportunities for maybe accelerating some of that work based on some grant funding or some funding that would come out of some state bond measures that might get funded here in the next year or so, because clearly. Uh, vulnerability we have as we're experiencing this year, you know, continues and will continue until we uh, move some augmentation into place. And then we do have a number of other um, factors looking at software and other kinds of systems. One of the big issues uh, that we're looking, working very hard at that, that uh, Ken Morgan talked to you about yesterday was cybersecurity, which is a big focus of um, our facilities also. So that's kind of a, a really sort of quick, fairly high level overview of um, what our capital program is, um, but it's a, it's a big driver for our, both our budget and our rates that we'll be talking with you about later in this calendar year. And, uh, you know, we've made some really good progress, but we have a lot in front of us that we're really trying hard to tackle in the smartest and best way for thinking long-term about both climate adaptation, but also recognizing that these facilities have long lives and we need to be thinking ahead about how things change over time and making sure we're building in flexibility and adaptability into these facilities that are so critical to providing reliable, safe uh, drinking water for our community. Take your questions. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, I'll look to council if you have questions. Uh, I see council member Colantari Johnson. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Um, so you have to take a deep breath when you see all of the, yeah. all of the needs in the coming years. Um, I heard you say that there is potential for state bond measures in the near future, which is great to hear. Um, do you, given, given that we don't know that that's going to happen, how do you foresee these impacting our um, service rates? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Council Member. Um, you know, we, you saw some revenue forecasts when we did the work session with the Council on uh, April 6th. And we did work with the Water Commission in a sort of ad hoc subcommittee for scenarios. And the scenario that we that they chose and that we brought forward to you is a is a sort of a 10% year over year rate increase. It's not insignificant, and it's one of the reasons why when we talked about what the revenue uh, requirements are and what their implications are for water rates, we also talked about um, we also talked about affordability issues. Uh, one good thing I think about the affordability uh, side of the, the spectrum is there does seem to be a, a growing interest at the state and federal level recognizing the challenges of uh, maintaining affordability and equitable access to um, drinking water, public drinking water for customers. And uh, just this last week, uh, a piece of legislation was inter introduced in the uh, in the House. It's called uh, HR 3293, and it's a it would it would institute a ongoing federal program, a little bit like the low income housing energy uh, housing efficiency program, LIE. I don't know if I have all the right words for the um, for the acronym there, but uh, it's a it's a program that's been ongoing for a long time that provides for uh, supplements and and a sort of a federal safety net for energy costs. And so Congress is looking at introducing uh, or looking at this, and I think there's a fairly good chance because it's not just you know entities such as ourselves, but the clarity that's come along with uh, some of the COVID issues, recognizing that shutting people off for non-payment is not a very effective way to maintain public health and safety, uh, is, is 
looking at opportunities for creating a, a federal safety net for water wastewater services. And so obviously we're following that legislation very carefully, working with the, both the um, federal delegation and the state delegation to keep this on the radar and to be talking to folks about how important that is as, uh, as a way of creating a win-win outcome for uh, the future with respect to having reliable water systems and affordable rates rather than a lose-lose outcome, which would be still fairly expensive rates but a not reliable water system that would um, contribute to you know, economic uncertainty for our community if we had water system failures. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Any other council members with questions for water? For water? I think I'm the end of your, of your line here. Yeah, I think you are. You are indeed. Um, so I will go, thank you, Rosemary. And, um, very helpful and thank you to all the departments. I'm sorry, I had to presentations, um, but I will watch it on TV. Um, I want to next um, take um, our uh, conversation out to the public. Um, so we will turn this now to public comment. And um, if you are interested in commenting on the fiscal year 2022 proposed budget, press star nine on your raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. So I am looking at our attendees today in the, for the meeting, and I'm looking to see if anyone in that attendee list would like to comment uh, as part of public comment on the fiscal year proposed budget. And I'm not seeing any hands up. And so um, I'll go, go ahead and bring it back. So, uh, I just want to again thank uh, Martine in the city manager's office, Kim and her crew at the budget, um, I mean at finance, um, for putting together all the materials. I want to thank all the department heads um, for all the really, really great PowerPoints. Um, I think we've all gotten a really good sense of what last year really turned out and then um, just really exciting work ahead for the year ahead. So um, it feels like we've come out of COVID and we're pretty much full charge ahead here in the city of Santa Cruz. So it's refreshing and exciting to see all the work that everyone's done um, this past year. I wanna also just thank all the departments for all their work during COVID, uh, including the city attorney's work um, and just all the leadership that really came to, came to head during um, all the difficulty of COVID and the fires and everything else. So this was kind of a year, it was a, a time to look back and also forward. So again, thank you for everybody for all your work over the past year. Um, and we will have additional uh, discussions. Martine, just for the public, um, we have the budget scheduled for uh, of, uh, June 8th, I believe, right? For um, approval. Yes, correct. That's correct. Yeah, so in the, in the interim, if there are questions uh, from council members, uh, please feel free to follow up and uh, we'll prepare uh, the proposed budget based on your feedback that you've provided uh, over the last couple of days. Continue. And did you, and Martine, were you able to, um, to council member coming yesterday, I believe that we were able to get some of the detailed um, yes. budget numbers. I saw Laura's note last night. Okay, okay, great. Okay, um, well, we are adjourned. Um, everybody have a nice evening and thanks again to the council for two long days, but um, thanks very much for, for attending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.